Morning members, morning members of the public. Welcome to this meeting, planning meeting, DM meeting of 14th of December. Um, I'll start off with the uh, safety bits. In case the fire alarm goes off, and I'm not expecting it to do so, um, you make exit out through there and go to the far side of the car park. There are toilets on the, out through the left on the, that door, and there's water out through that door on the right. This is a public meeting, and members of the public are very welcome to listen but they, to, to the debate today, but unless registered to speak, are not able to take part and speak. We are live casting. Where is he? It is good, right. We are live casting today, so can I please remind members to use their microphones and remember to turn them off when not speaking and do as I have very often forgotten to do myself, turn off your mobile phones. <clears throat> In terms of how the items are to be presented, the order for each application is as follows. The case officer will speak. The objector will speak. The supporter will speak, the parish council representative, if there is one, will speak, the ward member will speak, members will be able to ask questions of each question, each speaker in turn. At the conclusion of the debate, the members will vote and come to a decision. I would now like to ask each of the officers on the top table to introduce themselves. Perhaps, Amelia, you'd like to start? Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Amelia Bolter. I'm Democratic Services Officer and Clerk to this committee. I'm Rosemary Rowe. I'm the board member for Dartmouth and East Dart, and I'm also vice chair of this committee. Yeah, good morning. I'm Richard Foss, ward member for Allington and Street, and chairman of this committee. And apologise for my slightly croaky voice, but I think a lot of us have got that. Good morning. I'm Pat Weimer, head of Development Management for South Hams. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Fairbairn, Head of Legal Services and Monitoring Officer uh, for South Hams and the Committee's Legal Advisor this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm um, Jacqueline Houselander. I'm the Head of um, Development Management for West Devon, but I'm also the Case Officer for this planning application this morning. Thank you for that. Um, can I ask members for... Amelia, have we any apologies, please? Thank you, Chair. We have received apologies from Councillor Kemp and we have Councillor Thomas substituting. Apologies received from Councillor Reeve and Councillor Smearden is um, substituting. And Councillor Brazil, I believe, will be joining us later. Thank you for that. Oh, we had an echo? No, it's OK. Um, can I ask the committee to agree the minutes of the meeting of the 9th of the 11th? Sure. Thank you. Are there any matters arising from that? I don't think there are. No. Um, there are no items of chair's business. I am not aware of any reason to divide the agenda. Members, are there any declarations of interest on this? I'll do it again at lunchtime, this morning's applications. Yes, I just do clear an interest for all the items today that include the AOMB, as I am a representative for South Hams on the AOMB. Thank you. Any others? No. Um, the list of speakers has been circulated to members, so I'll now move on and I will ask Mr. Houselander to present the first item, which is 4774. The bleak 21 full Burr Island Hotel, Burr Island, Big Brick on Sea. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much. This application is for um, some um, extensions and works to the Burr Island Hotel, um, including um, uh, an extension to the Bayview Cafe on the mainland. Um, I just want to provide um, a, an update on the committee report. There's been an additional letter of representation which was received yesterday but wasn't managed to be indexed onto the planning file or the website until this morning. So 
I uh, just wanted to update you on that. It's um, an, uh, a letter of representation indicate, uh, from the um, freehold uh, owners of the cottage, which is immediately adjacent to the Pilchard Inn. Um, and they um, have expressed similar concerns to the ones been reported in the uh, planning report. But um, uh, so they're discussing the fact that they lose their access to the beach, which was a previous um, uh, an access that they used previously because of the proposed extension on the quayside. Um, they also um, uh, raise concerns with regard to the additional uh, need to empty the septic tanks which are in their garden and also suggest that the access to those septic tanks is Im impacted by the seating area which is provided um, in the proposal. Um, they also question whether or not the proposed building will withstand any tidal surges, which have sometimes occurred. And um, they're concerned that the, the rooftop seating will look directly into their house. Um, uh, <coughs> and they're also concerned about um, fire egress to the, from the building, should there be a fire from their own building. Sorry, just move now on to the presentation itself. Um, the application site area is um, in the areas which are hatched on this plan. Uh, I'll just use the pointer. So the whole of the island um, and the area um, around Warren Cottage and the Bayview Cafe, which is on the mainland here. Uh, this is a, a, obviously a, a Google image of the same, so the um, Bayview Cafe being just where that yellow marker is, um, and there's obviously the island. The application um, is, um, there are a number of elements to the application, so in effect there are lots of smaller bits to it. So um, I'm, what I propose to do, uh, obviously most of you are at the site visit, but what I propose to do is just to go through each bit individually so that, <clears throat> so that everyone's aware of what, what the, the actual proposals are. So first of all, the Bayview Cafe, <clears throat> as we saw when we were on site, the, the existing extension to the cafe, which is currently sited adjacent to this wall, um, will be removed and a new building erected alongside, extending no further forward than the existing house. And this area here is an outside seating area with this being a potential for a canopy as and when required, um, but otherwise would be open. Um, and obviously the out outside terrace, which is there remains, uh, uh, but slightly altered. Um, it is elevationally uh, shown as this, um, with a um, copper roof, as we discussed on site, uh, render walls in the same uh, way as the, the house, Warren House is rendered, um, with some glazing across the front and with solar panels on the roof. This is the rear elevation, which is, has a timber clad element um, and uh, roof lights uh, in, in the roof space. This is a side view of that same same um, extension. As you can see, the uh, the framework, if you like, for the canopy and the rear element being much more subservient and uh, timber clad, again with glazing here. And this is the opposite um, elevation, uh, which is just a plain rendered uh, wall. These are some visualizations of that same. Um, building just a section through here um, and this is a view sort of from from the, the roadway looking back up at the uh, proposed proposed I say extension proposed building I should probably uh, rephrase it as uh, and this is another view from the uh, side road which makes its way up towards the resident residential properties above So now uh, we'll move on to the island itself. Okay. okay. So perhaps just ask me to ask if you've got any questions in, on each individual bit. That might be an easy way of dealing with questions. Councillor Hudson. 
Thank you. I mean, this is actually a more general question, but the sheer scale of all these bits and pieces of planning applications, it's, it's at the end of the day, presumably, we're going to have to say yes or no, all of them or none of them. Why, why was this allowed in this way? Surely this is somewhat unusual to have it all as a kind of a, a group because it's... I just, I just think it's, it maybe makes it more difficult, more, more challenging to kind of find a way forward because it means that it, it puts us in a position of all or nothing as opposed to maybe some of the small subtleties. And particularly since some of the comments have come in separately about the different elements of this, I, do, I've, I fail to understand why this is all just one application rather than separated applications. Right, thank you for that. Um, uh, David, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. At the end of the day, we are asked to uh, to determine the application that is before us, um, and that is the way the applicant has chosen to present their application. The the um, developments are all within one planning unit, um, so I don't see there's any reason why you can't determine the application as it stands. Um, I appreciate that you might like bits of it and not other bits, but then there are ways of dealing with that, and if that transpires, that's the view of the committee, then we'll we'll advise accordingly. Yeah. Yeah. So would this mean then that maybe if we felt, for example, that some bits of it we were happy to approve as well as are, and other bits that we were <clears throat> not happy, um, would that be that then we would condition that the approval was conditionally sort of excluding then elements? Maybe if you'd like to answer yeah. that, please. Uh, no, you couldn't be able to do it that way. I think effectively what, what the way you would do it is you'd defer the decision to enable your comments to be gone to, to be fed back to the applicant and then for the applicant potentially to consider those comments with a view to making any amendments to the plans that might be appropriate that might overcome many of the concerns that you have but, uh, yeah okay yeah coach for thomas thank you chairman if we could go back to the photos that looked at the, the front um and, and back again please so we can see the stairs and back again please uh, yeah, so the the stairs on the southwest elevation, the stairs on the right hand side of that picture, are are those where the stairs were that we stood when we were at the site meeting, or are they? So in fact, the building extends further than the stairs. Indeed. I only asked Chairman because at the site meeting I stood on those stairs and we were told that was as far as the building would extend. But in fact, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, Coach Robert. Thank you. Could you move on one? <clears throat> on, on, on one slide. Oh, sorry, pressing the wrong button. So that top image is there is there a section of uh, of the of of the um further building going out to the right or is it a is it a sideways view? So, the top view, the southeast elevation. Yeah. Is, is a view that you would see from the road is if you were going up towards the residential. And yeah. the rear part of that is um, part of the proposed building, but it's got a different finish and it hasn't, you know, the pitch roof, if you like, extends to the width of the existing cottage. And oh, am I not the right, answering the right question? No. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> carry on. So the, so, so the larger building in the distance, is, is that a, a, an L shape? So are we looking at the side of a, a, an L shape which is going north? Or are we looking at some strange alignment of a, of, of a building diagonally? So the, the building you can see beyond at the back yeah. is part of Warren Cottage. Yes. Yes. What's its shape? Uh, it's an extension at the back. Oh, let me see if I can find the um, floor plan. So on the floor plan, it's right. this element okay. here I'm of there. the Warren Cottage. Yeah. Thanks. <coughs> okay, happy with that, Coach Robert. Anybody, Coach Paddle, you're muttering? <laughs> Sorry, Chairman. I was just saying I don't think the perspective of the... Oh, we've gone off it now. I don't think the perspective was quite correct, which is why Councillor Robert and myself were confused, but I think that's answered that with the plan. Thank you. You're clear now. Right, thank you. Right. Okay. If there's no more questions on that aspect, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. However, before we move on, I just wanted to also say that um, 
Preview, um, when the application was originally submitted, there was a proposal to build on the car park at the rear of Bayview Cafe to provide for um, staff accommodation. That aspect of the proposal was removed, and so it doesn't. It no longer forms part of the application. Um, as a result of the applicant being able to purchase Cornell off, which is a previously a residential um, uh, home, um, and use that as uh, as the proposed staff accommodation. Uh, that there was an application planning application for the change of use of that building, which was approved recently. If just move on. So we knew, we'll move now to the developments on the island. I'll just give a brief summary of what they are, and then I'll move on to each uh, bit individually. So if you look at the top of the drawing in here, as you will recall from the site visit, that it was an area um, at the end of the island which didn't, uh, which was, it was contained uh, uh, rubbish bins, uh, a few containers, a bit of a, pardon me for saying so, a bit of an untidy area. <laughs> Of the of the island, so um, the landscape architect involved in the pre-app uh, with this uh, proposal uh, did some searching and found out that um, many years ago it was a um, it was known as the fisherman's gardens, um, uh, and as a result, what the proposal does is to uh, to reinstate those fisherman's gardens um, as well as add. Um, a workshop and a storage building at this end, um, with which will house. Um, there's a I think there's a rib associated with the the hotel um, and any um, other machinery that's needed. And this little small bit here is a potential bin store. Um, obviously, they've got the staff accommodation which sits underneath the tennis court, which is shown here. We've got the proposed extension to the pilchard, which is this bit here. We've got the uh, proposed tea room, which is this, this building here. Um, the front extension to the Nettlefold bar to the hotel, the rear extension, which is this aspect, <coughs> the rear, the, the realignment of the footpath down to the beach, uh, mermaid pool, which is this bit here. Um, and obviously Chergwin, which will remain as is, but will be, um, improved with a new roof um, and repainted. Uh, this again is another bill, another image just showing the um, showing the proposed uh, changes to the island. Um, as you'll note, the Bayview Cafe, I've tried to block that out, but it hasn't blocked out entirely, but that's no longer part of the application, just to make sure members are very clear about that. Um, this is a view of the island with the proposed, uh, it's a, obviously a sketch drawing with the proposals uh, shown on it, which I thought was uh, helpful for members just to see it as a whole. So we'll move now to the individual elements. Um, the Pilchard Inn is, uh, this is a floor layout indicating this, the, these, this is the uh, Pilchard Inn as it stands. Down to there, and this is the proposed extension, uh, which extends out, as I said to you, on site to the sea, uh, to the sea wall, um, and these are the steps down to the beach uh, from from the quay side, which is currently in this area here, and the quay wall extends all the way along here. Uh, this is uh, the next floor up which indicates the um, outdoor seating area, which was referred to by the objector, and the existing Pilchard Inn building just here. And this is the roof of the extension, and this is the pitched roof element, and then there's a, sing uh, there, there's a flat roof element which links the two buildings here. And again, this is just the, 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 the upper floor, which shows that this is a sort of a studio built, studio, uh, apartment uh, on the top part of the Pilchard Inn. Again, this is just showing existing site plan and proposed site plan. So, so just the, the addition here. These are some uh, elevational um, views of the proposed building. Um, this is, this view is effectively from the, effectively would be seen from the adjacent property 
um, aspect, but obviously you don't see the upper parts of it. Uh, and this is the proposed extension with the flat roof link. This is the elevation that would be seen from the beach. Um, um, these, so it's a, it's a, a natural slate roof. Um, this is glazed and these are timber louvres, uh, which will uh, prevent too much glazing um, but, and also provide for shading within the building. This is the uh, elevation if you were standing on the quay side uh, at the far end uh, with the pitch roof glazing and the link through to the, to the building. And this is the view from the rear uh, where we were standing where it was really cold um, looking down and that's the top of the roof of the uh, proposed extension. Now this is just another view, section through showing the view um, yeah. well, these are some uh, visualizations that the applicant provided, um, showing it. So this is sort of further on from the beach, looking back across it. And this is a, a photo uh, montage of the of the proposal with the extension just sat there in front of the pilchard. Uh, officers consider that, uh, as, as as I said in. Um, at the site meeting, there were lots of um, discussions through the uh, progression of the pre-app, um, both with uh, Graham Lawrence, the conservation officer, and myself, and also there was um, a design review panel which looked at this proposal, um, and we had lots of discussions about whether the roof of the build of the extension should be flat roof, whether it should be ab uh, absolutely attached to the. Um, pilchard and not have the flat roof link so there were lots of variations of the of the proposal um, and this was the one that um, was favoured on the basis that the pitch roof reflects the pitch roof on the pilchard um, the pilchard extension and also the cottage behind and so from a, a, a more distant view you can see here the pitches are all very similar uh, uh, it would it would read as part of a, a group of buildings Um, so, are there any questions anyone has about? Yeah, Councillor Hodge. <clears throat> yeah, just looking at that picture you've got at the moment, the the gable <clears throat> facing of the proposed new building. What is that material? Because it's it's look is is it a window or is it a dark wall or what is it? Do you know what you realise what I'm talking about? The one that's facing across towards the pilcher. So the top, it yeah. No, no, no. The one just to the left, left that one, yeah, that gable. So that's a um, a glaze. That's gla That's like glass. A glass elevation. Council panel. Yeah, is this the building that the the recent letter from the neighbours has come in about? Are they na neighbouring this building? Correct. Can, can I ask about the their concerns about be, where would people be sing, sitting who are going to be able to look directly into their house and what what is the officer's feelings on that? I'm assuming it's this bit here that they're concerned about. Is that on the ground level to the entrance to the pilchard? Sorry, is that the same? Is that at the same level as the ground floor of the, or not the ground floor, the entrance level of the pilchard from the lane? No, it's one level up. Right. So, oh, so it's it's, it's and can I ask what your feelings are about the um, fears of overlooking into the neighbouring cottage? Um, I, I, it's a small number of. Uh, tables and chairs. There is an existing area where they ca people can sit and and stand actually and look out. So I'm not concerned that it's any worse than it than it already is. Thank you, Councillor Long, and then Councillor Smart. Chairman, I was going to ask um, very similar about that because I noted um, one slide before there showed a better relationship, I believe, with the neighbour. Is it? I thought there was one where you showed the <coughs> neighbouring property mm -hmm. in relation to it. I think perhaps uh, no, there's, there's one with a small, um, a, a small picture in the corner. Ah, there we are. 
No, not that. Yeah, that, that does show the existing site plan. Are you saying that where the um, rooftop seating is now, that is already a seating and an open area for use by um, users of the pilch? It's actually, a, it's not a, an area that's used now. That was my mistake, sorry. But it isn't um, looking directly into their property because it's um, in front of the property. Can you clarify that the, are the grounds at the back of the property, do they belong to the property or do they belong to the pilchard? As, the, as you go up these um, bits. to the, the side. These bits here? No, up that bit? and to the side, yeah, to the side of the seating area there. Is that, does that belong to the cottage or is that? I will ask the applicant to clarify, but my view, I think it's that that area belongs to the cottage. So there is potential for overlooking there. Yes, but only to the garden area, I would say. But you're still form you'd still be formalising by having seating there. You're saying it's occasional or possible people go up there. And At the moment, uh, I think there is an ability. It's a flat roof, so there is an ability for people to go up there. But I don't think it's a. It's not formally used in that way. But this would be formalising <laughs> that use. Yeah. So therefore, there would potentially be some loss of amenity if that is garden area by people looking into it where they don't now potentially yes yeah councillor burden and then councillor thomas yeah thank you um jack if you could just go back um there's a, a smaller picture um in <coughs> on the left uh, down in the left hand side of your montage which showed which was a visualization of how this would look from the uh from the mainland there can you can you enlarge that one? Oh, um, this one yeah, that one. <laughs> Sorry. All right. If it's going to cause, a, I'll get up and get closer to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Control shift. Button. Yeah. Okay. Fine. That's fine. That's all right. Okay, okay, that's, that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good. Yep. Right. Councillor Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chairman, just on the back of what Councillor Long was asking, um, the, the flat roof area, is that the area where we stood and there is a, currently a, a round table? At the, uh, if one stands behind the pilchard and looks at the mainland, the left hand end of the pilchard, there was a flat area that we didn't go and stand on because it was too windy. So we actually moved along in front of the, uh, the the property next door. Is that the area we're talking about? That flat area that I think it had a, did it not have a round picnic table on it? And we walked up past it. I'm just trying to. Yeah. <coughs> Any more questions on this part of the application? So the area we were looking at was this area here. Is that what you were talking? It was like yeah. one bit was grass <coughs> and the other was hard surfaced. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. Um, a thought has crossed my mind that um, the officer is caught in the design review panel. The general public wouldn't know who they would be. Could we have a brief explanation of who they are? Just one. Is that possible? If not, it just strikes me you're caught in, you know, a design review panel says this, that, and the other. <coughs> Sorry to drop you in it, but I just think that for general information. Generally speaking, within within the southwest, there are two um, recognised design review panels, both that are um, that use a selection of generally southwest based southwest based designers and architects. There's the Southwest Design Review Panel, which I believe was the one that was was used here, and there's um, Design in Excellence. I think is the, is the name of the other one. So there, there are two. They are completely independent from councils. They're completely independent from the from the 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 applicant or developer. There there are. I think there's normally about eight to twelve um, architects, depending on how many. Um, turn up, but they would have they would have looked they would have looked at the proposals they would have been to the site and they would have fed back um, their comments as a group of 
okay. of um, architectural professionals. Thank you for that. That's, that's what I wanted to point. Think, yeah. So, yeah. And I'll just add to that that um, their, their comments are within the documents with, on the website. Um, and in fact, in this case, the uh, applicants um, took on board what the design panel um, uh, said and then uh, resubmitted it to them once they've made the amendments so that they had a second a second view. And again, all of those comments are on the website. I just thought, I just thought it was important that people knew the background of that. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Um, are we ready to... Ah, Councillor Abbott. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wonder if my if I misunderstood when we were on the site visit. The the red marker is at the end of a di diagonal line at the moment, and the, and there's two sections of garden there in light grey. And I and I understood that the left hand one belonged to the uh, the other property, and where the marker is at this very moment, it belonged to the Pilchardins. And I thought that was going to be the garden, but it sounds as though. Um, the seating is going to be up the page from that north, yes, yeah, so on that area there. Is that, is that where the seating and tables are going to be? Correct. Ah. Okay. okay. Are members happy with what they've heard? That they've got enough information on that one at the moment. Until we, of course, we get other people we can question in due course. If we'd like to move on to the next part of this application, please. So the next um, part of the application is the conversion of the uh, garage building, which is seen in the photo just here. That's sort of opposite where the um, proposed extension to the Pilchard is. It's currently used as staff breakout area, um, as you can see in the upper photograph. Um, that The proposal is to convert that to um, a tea house, uh, the plans for which are... Uh, on the, the right hand side of the slide tea house come ice cream selling uh, again another version uh, of the plans uh, shown here so that's a, quite a small element if there are no questions I'll move on to the next part of the proposal oh. Sorry, sorry to be drag this out. Um, yeah, when we were at the site visit at that particular area, we not sorry not this one but the, the previous one. Where there was the, the issue came up about the sea wall as to whether or not it was appropriate to build right up against the sea wall. And I think there was going to be something coming back on that. I think there was you were waiting comment from somebody. Has there anything further been said about that? Uh, so to clarify, um, the Environment Agency raised a concern about the. So just go back. All right. Uh, yeah, they raised a concern about the building and its um, proximity to the key wall, and the fact that on occasions there are um, uh, occasions where the the sea wall has been overtopped in the past, um, and whether or not the building would be robust enough to withstand. Um, any of any such surges, the applicant, in response to that, um, commissioned his drainage uh, consultants to look into that in association with the environment agency to make sure that they were looking at the right information. Um, as a result of those discussions, um, the uh, environment agency have withdrawn their objection, subject to the uh, the two conditions on the. Um, Propose if the if the application is approved two specific conditions asking for details to be submitted prior to commencement of any work in this area. Okay, so I think we can move on to the next bit. Thank okay, you. so the uh, the next bit of the proposal is to provide um, staff accommodation. This issue was uh, during the pre-app and the design review panel was was much discussed discussed because um, there was a, a really big concern by Graham Lawrence, conservation specialist, and myself that this could end up with lots of little huts potentially being placed on the island, possibly in the fishermen's gardens area of the island, which we felt were was inappropriate. Um, uh, inappropriate development so there was uh, a lot of uh, ideas uh, considered 
Um, and because of the change in levels between the footpath and the tennis court, the top of the tennis court, or the surface of the tennis court, uh, there was a, a question raised as to whether or not we could, act, whether they could actually put the uh, staff accommodation um, under the tennis court and in that land. Um, having explored it, the applicant came up with this uh, proposal, which indeed does that. So um, you can see here, this is the floor plan. So there's a plant room at the back, and then there are 11 staff bedrooms along here and along here, and then a staff dining area, kitchen area um, at this end of the building. I'll just move on and show you some of the uh, visualisations. So it will be in this area of land here. Um, the bank at the rear, which we stood beside when we were on the site visit, will be reinforced and realigned in order to provide a complete screen at the rear. Uh, so effectively, for, uh, if you look at it from the shore side, this, this view is looking at the island from the beach or from Bigbury itself, um, and you shouldn't be able to see the building. Um, the site, obviously from the side, you will see the buildings, but this is a section through, and actually when you are actually on the island, it would be quite hard to see the, some of these sections because of the topography of the land. Um, so this is a sort of section through showing the real, re, realigned bank, the plant room with the accommodation on top. The proposal is for the building to have a flat roof um, and to for that flat roof to be uh, a green roof. Um, uh, but there will be a small element of slate uh, to the roof on the internal courtyard. Uh, so this is the internal courtyard. So there will be a small element of slate here. Um, but there's also, I think, I don't fully understand the technology, but there's also proposed along here to be a um, solar heating system, which will provide hot water for the um, for the staff accommodation, as I understand it. I'm sure the applicant can confirm that if I've got that wrong, but I'm fairly sure that's the situation. There's I'm sure view. he will be asked later. <laughs> But this is um, just other, other sections through the, the building. It's quite a simple design uh, um, with stonework on the ex both of the external elevations, which will be viewed. Um, and as shown on the previous plan, it's, an, it's a U-shaped building uh, set into the slope. Um, some questions were raised on the site visit about um, lighting um, from the shore. You won't see any lighting because of the bank. There, obviously there will be lights um, and potentially at night you might see a glow from the shore which faces up the island um, but uh, will be very minimal in terms of its um, impact uh, on the landscape. Uh, these are a few views just looking back from the top of the island. These are visualisations um, looking back. This is Big Bree obviously on sea. This is the staff accommodation, the flat roof. And the further away, further up the island you go, the, the less visible that, be, that that is. This is just showing the courtyard element. Um, and this is a uh, visual looking from above the proposed staff accommodation back towards Big Bree. And this is the staff accommodation with the green roof uh, and the courtyard just in front there. This is a visual um, which has been provided by the applicant showing what it's like inside the staff accommodation looking out. It's set, obviously set low down with the hillside extending above. Are there any questions about this aspect of the proposal? Uh, Coach Um First, uh, you know, the materials, etc. Um, you know, it shows a a dark palette, um, which presumably, when you look from looking from the top of the island, that you know it's not going to be white painted or, yeah, that's good. And then if you just go back to the um, the plans, it, did did it show a basement? Is there? A, it appeared as though there's a um, an un, there up, up the top. There you are, that one up the top. Is that a is that a basement or? A... That's a plant room. Right. Okay. 
very deep. Which I think is necessary for the solar heating aspect. Oh, okay, yeah, well, if it's some sort of ground source or whatever, then I understand that. Okay. Coach Panel and then Coach Long. Um, you indicated at the site that it's, it's proposed to move the footpath, which I believe from the Ordnance Survey is a public right of way. Um, is that Does that form part of our deliberations or is that a separate negotiation between the applicant and the highways authority? That would be um, a separate uh, application that would be required to be given to the public rights of way department at Devon County Council. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wyman. Can I just, with a, with a, don't mean to contradict the, this is Alexander, it would be an application either to Devon County or it could be an application to South Hams under the, the relevant provisions of the um, the Town and Country Planning Act to enable development to take place. Either way, it would be a, it would form a separate um, part or a separate application, and the granting of a planning permission does not automatically grant the the alteration to the route of a, of a public right of way. But presumably, they would have to get that approval before they could construct. Yes. This. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Be before they before they move to footpath they would need to so they wouldn't necessarily need to before any construction but clearly it would be before any construction that meant the um, alteration to the route of the footpath Coach Long. chairman it may it, it comes to my question comes into sort of a number of areas but particularly this it's the excavation of um, soil and materials from that site and unless I've missed it, I haven't seen any indication in any of the documents or plans showing where that soil will be used. I know there was an indication that the bank will be increased in depth and sort of size, but there's no indication because obviously there's a lot of spoil to come out of this site, and there's no indication on the plans elsewhere where additional spoil will be. Uh, you know, an indication whether the spoil is being taken off of the island or whether it's all going to be reused around the island, which obviously has an impact. I can't answer that question directly. Um, I do know that some of it will be reused on the site, but I don't know if it all will be. So it's probably a question that you need to ask the um, applicant. Coach Hosh. Thank you. One of the overriding things here all the, all the time, of course, is the impact on the AOMB. Have we received a report from the AOMB officers yet? Because I think in your report it says there isn't an A and B comment, and that would be really significant because this is one of the critical elements. Because we've got the um, footpath is, is also a question that you know that footpaths above the views from those will look straight down into this, whereas once they looked at maybe not so much used but tennis court. As as indicated in the report, the island itself is not actually in the A O M B. Well, very unusually, the the mainland is, um, but the island is not. So, um, but having said that. Obviously, the AOMB designation is really important, and we can't ignore the fact that the mainland, which is very short distance away, is within the AOMB. So, yeah. So we, um, so in considering the application, I was very clear that the application site is in the Heritage Coast designation and also in the Undeveloped Coast designation, but is not in the AOMB. In considering the setting of the AOMB, um, uh, my uh, conclusion was that actually this uh, proposal to, in effect, bury the staff accommodation has the least landscape, landscape impact that we could have hoped for, for um, a new building which will house 11 members of staff. The alternatives, as I said previously, would have been to have um, potentially beach hut style um, development down where the Fisherman's Gardens uh, is located. My view, um, and that of uh, the conservation officer is that actually this is a much better proposal uh, in terms of the impact on the landscape. Um, in terms of the AONB comments, we haven't received the AONB comments on, on this application, um, uh, have been chased, but haven't had any uh, comments back. Whilst we're touching on the aspect of, of paths, etc., um, in terms of access to the island, I, 
I appreciate I should probably have asked this question um, before, but uh, I didn't. Um, so the, the whole of the island is in private ownership. Is that is that is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah, because the public do have access to a considerable part of it. But uh, whilst you say there are footpaths, etc., I mean the public are not held to those foot. You know, I mean having visited myself several times, you know, so. Is, is 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 all of that land access public access land you know is it granted as such or i appreciate it's uh, a, bit, a bit of a possibly a bit of a uh, curveball question but but um it's interesting that that the public do have access to the the bulk of the island um some some areas are are sort of fenced off some aren't um it, <coughs> You know, it, it's been in some ways it's a bit confusing as to, you know, whilst it's great that you know, the public do have access, um, it's a bit confusing, you know, as to what bits they do have access to and what what they don't. And uh, whilst I guess if there are you know proper public footpaths there, um, you know, that normally on private land um, the public would be restricted to that footpath, but here they're not. Well, no, um, and I think one of the one of the um, overriding considerations when we went into the pre-app with this proposal was that public access was a, you know, should still be retained to the island um, because of the uh, benefits um, that it that it has, you know, in terms of well-being, but also in terms of beautiful views and, and what have you. The um, any public right of way, as you know, on private land, people are allowed to walk along. Um, the hotel um, do restrict um, um, access. Uh, had we walked up the existing footpath, there is a, a very uh, discreet, actually, fence line along that footpath, which the um, hotel restricts access to, but the rest of the island is um, available to the public. OK. Right. Shall we move on to the next aspect, please? So the next part of the proposal is the uh, Fisherman's Gardens. Um, it's shown in an old photograph here, along here, and also on an older, uh, older plan, divided um, at that point. Uh, um, and the, uh, as I say, the landscape architect was very keen to reinstate uh, this historic reference point um, and has done so um, in the proposal. So if you look at the bottom, this bottom image, I have to do, try and zoom in again on, on it. Um, the proposal is to reinforce some of the landscaping around it, in, in, around here. Um, but also to reinforce the um, uh, the hedge the hedgerows which which align with the um, previous fishermen's gardens. Um, there's also a proposal to erect uh, two buildings, which I previously mentioned. One will this one will be um, a building which will um, house um, machinery associated with main maintenance of the island and also the rib. Um, and this bit will be a workshop area and then a bin store. Mm just here um, to um, to hide the bins that we saw the other day when we were on site. I can't get back. Go. Um, so as I was talking uh, on site, the buildings are set uh, at the back edge of the of the um, of the area um, with a uh, lean to roof facing away from the mainland um, in a, in a Color, a dark color again with um, stonework and timber as the elevational treatments um, in order to res uh, to reduce the potential impact of those buildings from when looking from the beach. So imagine they'll be along they'll be in this bit here. Um, and um, so again, uh, I don't uh, anticipate them being too visually intrusive. Um, somebody on the site visit asked about the uh, dimensions of these buildings. Um, 
the width is approximately seven meters and the length uh, in total is uh, 20 meters long. Uh, this is just a section through the building. So you can see that's the bin store, the workshop, the storage, storage shed, and again, a closer view of the section through and the elevational treatment. Any questions? Can you give the measurements again, please? So 20 metres long. So that dimension. Yeah. And uh, the, the maximum is 7.2, I think it is, 7.2 metres wide. Thank you. Johnson, and then Coach Martin. My question was just, um, you, uh, you, you did have a visualisation of the... Um, uh, the, the, the extension to the pilchard from from the mainland. Have you got one of those for these buildings? There isn't a visualisation of them, no. But I do have some um, images at the end of the presentation, which um, show various um, from various viewpoints all of the developments on the island. So I'll show you them. It might be a bit of an odd question, but. Anyway, um, that whole area, this fisherman's garden, which is going from being, as you said, an untidy area, but to actually more of a built up area. Was it ever discussed that this could have been potentially used um, rather than keeping the septic tank arrangements that are currently in the neighbouring somebody else's um, ownership gardens? The fact that there, you know, there's obviously going to be an impact, the, the more staff, the more visitors, the more septic tank is used. Is it, was it ever considered that that whole septic tank and a reed bed could have been relocated in that fisherman's garden, which would have actually taken all of the, you know, the pressure off the neighbours and also wouldn't have been then had to have a, a you know, make this a built, a, more of a built up area, which is having quite a significant impact on that whole look of Burr Island. The, there was discussion um, about 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 that during the pre-app process this bit of the um, fisherman's gardens is likely to be the area where there will be some form of sewage treatment for the island um, the applicant uh, i discussed this with the applicant's agent uh, on the site visit and they in their presentation will talk about the drainage proposals for the site um, i think you mentioned the reed beds um, when we were on the site visit um, and uh, I'm led to believe, and through the um, energy statement, which is on the website, it was considered, but was not considered feasible. Um, uh, so, so, so yes, I think that's answered the question. So, there will be a outflow from septic tank to reed beds or such like. Yeah. No, there will be no reed beds, no. No reed beds. So, so the outflow from the septic tank will go where? I think um, I'm going to defer to the applicant to... Oh, to I'll ask that, that later. Sorry, to, just to confirm, it's been something which, been, which has been being um, evolved as the application has been progressing. Um, and so I think it's only recently that they've um, reached a conclusion as to what the ultimate solution will be. I, I'm fairly sure it doesn't include reed beds, but the applicant may be able to confirm that when he speaks. OK, we'll, we'll keep that one for, for them. Yes, I'll bring it now. <laughs> Okay, so can we move? No, Councillor Long. Oh, Councillor Long, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a clarification, obviously, we have a slipway um, there. I know there were early discussions about sort of amendments, changes, but I haven't seen anything on the plans. I'm assuming there are no works or changes to that slipway proposed? There, there were, was discussion, as, as you said, about the potential to reuse the, to, you know, reuse the, um, the slipway near the Fisherman's Gardens. Um, it's not part of the 
current proposal. It was part of the current proposal in that they would like to reuse it, but there are no works proposed at this moment on that aspect of the island. Are you happy with that, Commissioner? Right. All right. I will tempt fate and say, shall we move on to the next one, please? The building called Chergwin, which is the building, I'll just quickly go back. So it's this building here, which is adjacent to the, um, the, the hotel. It is listed um, by virtue of its proximity to the, the hotel. Um, as explained on the site visit, it's um, it was actually one of the first buildings on the island and was uh, um, known in, uh, initially as a guest house. Um, we've got some... Uh, Going the wrong way here. Yeah. Um, um, and is uh, very dear to our conservation specialist's heart. He um, expressed uh, very uh, clearly that he didn't want too many changes to be made to this building, if any at all, um, because he felt it was you know, very representative of, of the history uh, of the evolution of the island and the hotel. Um, so the proposals for this building are. Um, some internal alterations um, to, to the building to create the rooms needed um, and some minor alterations to window and door openings uh, on the elevation facing the beach. Um, uh, it also will be re-roofed and repainted. Um, the, addition, the other element which is additional, um, currently, I, I tried to point out when we were on the site visit, there's a number of sort of sort of um, extensions uh, to the hotel at the rear here, which have been added in mo most recent years, which um, give a bit of a back of house uh, feel. Um, and so the uh, proposal is to remove these aspects of, of, the, of the, uh, the existing hotel building and to replace it with a very lightweight um, uh, link, if you like, between Chergwin and the building, and this would provide for the staff canteen, which is proposed in this area here of the building. Um, and I'll just move on to some in visualizations. So this is the proposed link building, very lightweight, glazed, um, will not impact on the integrity, I don't believe, and uh, neither does the conservation specialist of this of this building, but it does provide a link which. Um, functionally will be uh, help, more helpful to the hotel and on all of these uh, extensions and what have you have been removed in this in this view. That's it. Um, and oh sorry so, uh, just to confirm inside the building there will be a couple of staff three or four staff route accommodation rooms um, a couple of offices uh, and also the staff canteen. Um, you, you were saying that this one's listed uh, because of its uh, proximity to the hotel. Um, currently, when we went to look, I mean, the whole thing is dark green. Um, but that shows a major change to, you know, t uh, t uh, to white, etc., which is a change under the list. You know, I mean, you're, on the one hand, you're saying that the landscape officer does, or, you know, listed building officer doesn't want any changes, yet that's a complete change in colour. Don't really understand that. Well, the the, yeah, the conservation specialist has not raised that as a concern uh, to me. Hmm. There was a listed building application um, which accompanied the planning application, and that's been approved. Okay, so you had some older photographs. So, did, what sort of colour was it? You know, when it was when it was original. Uh, <laughs> right there here, in black and white. Here is a. Uh, this is it currently, right. and this was it in the past, so it looked like it was a lighter colour in it the past, does. actually. Okay, fair enough. Any other questions on this one? No? Okay. Shall we move on? Move on.
Now looking at the extensions to the hotel. So there are two uh, proposed extensions. One is to the Nettlefold Bar, which sits at the front of the hotel. Currently, this area is existing. Uh, and the proposal is to, um, and above here is an external terrace. Um, and the proposal is to encompass that terrace into the uh, inside of the building. Um, the reason I put this up is because I wanted to show the um, the work that had gone in to deciding how to treat the elevation. Uh, these are all different um, ideas about how the elevation should look uh, and, 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 and what sort of window design um, and consideration. And, and um, the, again, the design review panel, as previously mentioned, were uh, involved quite heavily in, in, in this aspect of the proposal. These are some visualizations showing the uh, proposal. So this is the ultimate uh, design with the heavier uh, rendered uh, divisions between the windows uh, reflecting that similar approach to the existing nettle fold bar. Um, this is a visualization from the grass on one side. So uh, increase the increased height um, to the bottom of the balcony to the accommodation above. And this is a view looking out from inside that uh, part of the building. Any questions? Any questions? No? Okay. okay so we'll on. move on, <coughs> excuse me, move on to the, um, the other end, the west wing. I just wanted to show you this image of the hotel, which was obviously quite a while ago. It's included in the design and access statement provided by the applicant. You can see Chergwin down there. This is before the there is an extension. Uh, this is like an early, very early version of the hotel. There's currently already in the extension, which took took the building in this direction. Um, but it was quite a nice uh, view, I thought, of, of what the building used to be like. Um, <clears throat> again, I just wanted to show this image again because there was lots of discussion about how to treat this end of the building. I know when we were on site, we discussed it at length. Should it be a square end? Should the windows reflect what's um, on the extension further down? So there again, there were lots of discussions and lots of um, views expressed about what uh, what should happen. Um, the ultimate um, decision was that the ends of the building should be should form a curve. There are curves elsewhere in the building, as you can see on this floor plan, um, and. The view was that to uh, create a, a link and then the extension would acknowledge the fact, would, would acknowledge the new element of the proposed, of the building um, so that it read as, you know, you could, you could understand the story of the, of the evolution of the building effectively. So these are the floor plans. Uh, so this is all existing here and this is the proposed extension at this end. Um, when we were on site, when we were on site, somebody asked the, the, for the dimension of the, well, the extent of the extension, if you like, um, and it comes out eight meters this way. So there will be some excavation into the bank uh, in order to accommodate uh, this this aspect of the building, and also a little area here where, um, which will provide surface level access to this part of the building. So there's all the floor plans. Um, I just wanted to emphasise on the the roof. There's proposed solar panels on all of the uh, on the extension, but also on all of the the rest of the building as well. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, these are some elevation elevations. This is the new element of the building. Um, sorry, I should should also explain. That there's, there's proposed staff accommodation in this area here and this area here, uh, two staff uh, accommodation rooms in, in that area. Um, so this is a section through, but looks at it um, effectively from the uh, gated entrance to the hotel grounds. Uh, this is the proposed extension sitting approximately a metre um, higher than the existing roof line. Um, as previously mentioned, that there was originally, in fact, actually it's on here, it's not actually a part of the proof plan, but there was proposals for a 
uh, a rooftop terrace, a uh, rooftop apartment suite up here. That's been removed from the application. The conservation specialist um, refused the first listed building application on the basis that he was not uh, he was not happy with this. So that's now been removed um, from the plans. Um, and these are uh, before and after of the. Um, I don't know. Not this is this is the east elevation with the netafold bar. You can just see in the background there the proposed extension on that elevation. And here, this is looking at it effectively from the mermaid pool side of the proposal. We've got some visual as a section through. So it shows the uh, the sort of half story changes in uh, levels between the existing extension and the proposed. And that's showing the solar panels I was referring to. And um, this is some visual, these are some visualizations provided which show curved ends um, and the fact that it sits into the landscape at the back there. Um, this is the one of the staff accommodation rooms, and the other one is down here below, below the level of this photograph. Um, yeah, this is just a. I'll move on to that one in a minute. Just are there any <coughs> other questions? Any questions, members? Councillor Hodgson. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite understanding what's being taken away in that area between um, the Chetwin and the, um, the main hotel. I mean, there's there's been a few photos, and I've thought, oh, is that the bit that's been taken out, or what? Yeah. So sorry, go back to the last one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that bit between, which is kind of yeah, where there's the red writing on it, is yeah. that what's coming out? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the water tower on top of Cou the Councillor Abbott and then Councillor. Thank you. Uh, can you um, just go over how the twelve double rooms fit in to that oval extension, please? Right, any more questions? Yes, Coach Long. Um, Chairman, <coughs> thank you. This, this solar panels, can you confirm? I didn't see any detail in the uh, plans. Are they going to sit flat on the roof, on the each, you know, sort of roof, each roof? Yes, they are. Um, that was a, a request from the conservation specialist that we didn't have the tooth edge type. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Coach Long. <coughs> Sorry, Chairman. Um, yeah, the, there was a previous planning application, which was for solar panels on the tennis court. So, is this is is this a different tennis court, or is this the, this is the tennis court? And, there were yeah. two tennis courts. Okay, so it's there. So there it's on a different tennis still court. There. Mm, they're okay. still there. Yes. Thank you. All right. Where are we now? We just. I just wanted to. Um, just discuss finally the um, so some views from uh, various viewpoints that were provided in the landscape and visual impact assessment, so that members can see the distant views of the proposals. Um, right. Okay. Right. Yep. okay. So these are just a couple of sections through the island, uh, so that you can see the sort of a this is a very long section across but um this sh so this shows the staff accommodation moving down to the chergrin uh, moving this is the cottage the privately owned cottage pilchard and the proposed extension um and this um i don't know why i put this one in but this is just showing some of the i think i probably put this in the wrong place so but it does show the extent of landscaping that will be needed and then a footpath will be coming down and then around and up here so the landscape proposals 
um, are um, in two parts because the, the plan was uh, too big to incorporate. So again, there's some reinforced landscaping along here, all in indigenous species so that they will reflect the landscaping currently on the island. This area obviously also will be landscaped and in here. Um, uh, and there's some additional landscaping proposed uh, just above just above the staff accommodation in, in here. Um, there's some more sort of, if you like, manicured um, proposals within the hotel grounds. Um, the um, cypress trees, which are very dominant uh, on the island, will, there's an, an idea that there'll be some succession planning for those. So the landscaping includes um, trees, which will then ultimately be uh, replaced those trees as and when and if they they are no longer viable uh, you know long term into the future long time into the future but they do provide quite an important landscape feature uh, on the island um, and then there's a bit of manicured uh, landscaping around the paths are made slightly more formalized um, and there's some seating which uh, are, is proposed in in these areas and also um, up here, you get very good views along the coast towards Bantham. <clears throat> That's just a general, it's just a general view, but um, in a much smaller scale of the landscape proposals uh, associated with this development. Excuse me. <clears throat> and this is just a number of views of the island um, take, uh, provided in the landscape and visual impact assessment, which show members the impact of the development from different viewpoints. So there's these two um, looking from the mainland. Um, see, you can see the proposed extension at the back here, the nettle fold bar, the pilchard extension, and you can't see the um, the, the staff accommodation, uh, and you can't see the buildings either. Uh, this is a view from Bantham. Obviously, that's the extended uh, version of the hotel, um, painted, painted and rendered similar to the main hotel. This is further across again. It's quite a dominant building in any case because of its uh, white painted uh, finish. This is from the headland above Bantham. <coughs> Further back, it's from the road into Bantham Beach, further along the coast. This is from above Big Brion Sea. This is from the coastline in the other direction. And this is from Chalabra, I think. Yes. Look, they've got the um, pilchard extension on as well. Changes to the Chirgrin, which is now white. Um, not sure if they show the buildings that you asked about, but. Um, that was a question I was going to ask. Yeah, does it show the buildings? They either they either do show them and you can't see them, or or they don't show them. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll ask for clarification. For, the, they um, do. Apparently, the applicant is nodding, so um, apparently they have been um, right. Put the, ex in. the extension to the pilchard that's there as well. Yeah, Just there. That one's there. Yeah, <laughs> so that's good. Uh, again. Extension to the pilchard just there, extension at the back behind the cypress tree. This is a view, this is a few views now looking back from the top of the island back towards the mainland, and it also shows the proposals. And you can see the solar panels, and this is the curved end of the proposed extension. Again, this isn't showing the extension, but that's the showing the location of the extension again from the island. Similarly, just showing where the extension will be as opposed to actually showing it. This is the solar panels that you were referring to, Councillor Hodgson, on the other tennis court. That's just the tennis court. 
uh, and the um, again the west wing will be here, slightly higher than than the one that's there at the moment. So we've got to the end. <laughs> so just in terms of um, Hang on. Uh, we oh, sorry, got, sorry, sorry. Don't worry. You, you haven't got one going the other way because we started out with the Bayview Cafe, didn't we? We, yeah. we haven't got we got uh, one that sh similar one that shows the impact <coughs> the impact of that looking. Okay. Sorry. No. Chairman, I've got a question. One of the views shows the uh, designated helicopter ad just above the tennis courts, and I'm wondering how that's. Um, I think it was one of your later ones. No, it's one much later on. Much later. Were you looking down? There, there. Um, that's obviously above the. Um, tennis courts which are going to be built on and I didn't see that incorporated the helicopter pad incorporated into any of the uh, either the landscape plans or any of the other plans considering that there's additional landscaping going in to the side and behind there so I think that needs to be clear on the plans as to whether that's being changed or um, inciting or actually exists because it doesn't appear on the plans um, I will um... <coughs> Yes, I mean, as far as I'm aware, that's not checked. It's staying where it is, but I agree with you about the plans. It doesn't I, seem to be appearing. I would question why would you want to change it because of the building below. Mm. It's not going to be above the level of the top of the tennis court. Yeah, anyway. I'm just concerned about the landscaping plans and, you know, everything else like that. Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chairman. I can't recall, uh, Mr Tasman, I'm sorry. Was there a, a, a mock-up from that sort of angle of the staff accommodation? Because it seems odd to look at a picture from this angle, which is the only point on the island. There was one earlier. I think there was. Can we just go? Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. It's just that it would have been useful to have that there because when we're thinking about it. Right, thank you. Okay. Okay. Coach Long. Chairman, before uh, Ms. Houselander goes into sort of a general comments, um, a general comment from myself on process that um, I perhaps should have raised at the beginning. Um, just a question as to why the neighbouring parish of Selston wasn't um, consulted in this, given the, uh, pr you know, the, the visual impact of the uh, staff extension. I think I know the answer, but it's just a sort of a question as the parish are looking across the island. Um, I can understand that question. Um, we normally um, consult when uh, there's an actual physical, you know, it's very close to the physical boundary of a parish, um, but I completely understand why you would raise that question. Um, but it, we didn't, we didn't, um, but I can understand why you would think that would be an important consideration. Chairman, I, I, all, all, all I would add is that, of course, um, that the consultation was in accordance with your existing policy and had a neighbouring parish council got concerns about a planning application that was in a neighbouring parish. Um, then, you know, the weekly list is, or the list is published um, and circulated so they could have commented had they been, had they, they been so concerned. Thank you. Jackie, have you got any more to say? Or I'm just going to summarise. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Too many buttons to press. <laughs> One of the questions... Um, raised uh, uh well what one of the questions that officers had to consider was because the development is in the heritage coast um and within the setting of the aomv we needed to consider whether or not this development was um, major development um and um this was given a lot of consideration um uh, discussions with the landscape um officer and there was a meeting with the aomv unit very early on in the process 
um, and there was a question about whether or not it was major development in the AOM uh, in the Heritage Coast. If development, uh, the MPPF indicates that if it is major development, then uh, it should only be granted in exceptional circumstances. So it was a big consideration uh, f for me when I was when I was considering the um, application. The, the in, in my view, um, whilst it is a there are a number of development proposals. Uh, my view that it doesn't constitute major development in uh, in the Heritage Coast, um, it, and that that decision has been made in line with the MPPF um, considerations, um, and it, it's rather a series of smaller self-contained projects. There is also within the um, planning file um, a proposed phasing plan. So, in terms of its impact on the landscape, the impact will be will not be um, sig significant in that it will be done in discrete parcels of development. So you won't have a massive development site um, across the, the the width and extent of the island for a long period of time. You will have uh, individual um, projects taking place. Some might take place at the same time, but they will be um, uh, limited in their extent. And my view was therefore that um, it did not constitute major development um, and therefore um, did not require the tests that the MPPF requires. Um, the impact on the landscape is obviously important, um, but what we also need to uh, needed to bear in mind in, in, in terms of the um, application and in, in line with the MPPF and our joint local plan uh, with regard to sustainable development is the um, economics. The hotel, um, as you will have seen, um, is... Um, uh, you know, is, is, is very lovely um, and provides a very unique, um, very unique uh, provision. Um, but it also is very costly to um, to run, to maintain, uh, because some of the, the aspects of the building are uh, old. As, as I think everyone mentioned, the, the windows yesterday when we when we were, Monday when we were on site and and, and the the heating bill uh, probably is very very large. <coughs> Um, and the applicants provided a um, short business case to indicate that the the addition of these extra rooms was uh, vital in order to sustain the viability of the hotel um, on the island. Um, and um, the design review panel were were very were also very um, uh, aware of, of that issue, but also felt that the, there was visual a uh, minimal visual impact on on the landscape from the proposals. Um, in terms of heritage, uh, the um, the applicants have worked, as I say, very proactively with our, our conservation specialist, Graham Lawrence, um, and um, ha have you know they've cha many changes have been made in order to make it as uh, uh, impactless as possible on the integrity of the listed buildings, um, and the listed building application has already been approved, as previously mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Quick uh, question. Quick question, Chairman. Um, you mentioned the um, that it, the developments would the de developments, if approved, would be carried out in a you know a scheme. Any indication as to what would be done first, in what sort of order? I meant to look at it before I came here today, and I didn't manage to. But the, it is on the um, the website, and I I suspect I might be able to get yeah, maybe, clarification maybe from the applicant, applicant on that. All right. Thank you, members. Bearing in mind we've been here an hour and a half, it would be an ideal time to have a five minute break. Um, and I'm warning you all now, I don't hear anybody talking about what we've heard in here. You can talk about the weather, coffee, whatever, but uh, go out, have a five minute break. We'll come back and then hear the rest of the speakers. But please don't discuss anything you've heard here now.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, we will now proceed to the, the supporters and objectors. We have an echo. No, it's not. I'm just checking it's working. It's working. <laughs> it is working. Right, okay. <clears throat> um, we have an objector and a Mr. Harvey in a statement to be read out by the clerk. Yes. Would you proceed to do that, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, dear committee, thank you for the invite to attend. However, due to medical reasons, not <coughs> able to present today. I therefore wish to strongly highlight one of the key points in relation to my overall objections as objected by others in terms of the staff accommodation proposed for the Warren Cottage car park, but is now integrally linked to another planning application reference 2291 forward slash 22 forward slash 4 Harrell Limited change of use from a care home to C1 for staff accommodation for Burr Island Hotel, for which a conditional approval has been granted. The planning application 2291 forward slash 22 forward slash 4 clearly stated as shown below and was directly discussed by my daughter and son-in-law with Mr Jarl Fuchs at the parish council meeting a number of months ago that should approval be given under 2291 forward slash 22 forward slash 4 then the main application 4744 forward slash 21 forward slash 4 would as stated in 2291 forward slash 22 forward slash 4 submitted document design and access statement planning statements dated 12th of July 2022 0001N Corneloff dated 24th of June 2022 Appendix 1 planning statements change of use from care home to C1 hotel use for staff for Burt Island Hotel Corneloff Big Brew on Sea need for staff accommodation a current planning application for the master plan of works to Burr Island Hotel includes a proposal for staff accommodation on the rear of the Bayview Cafe site. This application is for the same accommodation and would remove the need to build staff accommodation on the Bayview Cafe site. If this application is granted, um, BIH would remove from staff accommodation at the rear of the Bayview Cafe site from the Burr Island Hotel master plan planning application. At the meeting, my daughter and son-in-law represented me and supported the change of use subject to the agreed removal mentioned in the design and access statement wording of planning application 2291 forward slash 22 forward slash 4. To date, the application 4774 forward slash 21 forward slash 4 has not been revised to remove the Warren Cottage staff accommodation and it also appears no reference in the officer report and decision notice for planning application 2291 forward slash 22 forward slash 4 has referred to or put this condition in place across either application. Therefore, unless such is done, particularly for planning application 4774 forward slash 21 forward slash 4, then one of the key points for objection overall remains. I also do not accept, amongst other things within my objections, the addition of the glass structure to the Pilchard Inn on the island, as it's one of the first things people see and historically it totally changes the meaning of the very old inn and its character and perspective. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Amelia. Um, yes, we can't ask any questions of the objector. Have you got any clarity on what she's saying, please? <coughs> yes, so in terms of the concern that the accommodation to the rear of uh, Bayview Cafe um, being uh, still within the current application you're being asked to consider today it is not and i have an email which may not actually be on the the um, system uh, as yet but does uh, remove all of the plans that will uh, that indicate that accommodation um, and and also just to be clear uh, for members when a design and access statement is not an approved document so any supporting documents that come with it, unless there are specific um, aspects within that document that are part of the approved plans, 
they are the only bits that, so in terms of our approval, when we issue a decision, the only um, bits that are, uh, that are included are the plans, and the plans that will be included in any decision made on this are the ones where the staff accommodation behind Bayview Cottage has been removed. Thank you. Members happy with that? <laughs> yes, I know, Sir Abbott. I know that look. <laughs> right. Um, I think we'll... <clears throat> Sorry, I should have said um, at the end of my presentation, um, there is a need for a unilateral undertaking to, to be um, provided with this. The applicants are very aware of it. It's for the Tamar Estuaries. Um, it's in the Tamar Estuaries influence zone uh, for the, the, the SAC um, and so therefore there will be a need for a new unilateral undertaking so the recommendation is approval subject to that unilateral undertaking in addition a number of the conditions that are currently on the, um, the on the planning report there are about four which need slight revisions one of which is in relation to the drainage um, the drainage condition recommended by the environment agency effectively didn't meet the tests for a condition um, and I did have discussions with the applicant about how that should be met um, and I did actually indicate to them that I would change the wording of the condition <coughs> and I neglected to do so so there are about four conditions on the consent which on the proposed consent which will need slight variations I just wanted to make members aware I didn't want you to make your decision without knowing that 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 was necessary Right, thank you for that. That was helpful. Um, Coach Hodgson? A unilateral undertaking <coughs> to do what? To pay a contribution to the, the, the Tamar SAC, Estuary SAC oh, okay. recreational area. So it's a, it's a financial contribution. Okay. Right. In that case, we'll be. Uh, Coach Taylor? Yeah, it, these conditions will be added if, if we uh, see approved, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the Correct. end of the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Fuchs, it's your turn and you have five minutes, so get yourself settled down and when you're ready, turn on your um, microphone and uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Mr Chairman, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Charles Fuchs and I've been a custodian of Bayer Island for about four and a half years. During that time, I've managed to learn most things about her. I've learned about the history, the structure of the buildings, the ecology, the operations of a hotel on a tidal, tidal island and the impact of the weather. I have not yet ascertained whether the myths are true about Joseph of Arimathea or the Knights Templar's treasure are buried on the island, but I live in hope. My understanding of these issues facing the island and the business that runs on it have enabled me to create a planning application that will solve them. I will initially set out these problems. The structure of the buildings. The main hotel was built almost 100 years ago. It had its heyday during the 30s, from then until 1986, when Tony Porter rescued it. It was in decline and ended up being mostly derelict. I know Tony Porter and discuss the hotel with him regularly. We discuss the fabric of the hotel and the money we have spent and invested to renovate, maintain her fabric. He apologises and says the hotel never made enough money to keep her in good order and that a lot of the maintenance was just patchwork. He's not joking. Although I don't know the orchards who own the island after Tony, I can tell you their solution to maintenance was the same. Over the last four and a half years, the shareholders have not had one penny in dividends. This is because we've been making good a hundred years of neglect. Frankly, we still have work to do and I don't expect to be paying dividends anytime soon. But the old lady is in far better shape than she was when we bought her. It is not surprising that the cost of maintaining the structure is so large, given that she's daily battered by Atlantic waves, enormous gales and regularly has salt rubbed in her wounds. Operating a tidal island and hotel. The difficulty and price of getting goods, supplies, staff, guests, etc. on and off the island is very much higher than that of a normal hotel, not to mention the upkeep of a 27-acre island. 
a unique sea tractor whose gears have to be made in America, and whose tyres cost £8,000 each. The issue is that this unusually high operating cost is spread across a very small number of rooms. We also need an unusually high number of staff to cover shifts, to drive the sea track, to collect guests, move the goods, do the gardening, and all in an area of high property costs, and which in uh, an area that is very sparsely populated, resulting in having to provide accommodation for staff, some of which must be on the island for service and security. A large issue for the hotel has been recruiting and retaining staff for these reasons. Part of the community. The hotel had a period of isolation from the local community prior to our purchase. We have reforged that bond. <clears throat> when we bought the island, we immediately reopened the whole pub to the public. We invited non-residents to join us for meals and afternoon teas. In the hotel, we gifted the use of the Burview Cafe for free for the village to use as a tea room. And we have been instrumental in helping and hosting the Big Brunette Zero campaign, which got national acclaim. We are embedded in the community. <coughs> if we want a sustainable and reliable hotel, we need to create more income to cover the extraordinary costs of running and maintaining this island. That means more rooms, more restaurants and more facilities. We also need to house our staff in acceptable accommodation, both on and off the island. As most of, you, most of you will know, I have withdrawn the application for staff accommodation behind Warren Cottage as I was able to purchase Cornlaw of an ex-hotel in Bigbury. This is currently being renovated and will provide some but not all of the staff accommodation that we need and will keep and attract and retain staff. We have also withdrawn the application for two new suites on the roof after discussion with the village and Graham Lawrence. What has cheered me immense, immensely is the support we have received from the village and how few objections we have received this application. Those of you who are interested in understanding this project will have seen and read most of some of the thousand pages of explanation detailed reports that we have submitted or at least read the 29 page planning application report. You will no doubt have had most of your questions answered. This is an exhaustive and detailed application which has taken us over two years to put together. As an integral part of the South Hams community, we have left no stone unturned to make sure that the application we have submitted is as sympathetic to the environment as it can be whilst engaging with the community to limit area, any areas of friction, but still solves the problems of running Burr Island. I must thank Jacqueline Houselander from the Planning Department and Graham Lawrence from Conservation for being so engaged and concise, as well as a myriad of experts, advisors, including the Peer Review Board, who gave such sage and knowledgeable advice. We take our responsibilities as custodians, custodians seriously and are content that this is a well-considered and thought-through solution to a very difficult, many-faceted problem. Its impact on the mainland, the environment, along with its sustainability credentials, are impressive. I trust and hope you agree. If, I, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you for that. Um, questions, members? <clears throat> Kate Charlton. Thank you. And uh, we, it was really interesting to come to the site visit on Monday. Thank you very much. Um, I'm still concerned about what's happening to the waste out fall, the sewage out fall. Um, reading through um, one of the um, co reports that you've had written to this, it looks like the sea is the ultimate destination for the outfall. Um, given the concerns that have been raised in recent weeks and months of the amount of problems, problematics, un untreated sewage reaching the sea and all that that impacts and all the fact that it would impact on your business too, of course. Um, is there no alternative that could be considered, to, as you probably heard me point out earlier, that perhaps something more like, I mean, a reed bed, I have personally built on a reed bed. They're not difficult. They're not heavy work. I know the scale you'd be talking about would be considerably different. But it does seem to me that you do have the opportunity there to do something a lot better and to alleviate the risk of um, people like me. Um, let's deal with a reed bed first. Unfortunately, we don't have enough space for a reed bed. We looked at it. Well, we've looked at every possible solution, digestion solution and everything. Uh, and this is uh, the best. In fact, we have a temporary licence to um, put the water in the sea. But the water that will end up having gone through the system will be drinking quality, if you're brave. <laughs> um, but it is our belief and our experts' belief that this is the best and most uh, obvious solution. And rebeds in that location aren't possible for us. Thank you. 
can I can just come back? Yeah, you can come back. So the other option would be an anaerobic digester, which doesn't take the, take the space in the roof space. Obviously, it's in the right space, okay. but it could be part of your energy provision for the hotel. You know, and then you end up with something that's quite inert and a lot less unpleasant to deal with, and you get good energy from it. We've actually got an anaerobic digester in Salt Lake, which nobody's particularly aware of, so it's not a not a big problem. I see. I'd have to say, if you want to answer that question, I'd have to ask my um, very specific <laughs> advisors behind me, because that's uh, beyond my pay grade, I'm afraid. But uh, we, uh, we've looked at every, repeat myself, we've looked at every <coughs> possible solution, and this is the best outcome, best solution. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Long. <coughs> Thank you. Um, you would have heard my earlier question with regard to uh, excavation materials, spoil, soil. Um, I don't see anything. Yes, there are thousands of pages of documents. Believe me, I've gone through every single one of them. And if I've missed it, I'll apologise, but I don't actually see it in the construction <coughs> management plan or others. It's a description as to where, how you're going to site move, whether it's going to go off site or whether it's going to be used on the island. Thank you. Um, just an interesting aside, when the hotel was built, a lot of the terraces are created out of the spoils of the current hotel, and that is our number one plan to reseat re it around the island of making burrs and secure um, stop line of sight from the mainland for the staff accommodation, etc. But we haven't got a full cut and fill analysis done yet, and that will be done and provided um, once we get to the structural engineering or the, the total plan of doing the work. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, well, this is a slightly tongue-in-cheek, but almost comment to the fact that if you're going to reinstate your fishermen's gardens, knowing the state they're in now, you'll probably want some soil on them. Uh, that's a very good point, Chairman. I think we could probably get rid of most of it down there, yes. No other questions. There was some. I'll, I'll bring this up. There was a. There was somebody mentioned when we were on site something about ownership. And we're going to um, jog anybody's memories. I can't remember exactly what it was, but if it's not there, all right. Yes. <coughs> was it my question about sustainability and, and the sustainability of the build? Is that? Something? Oh, it was more about actual ownership of who owns what. I think, councillor. Yeah, we were querying um, the cottage that's next to the pilchard. Is that in? Is that freehold private ownership, or is that on a long leasehold? Or no, it's freehold to Mr. Linfield, just over there. Right. Thank you. And are there any other freehold um, properties on the island that are not yours? No, there are two others. There's the pillbox, uh, which is um, just by the fisherman's cottage, which is also not owned by us. There are three separate small freeholds. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Coach Long. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there was one question that came up, obviously, about the um, the house next to the Pilchard and the new seating area created a level and the concern about sort of overlooking <coughs> and potential loss of amenity. And it wasn't, cla wasn't able to be clarified as to whether the side by that seating area is actually used garden. Um, and what measures you'd looked at to uh, reduce any overlooking or loss of a meaning? Um, yeah, that was a bit complicated, that bit, without... Oh, is that it? No. Um, so if you look towards the beach from behind the Pilchard, for those of you who have been there, there is, uh, to the left of the Pilchard, a seating area, which is ours, and people drink and eat, and can there is some view... Of, there's some view of uh, Miss Bloomfield's garden from there. This roof terrace, which currently has air conditioning units and is a flat roof, we are planning to use it's the same level pretty well as the main first floor, or depends on which side you are, as you go into the pub um, saloon. And it's to the left of that, probably a yard down from that. And we are intend to use that, is where the terrace is existing. Um, but I had a chat with Miss Bloomfield, and we will make every, uh, every, every, uh, case we can to try and make sure that he's consulted along the way for that and make sure his garden is protected as much as possible. Okay, uh, uh, Councillor Panel. Could I ask um, the officer whether it would be possible to condition 
opaque screening on that side so that that um, it would not be possible to look into the neighbouring property. Um, uh, in view of the fact that we have to, um, uh, when, with the recommendation will be approval subject to the unilateral undertaking, I'm sure there's a, um, a possibility for us to be able to negotiate to put a condition on which will uh, secure opaque screening. Excuse me, on the end of the um, the outside seating area. Oh yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Sorry, in a long-winded way. <laughs> okay, everybody finished. Uh, Curtis Merton. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry to keep coming back to this um, this question of, of, of the sewage treatment, etc. Um, so, for, from what you, you've described, what you're, you're actually talking about putting in is a, I think, what's known as a package treatment plant, which is effect, you know, it's, it's got an electric um, sort of screening set set up in that. You know, they're fairly fairly common, and they're used, you know, for housing estates and that that type of thing. So, and and they. As, as you said, you know the water the discharge from them is, is, yeah, as you say, it might be drinkable. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I don't think either of us want, would would wish to find out. Um, so, question questions on that one. Um, whereabouts is it going to be sited? Um, the we've already heard with regard to to the impact on the um, the, the cottage um, of of the. Um, uh, the septic tank for the, the pilchard. Now, the pilchard's going to have an extension, which is going to have more people. Um, is, it, it, will you know, will the, the sewage treatment plant also deal with the, with the pilchard? Um, I mean, I think <coughs> from discussion, I mean, what, what, I think what residents are very keen to stop is the, you know, is the, effectively the slurry tanker, you know, tracking for, and, and uh, I'm sure that you probably wish to. As well. So, I think what, what we would, you know, I mean, I, I appreciate it's possible. Maybe one of your, you know, you know, one of your agents or whatever would be would be able to explain to us exactly, you know, where it's going to be sited, its capacity, and and whether it deals with the pilchard. Uh, we would get a more detailed explanation if my architect came up and talked about it. Right. Would you prefer that? Yeah, I or think. I, I think we can we can do that. But from I mean, from those, um, can you? Yeah, um, do you do it in a minute when when you speak, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't speak. speak. No, no, he's not doing that. That's true. Um, yeah. Chairman, you could take a, a couple of minutes break to allow the applicant to talk to the agent, and then um, the agent, the applicant, then can give just the answer to the question. So, right. well, I could in that case tell you what I know, and there might not be other questions out of it. Let me give you what I know. It's just not as technical, obviously. So, um, what can I tell you about it? So the current, uh, where the new digesting system is going to be is uh, west of where it is. So for, uh, probably, I think, at that point, out of uh, Mr. Bloomfield's garden. Uh, there was a point that Ms. House Andrews, oh, there you are, uh, shown in uh, by the um, fisherman's cottages, uh, fisherman's, um, not cottages, that was a previous application. Garden. Garden. Right. Um, um, so it, it is west of where it is at the right. moment yeah i can see that um in terms of more people interesting the whole idea of the restaurant at the pilchard is so we can use it during the winter season so it's not necessarily more people because currently people are sitting there having their lunch okay. during the summer and you've seen no doubt how busy it was well, yeah, 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 yeah. Being to yeah. The island, probably. yeah um how busy it is so this is about um increasing the length of the season so that we can okay make more money to service the island the right. okay so effectively it, it the, the, the the sewage treatment works is 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 going to be in the fishermen's gardens, and it will um, uh, for the avoidance of doubt it will cope with it. It will be effectively be a new one for the for the pilchards. Is that exactly? It's not just the pilchard. It, it it's yes, designed it's, to take the new accommodation on the hotel, uh, which will be more people uh, right. in the hotel at least. Uh, and it, the increased numbers, yes, it's designed for the future. I, okay, it might be worth just point, just adding that currently, um, Miss Bloomfield does use that current um, digestion system. Don't put me wrong, wrong. Or, uh, where, uh, the, the, that is on the island, um, and um, yes, yeah, so I just any and it is in his garden, it, which was uh, built um, whilst he owned the cottage for the previous owners. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
coach along. Uh, let's just follow up some clarification on that. So, um, <clears throat> is the new treatment plant that you're talking about there to take all connections, for, you know, literally take everything, so the septic existing septic tank will be redundant? Correct. Okay. And is there sufficient redundancy in that treatment plant to be able to cope with um, all? I've seen I've seen the reports. I've seen the levels there, and obviously, as uh, Councillor Hodgson said, the sort of big issue about um, sewage spillage, you know, discharges into waters, particularly like the bathing area, is there sufficient redundancy in that system and that plant that you're putting in there to be able to cope with any eventuality where you, you know, rather than seeing a, you know, a consented discharge to the sea. And I must admit, I wouldn't be happy if the Environment Agency gave you consent to discharge raw sewage into the sea at that position. Um, is there sufficient redundancy to yes. uh, handle that? Yes. Thank you. Question to the planning officer. I don't see this treatment plant in there as part of the condition to sort of come back so that we know full, have full details so that we are assured um, that it is capable um, because I think for me, <clears throat> if this, if the sewage treatment plant isn't, you know, um, robust enough, it, it's a big stumbling block to this application, and I need some assurance on that. Um, I did think there was a condition asking for details um, of the sewage treatment work or foul foul water to be submitted uh, post decision, but if there isn't one, um, I would. Obviously, make sure that there is one. There's a te there is a temporary agreement at the moment in place, and we're looking for it. And I think that is in the, uh, and we're looking for our full agreement from EA, um, the appropriate parties um, in next year. Can I just clarify? Because we're talking about two different things. We're talking about you know um, an environment agency permission for discharge, of which you, you know the hotel has one. <clears throat> and what I'm looking for is a condition about the actual new plant that's going <coughs> to replace the septic tank so that, you know, we know that, it, you know, we've got something there that can handle everything that this new, all this development can generate. Yeah. I uh, just want to say that, um, well, understood, but we're, we're confident that our, our uh, solution is robust and we will provide more, as much detail as we needed. I'd also like to say the reason we're emptying it so often with uh, tankers is to make sure that we don't spill into the sea. I mean, it's, it works, the current solution. It's not man enough for the job it's doing, and it's old now, whatever, it's 40 years probably. So we're emptying, we don't want to have to empty, it's very expensive. Fresh option. I just ask folks where those tankers go. Uh, in the end, I've got a feeling they go up to Bully Farm. Where's Bully Farm? Bully Farm, yeah. Can I just clarify, condition 23 um, should deal with the um, submission of that information um, to ensure that we have those details um, prior, I think I've put it prior to commencement. Prior, yeah. yeah, prior to commencement. Okay, I, I'm used to sort of more wording around your conditions when they come in, so a waste audit plan, you know, to be submitted didn't sort of assure me that okay. it's a complete detail of the, you know, the scheme, its method, okay. its operation. Okay. Sorry, it doesn't say waste audit. That's condition 20. Waste audit has to be. No, that's, that's condition 22. Condition 23. What no, about? Not, not, not on the reporting package. That's under the reporting package. Not audit or. No. Looking at. Yeah. We've just. We're, I'm looking at the report that's on the. Committee agenda, and it's got twenty. It's got two. There's a twenty-two talking about um, what, a waste audit plan, and twenty-three prior to commencement of the development, a detailed proposal for dealing with the foul waste shall be submitted. Not what I'm looking at. Yeah, I'll make I'm on, I'm we're, we're on modern gov. Yeah, Chairman. it wouldn't be the first time. Yeah, I'm, I'm on, on modern, modern gov. gov. It it's on my side. Page, so it's Patrick page thir sorry, Chairman. Page thirty-five on my modern gov is is as um, Mr. Wyman said. Uh, well, well, oh, well, we're well. looking on page eight. But I'm on page 35. No, you're on page 35. Oh, you're on page 8. If you go to 35, you've got 24. Then there are 24. I'm looking at the report. 
Yes. Ap apologies if the if so is it the, is it the front the front list sort of the bullet list isn't the same as in the detailed list in which case that's my answer, a, a, that's apologies true. right there, but I'm I am confident that there is a specific um, in the in the list of conditions I'm, I'm confident there is a specific foul waste um, condition if you feel if you if you feel that needs to be bolstered or boosted in any way then obviously we can we can add to it, but I, I think that covers what we need. I'm looking at it now, and that's my apologies. I was looking at that, 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 yeah. That's fine. That's what, I, that's what I was expecting to see. Yeah. Right. The important thing is that we've sorted that and we've clarified that, and that you're happy with that. That's fine. Um, yeah, Coach Sergeant. I think what's worrying me, Chairman, is that the, um, the, the commissioned. Um, um, uh, waste of waters um, plan that's, that was commissioned by the developer. As it's, it's been put back on the website a few times, but it's always the same one. It's not like a reviewed, revised copy. It's, it's just the same old February 22 copy, even though the Environment Agency has been coming back with various reviews. There's nothing in, you know, this, the actual statement is still about, you know, a waste outfall out to sea. And, you know, I just think we have to be very careful what we approve of, because these things can come back to bite us if we haven't made sure that we dotted our eyes and crossed our T's on these matters. Can we, we can't, do you feel you need to speak to your, you're fine, okay, right, because you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. If you want to, if you want to consult, we'll stop, you can consult and then you can speak, okay? Right, where were we? Oh, Coach, you're up. Uh, yes, Chairman, I feel that we are getting into the debate of the meet of the application as opposed to the, the applicant has spoken to us and questions have been asked, but then we've got members discussing, debating uh, the problem which may or may not be there when we should be debating that when we get into open debate. And I also believe that the applicant's agent, if he could give us more information that perhaps the applicant doesn't have the finer details that he should be allowed to speak to in this particular occasion. Thank you. David. Chairman, I think there's a, there's a, there's, there is quite a bit of sense in what Councillor Rowe says. I think in terms of the um, agent, that the applicant had the choice. Mm -hmm. uh, applicant or agent to speak. It's one or the other. If there's a need, if the member's got more questions that can't that the applicant can't answer, then let's pile them up. Five minutes to the get the answers, and then the applicant can give us the right. answers. Do members wish that to happen? Chairman, also, I feel we've not had the objective, we've not had the ward members speak yet either, so I think... No, we we'll get there in a minute. We've got... I mean, we've we've only got, a minute. It's going to be in two no, hours' time. No, we've only got one chance to speak to the applicant. No, we've got to sort that out first. That's a process. Chairman, I think most of the questions have been answered, so I don't see any point in uh, delaying it for another five minutes because uh, I think the uh, applicant has answered the questions quite adequately and we know where we are. Chairman, I'm happy with the question. You know, yeah. the question I've put that, and the response I've had so from the officer and the. I think we've got to the stage where we. Any more questions on any other subject other than this? Yeah. For the applicant and sewage. Um, Just a very yeah. bit of a random question, but there is a reason to it. At the end, have you have you got an have you got a standby generator on the island? Because if you're reliant on an electric treatment plant and you get a power cut then it won't work. Yeah, that's a good consideration. We'll add that in. I think we've, we've stretched this one far enough. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, sir. Um, if you'd like to go back to your seat and we will now have Big Bay Parish Council, <laughs> Councillor Scott, You've got to sit down or stay still. Right, 
when you're ready and settled, switch on your mic and all right. Chair, Chair, members of the committee, um, <clears throat> I'm Valerie Scott, I'm a parish councillor and I'm here to represent a Big Blue Parish Council. Um, the Parish Council are pleased about the removal of the two-storey staff accommodation to the rear of Warren Cottage <clears throat> and we also have no objections to the proposed alterations and extensions to the hotel or to the extension of the Bayview Cafe although we would have preferred a lower roof on the Bayview Cafe, and this was put in our um, reasons to object to the application. Um, however, the Parish Council are totally against the proposed staff accommodation on the island, um, on, on the tennis courts on the island. This is on land which is outside the developed part of the island, and is allocated as local green space. The reason for the designation of land as local green space is in order to keep this part of the island permanently open. And inappropriate development, which includes the development of the type proposed, is by definition harmful to the local green space and should not be allowed except in very special circumstances. This is a test set out in the NPPF as well <coughs> as a policy of the neighbourhood plan which is pol policy BP15 and I am very surprised that this has not been mentioned uh, by uh, Jacqueline Hauslander in her presentation. The applicants have provided no justification for building on land designated as local green space. They do not even refer to the fact that the proposed staff accommodation is on land allocated as local green space in their application submission and no special circumstances have been put forward to justify this development. <clears throat> it is proposed to screen this development by a landscaped fund so hopefully it will not be readily visible from the mainland, but it is clearly going to be visible from the island, which is a popular place for people to visit. The light from the proposed development will also be visible from the mainland. It is inappropriate development that will impact on the openness and it should be refused. Warren Cottage on the mainland is currently used as staff accommodation but is now proposed to be used for residential purposes. If the hotel needs further staff accommodation, in addition to that, being, which will be used in the large Corneloff building, which they now own, they should retain the staff accommodation within Warren Cottage. This property could also be extended to the rear if further rooms were required. There is certainly no justification for building on local green space when there are now two large properties on the mainland which can now be used for staff accommodation. <clears throat> the Parish Council also objected to the proposed extension to the Pilchard Inn, which is a local heritage asset of extreme importance in a very prominent location on the island. The proposed large extension on its seaward side will be very dominant. The large boxy shape, its design and the materials used with large amounts of glazing and timber is completely at odds with the design of the Pilchard Inn and it will be extremely harmful to the appearance and character of this very important heritage asset. This is contrary to policy BP23 of the Neighbourhood Plan and this should also be refused. <clears throat> the changes to the Pilchard Inn are also harmful to the amenity of the neighbours at the cottage and um, they have also written in objecting to this proposal. And if the roof garden, which uh, from looking at the plans would certainly result in overlooking and potential noise impact, this would also be contrary to policy BP7 of the neighbourhood plan which seeks to protect residential properties. <clears throat> the Parish Council are also concerned about the sewage outfall 
and obviously we want to make sure that any proposals for that uh, are, you know, are, are dealt with entirely uh, very thoroughly because at the moment the outfall is shown to go into Herring Cove which is an area where people often swim so we'll be very concerned about that issue. Thank you for that. Members, have you any questions to councillor panel? Um, thank you, Chair. You, you talk about the uh, green space being permanently open, but presumably the tennis court being a tennis court, which is fenced, uh, is available to only to residents of the hotel, I imagine, is not permanently open to the public. Is that right? Yes, but it's, we're talking about the space. We're not talking about whether there's access to the public. And this, the area to the behind the hotel and all the area which is not within what we call the developed part of the island is shown as local green space. It is an allocation in the neighbourhood plan which has been adopted and it's the equivalent of Greenbelt in terms of policy. So it doesn't need to be public as such. It doesn't need to be public open space. It can be private open space as well. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Hodgson. Thank you. Um, can I just check the status of the Green Neighbourhood Plan? Is it made? Yes, it is made. Thank yes. you. So it's yes. actually, it's, it's voluntary. Yes. Thank yes. you. Any other questions? No. Right. Thank you very much. Right, Ward Member, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I, I went up to the island the other day with quite a few negative thoughts on this, and I left with um, more positives than negatives, to be honest. The only real negative I also had to check whether I got my nose, my fingers, and my toes when I came off because of the cold. Um, but they were all in place anyway. Um, but or the, the negatives really can be overcome with conditions. And obviously the sewerage and everything was one of my major concerns. I mean, I think that's mostly been alleviated this morning because I know with the new digestive systems and, and all this, it can be it can be overcome very, very easily. So, um, but last thing we want obviously is, is sewerage going into the, to the sea because that's swimming water, but what comes at the other end of these um, new systems are basically drinking water, but like everybody said, they're not going to try it. I would, but there had to be a lot of whiskey with it. Um, I'd like to congratulate really the officers who dealt with this over months and months, Jacqueline and obviously um, Graham. Uh, they've chatted through this with the architect that's dealt with all this, and I think what they've come up with is probably a sympathetic development which fits into not just the hotel, but the island. Um, and as we all know that, you see, we need these, I mean, this is an iconic building. I mean, it's a, it's a gem really in the South Amps. I mean, everybody knows it, it's there, it stands out, and we need to keep it running. And the only way you can do that, and as we all know in business, to uh, move forward is, is a positive move, to stand still is a negative move. And I think this needs to be, and of course, if you increase the rooms, you increase the staff, so you've got to have staff accommodation. And because it, it's unique um, position, it's not easy to get staff um, because we're in the back end of nowhere, basically, but the hotel is very popular. <coughs> and the other thing is, of course, that you've got to have a certain amount of staff on the island because it's dictated to by the tides. And people don't want to finish work at 11 or 12 at night and have to try to trundle back onto the mainland. Um, so that is where I come from on, on that one. Um, and it does make perfect financial sense to get this um, hotel extended because we need it to be there um, and not disappear. Um, I'll come back if I may later on in the debate, but that's where I come from at the moment. And I will listen before I make my decision to what everyone else says. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Um, we will now go to the debate. Councillor Brown. Thanks, Chairman. Um, 
site visit was uh, extremely useful as always if not bitterly freezing on that island but a nice warm hotel on it nonetheless <laughs> um i think this is clearly a, a a delicate matter to say the least as, as are most applications that come before um this committee but, and, and it's extremely important to both big people south hams given the unique nature of this site it's extremely unique um i think what's proposed on there is fairly sympathetic to what is there at the moment and as councillor taylor said almost a, a natural but sympathetic progression to the businesses already on the site I, I i have sympathy with what the parish council has said in terms of sort of green open space but I, I, in my mind the, the the relatively sensitive nature of what is being proposed and in addition to that the business case in at this point i i think does just about um outweigh it so it, it is sympathetic it's a nice natural progression of, of what is there and it's not overbearing i don't think in terms of what is being proposed i think that's been outlined in those panoramic um photos from from around the surrounding areas so um with that and having listened very thoroughly to the, the officer's presentation and and indeed the points made by the speakers thus far personally i'd be happy to propose approval in line with the officer recommendation Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I think um, we had the site inspection on Monday. Some of us froze pretty much to death, but we've uh, now suitably recovered. And um, I viewed it um, with interest because I quite frequently visit another island, which is a bit further away, and it's uh, very similar to some of the developments which are there. And I think one thing we have to bear in mind is that um, you can't run a hotel um, as you probably did 10 or 20 years ago. It has to be brought up to date. It needs to be modernized. It needs more rooms. It needs a staff accommodation because the staff need to find accommodation. And I think every business and particularly in the hotel and tourism business, it's difficult to get staff and then they need accommodation. We're finding that in some of our own towns in Dartmouth and Sulcum. So um, I do feel that uh, it does need to have staff accommodation. And if you leave uh, Burr Island at 12 o'clock at night and that's the end of your day shift, you're not gonna want to swim for it, are you? So they do need to be able to um, be accommodated. And I think it's, in principle, a friendly um, application of what's going to be done there. I look forward to seeing it if it indeed it is approved. And um, I think we pretty much sorted out what was the main problem was to do with the sewerage and the sewerage disposal. So I'm happy to second Councillor Brown's uh, recommendation of approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Councillor Rowe. Um, before we go any further, I've been asked to have a two-minute adjournment by our legal legal David. Uh, yes, Chairman, the officer would just like to um, discuss amongst ourselves the, and give you some advice about the exceptional circumstances and the point that's been raised by um, Councillor Scott in respect of BP15. Right, that makes sense. Okay. Two-minute adjournment. Well, as long as it takes, but it well, shouldn't take too long. Right. We will. We are still recording, so be aware of that.
Members, members of the public, um, thank you for that. We're just making sure we, it's important to all of us that we get things right and correct. Can we have Jack, Jack and him to um, speak, please? So, so um, Councillor Scott um, mentioned um, uh, about the um, policy in the uh, Neighbourhood Plan VP15 um, being uh, equivalent, if you look at the MPPF, to Greenbelt. Um, and I realised in my report, whilst I gave a justification for um, the st staff accommodation, I didn't mention the word exceptional circumstances, which is what is required from the policy. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to clarify for members now, so that members are very clear why I consider that there is an exceptional circumstance to allow this development in the green space uh, in this case. Um, the main reason uh, is the is the business case for this proposal clearly there is a desperate need for staff to be accommodated um, to support the hotel that's demonstrated by both the corner loft application and the fact that there are, are staff accommodation proposals on the site as a result uh, there's also there is a need for that staff accommodation to be on the island um, and as I've mentioned in my report, my view in terms of the staff accommodation that has been provided is that it provides the least, the least destructive impact on the landscape. So effectively, um, that uh, in essence is the exceptional circumstance that I believe um, justifies the recommendation that I've made. Thank you. Thank you for that. So just to clarify that. It's you, nothing has changed. You still your recommendation is still for conditional approval. Yeah. Yes. Right. Um, we've had a proposal and a seconder, but I want to. Any other members who wish to add to the debate before we do, Councillor Panel. Um, thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Burr Island is obviously a very special place, and I think the hotel is a very special place as well. I have stay there um, overnight. I've been there for lunch. Um, I have knowledge of it and the staff needs two members of my family many years ago, well over 20 years ago, two members of my family worked and lived on the island. So I'm well aware of the difficulties the hotel has in keeping, in recruiting and keeping staff, particularly with the hours uh, that the staff need to work and the difficulties of getting access to the island. So I have sympathy with that and the business case. I've also owned a 1922 building for more than 32 years and I know how difficult that can be and I think there really does need to be uh, a good income stream if we are to protect this unique asset in the South Hands. It's worldwide, it's known worldwide this hotel and I think this is one, uh, this is one way in which we can ensure that it goes forward and I think we have to be aware of that. I'd like to um, compliment Ms. House Lender for the suggestion in the first place about how to deal with the staff accommodation. I think it's a very elegant solution to put it in this way under the tennis court that is there at the moment. Um, and I'd like to compliment her and the team who've worked on it and the applicants for coming together and developing that suggestion. Therefore, I'd like to support approval. I would ask the proposer and secondary if they would accept uh, a, an, an additional condition that we put an opaque screen on the open part of the terrace of the um, Pilchard to screen that end from the neighbouring cottage. Yes. Yes. Sir. I'm happy to yes, accept yeah. that yes. suggestion. Um, I think Chair. perhaps we can, um, that's the other debate and then of course, there will have to be a list of conditions going through if the debate goes uh, for approval. Um, Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I go back to what I said when we both started this this morning, which I think it's difficult because there's so many elements to it. And ultimately, if we're not careful, we focus on one and sort of slightly forget other elements that have been equally contentious, certainly through the um, applications that's done progress. And I... 
I thank the uh, Bigsbury Parish Council for such, such a comprehensive um, you know, review from their point of view, I mean, as people who live and work locally in the area and understand it much better than I could ever do. Um, but I, I, and I also recognise the weight of a heritage asset on us. This is a really important heritage asset. Everybody knows about Burr Island and the hotel and all the history of it, and it's really valued. And there's, I think that's something that is really important for us to maintain that sense of what that is. And a lot of, time, a lot of the time, that sense is also about the balance between the natural environment that it sits in, which is obviously so much of the part of it, as much as, and the experience that people have when they go there, as much as it is trying to find ways to make it currently economically viable, which is also a really important element too. Um, I am quite torn because I am, I am deeply concerned about the impact of sewage. I mean, we, we can't ignore that. You know, I think there's a huge responsibility on us as, and this committee to make sure that that kind of detrimental impact, which could, you know, it would actually ultimately de be detrimental to the, you know, the, the uh, economic viability of the hotel if they've got a reputation for don't swim in the water. But it's, it's also about being responsible, and there are many mechanisms for that, and I'm, I would like to feel that we could be quite stringent in the conditioning around those sewage um, treatments, as well as where the outfalls are and contingency has been pointed out because they are dependent as, as a, on an off-grid system, which actually some, in some ways might be actually more resilient than being on-grid at the moment. Um, but I, I think that um, at the end of the day, I think I, I, I will support this because I think it's so important to maintain these um, um, systems and allow them to modernise. I mean, I'm looking at a picture at the moment of um, before any of this was on there, it was just the pilchard and looking at the pilchard itself. And again, I, I, I think about the impact on that neighbouring property. You know, they've been there a long time too. They've got rights. And I think we're kind of, as I say, again, I think if it had been done separately, we could have perhaps looked at a more focused way on the pilchard because that in its own right is such an important heritage element here. Predates all of the hotel, um, you know, and has that history of, uh, you know, the smugglers past and all the rest of the um, that history, that marine maritime history too. So I am quite torn, but I think, you know, when I've listened to what has been proposed about some screening to make it more ple pleasant for, hopefully will improve things for the um, residents of that house. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for that. Um, I would like any other members to speak and then give the ward member sort of the last say if we need to. Are there any other members who wish to speak? Uh, um, Long. Thank you, Chairman. I, I think most of what I would have said has been said by others, but I will reflect the fact that this area of the South Hams has lost too many of its hotels over time for all the reasons that are being, you know, the, the measures that are being put in. I think we can, as um, Councillor Taylor said, most of the sort of concerns can be addressed by um, condition, and we've had a good discussion today and aired those concerns and got. Um, some responses back. I think it is important to reflect the sort of natural environment, and I think the protection measures for the beaches and that are important. I think the landscaping is equally important, and I'm pleased to see that there are measures in there to actually provide some um, succession planning for Monterey Cypress and Monterey Pine on the island, um, because they're fairly iconic. Um, so I, I, I support like everybody else, there are sort of minor concerns that we can address with uh, conditions, but overall, we need to protect the viability of the operations there and ensure that we've got an operation that continues for years to come and supports, you know, gives local employment as well. And I think the accommodation is, as uh, Councillor Rowe has said, accommodation in the hospitality industry is essential and they're providing it. And they're what I think is a very sympathetic uh, manner. So this application, despite some minor niggles and concerns, um, has my support. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Long. Um, Councillor Taylor. I, I think it, uh, Councillor Long it actually been reading my script, um, but, but I'll excuse him for that. Um, but yes, I, I'm, I'm in full support of this um, because we've got to keep this hotel going. It's iconic. It's something that everybody's lived with and, and you can see it from a long way, which is brilliant. But I would like to add um, one condition, if approved, um, on the car park behind the cafe um, to protect it from development in the future, if that's possible. Um, other than that, I'm in fully support. You can't do that? Uh, you can't, can't put a condition on which um, 
prevent something happening in the future or uh, in in that in that <coughs> trying to find my words um it you can't you can't condition something which may or may not happen um you you can condition that it should be retained in use as a car park on the basis that the car, the, the parking in that area is um uh, is, is is for the hotel's use uh, for guests to park um, because there's there's very little if any parking on the island so you could you can condition it to ensure that it is retained in use as a car park in association with the hotel you can't you can't prevent you can't put a condition on preventing further development so but if it's if the condition is on it will mean that if any other development were to want you know were to take place or, or, or any application were to come in on that but that it would have to be a formal application as opposed to um, just carried out. You know. So it, it would it would prevent a, a parking retention condition would prevent that from happening without it coming back to us for consideration. So so that can be added to the <coughs> approval if approved. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. As long as you say you have a question. Yeah, I don't know whether it's appropriate to sort of discuss here about sort of some clarity around the conditions or after a vote has been taken. I'd like to raise the point of uh, the landscaping. And uh, you've got obviously a landscape ecology management plan. Whether that landscape and ecology um, management plan would have the normal conditions in there that we normally put a five year condition for replant and maintenance and normally you see that as a condition I'd like to see that um, on the conditions simply because of the strategic importance of the landscaping and the you know integrity of that of the application the other thing is there's mention of succession planting of um, Monterey pine and Monterey cypress and that I'm assuming will be in the landscape and ecology management plan but I'd like to see those trees because again they are given indication has been strategically vital for the future, that those trees, when planted, are TPO'd by condition? Just to confirm, they already are TPO'd? No. Oh, the new, the new, The new plants, TPO'd. because they are, they are being sort of indicated as being strategically important for the future um, as part of the landscaping in the area. I don't think it's possible to TPO a tree via a planning permission it would have to be it would have to take part take place outside of the planning application process um, and equally I imagine when they're first planted they they won't be very significant in themselves uh, to therefore <coughs> represent a strategic tree um, Mr Weimer I think you really yeah for, 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 for no, I'm, I'm certainly Jack wasn't in the meeting and I'm, I'm aware that we've had advice from the tree officer previously that you can TPO trees in those circumstances um, because and I before we had that advice Councillor Long would be fully aware that I was giving exactly the same advice as you were um, but I do believe it has to be a, a TPO I don't believe you can you can effectively TPO via condition it will require they will require a TPO, but you require that TPOs will within the conditions will be placed. The wording is out there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's been a question raised about whether this um, application should be um, advertised as a, a departure if you're minded to approve it. Um, and therefore, but at the moment, it's not entirely clear. And we'd like um, to consider that matter um, separately. So I'm wondering if the proposer and seconder might uh, agree to uh, an <coughs> amendment to um, the proposal. Um, so that uh, effectively the, the proposal is that the application approval be approved as recommended and subject to a completion of a unilateral undertaking to secure the payment of the EMS <coughs> contribution and subject further to the head of planning um, considering um, in conjunction with the head of legal services whether the application should be advertised as a departure pursuant to the um, 
Town and Country Planning, Consultation England, uh, Direction 2021, and if so concluding, being <coughs> advertised accordingly. Chair, I, I'm happy to accept that as proposed. <coughs> Vice Chair? Uh, yes, Chairman, but um, so what are you actually telling us, please? <laughs> In common... In common, in common language. language, there are certain applications that, in accordance with the um, 2021 direction, um, have to be referred to the Secretary of State to allow the Secretary of State to determine whether or not he wants to call that application in for his own determination. And there are, um, in that direction, there is um, certain references to green de green belt development and um, certain floor spaces uh, of particular types of development. Now. We, on the face of it, it might appear that the floor space requirement is met, but it's a question of whether or not the green belt reference in the direction applies to locally designated open space. And that is what we need to get our heads around. And this is not the forum for doing that. So hence the suggestion that if you are minded to approve it, it's, it's Sub delegated Sub to, Sub it's subject to that, that proviso. Does that make matters clearer for members? Now, if I could come back, Chairman. So what you're telling us is that if we approve this application here today, it will, could then be called in by the Secretary of State and um, they will then look into the green space element before they come back to us, no? No. No, no, the, what, Sorry. no, no the, 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 the direction, the, the, the 21 direction that Mr Fairburn has referred to specifically refers to, to green belt. There are other um, element, there are other paragraphs in the National Planning Policy Framework that Councillor Scott referred to that, that talks around that locally designated green spaces in terms of dealing with applications should be given the same weight as Greenbelt. What, I'm, what we're not sure is whether that um, guidance in the MPPF, we're not sure whether that then translates to the 21 direction so what we need to establish is whether or not we do have to advertise it as a departure. If we do, then the Secretary of State has the opportunity to call the application in if they want to. But the decision on whether it's a departure or not rests with this authority in the in the, the first instance. Um, and, and it's I can't answer the question. We can't answer the question. We need to do a little bit more digging in terms of. Um, whether there's any authority one way or the other. Okay, right, thank you. I've still got other, other sort of things in my mind about it, but I'll accept what you say and move on. Thank you. Okay, right. We, we've got a, a proposal for approval, a second for approval. We need to deal with conditions now. Good on them, well. Well, that, have we got all we want? Well, we, uh, the only condition we've added, I think, is yeah. the um, is this opaque screen because I think the. If there's no other conditions, that's fine. I'm just asking you. Quite, we I, look, we, we've been here a long time, and I don't want to miss anything now. There's there's an additional condition in in respect of <coughs> screening. Yeah. I don't think I'd want to be um, as precise to, to say what it is at the moment. But I think we need to make sure that there's details of screening to be to be provided, then there are also the additional wording from Councillor Long in respect of the um, landscape and ecology management um, plan. And at the very beginning, um, Mrs Housander said there was a there were a couple of just minor tweaks to conditions that don't actually change what the condition is seeking. It just means it's that they are um, more legally tight in the scheme of delegation um, Myself, I I do have the ability just to, to change conditions to make sure they there's no typos in them to make sure they, they read they read right as long as it doesn't change the substantive nature of the of the condition. Sorry, can I just add, uh, Councillor um, Taylor also asked for the car park to be yes. a condition reflecting yeah, car park yes, retention. Yeah, retention. Um, Coach Arjun, you got your hand in the air. Yeah, just. Um, Condition number 23, which was referred to earlier, which is the one about um, foul, foul um, sewage, uh, foul water treatment. 
Um, is there any way we can tighten that up to make sure that there's no allowance for outfall to, into the sea? Because that is kind of part of the, the, the um, delegated approval in a sense, because there's going to be further plans submitted. That will need approval by the environmental agency, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. Not down to us, actually, be specific, is that? Would that be correct? How can that be tightened up? <coughs> With with um, foul drainage, obviously we have to refer to our um, experts in relation to foul drainage and, and what they consider to be acceptable or not. Um, so it's not something that, as a planning authority, we fully um, have, you know have the expert knowledge on. So we would be it would be what would what would happen when the condition was being discharged is the information would be submitted and we would have to set to send that to our consultee and if they were content that outfalls to the sea was acceptable then we would have to uh, go along with that okay and i'm not going to repeat all the subject twos and one thing and another but we've got them we know what we're doing so can i all have a show of hands for those for approval of this application <clears throat> that unanimous that application is approved subject to the word is um, and it, the and that was unanimous I would just want to add very quickly before we go to the next one um, thank all the members thank all the officers who put work into this um, I think we found on Monday what it's like living on the coast. I already knew what it was like living on the coast. Um, but um, thank you for having doing that on Monday because that was over and above the call of duty, I think, in that weather. And uh, But um, we've got there. So thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> we have got next one more application this morning. Officer changeover now all the way down. We've we've got an officer changeover. I welcome welcome Councillor Brazil if he's listening.
Members, members of the public, we move on to the second application this morning. Got an echo? Yeah, sorry, that's all right. Um, no, no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Try again. That's all right. Right? Okay. Ah, no echo. Right. Um, second application. This oh, it's not morning anymore, is it? But never mind. Um, it's application one three eight six twenty two full Dunnings, Dunnings Wallingford Road, Kingsbridge. Um, Charlotte, would you like to present your case, please? Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, members. Uh, this application is a site to the north of Kingsbridge in Wallingford Road. Uh, it's an application for six dwellings. Uh, so currently, currently we have an existing house on the site uh, and the proposal is to retain this house and build six other houses within the red line. Just before I get into the presentation, I've just got a couple of updates for members. Uh, we've had two late objections received, which weren't referenced in the report uh, because they were received afterwards. Uh, the two issues raised really are uh, the fact that there's some additional information gone on the website um, and with the suggestion that the application should be re-advertised. Uh, this information clarified the matters rather than any changes to the scheme, um, so we didn't consider that it was necessary to re-advertise because the, the essence of what we're looking at is the same. Uh, there was also some drainage concerns and flood risk um, with uh, quite a lot of detail about that, but I will discuss that later in the report. Uh, we've also had some additional conditions requested from the ecologist, um, which aren't listed in the report. Um, so I've just put them there. Condition 21, the wording would be changed for an updated scheme uh, regarding reptile translocation to be provided rather than adhering to the um, scheme that's currently submitted. Uh, and then four extra conditions, um, just really sort of specifying um, sort of specific ecological matters that need to be um, addressed. Uh, there's also an update with regard to drainage conditions. So uh, in place of condition six, which is recommended in the report, um, it's proposed to add an extra condition uh, so that there is a separate condition for a construction phase surface water drainage plan so that we can be sure that the surface water is managed during the construction phase as well as the, the development itself. <coughs> uh, so onto the um, application, this is the site layout. So the white square in the middle is the existing house, just for reference, you've got Wallingford Road running along the bottom of the screen, and then there would be six uh, new dwellings. So units one to four would be uh, in a sort of cul-de-sac, so there's a would be a new access going off. Uh, they're three-storey units uh, with three bedrooms, and then on the other side we've got units five and six, which are two-storey and are four-bed dwellings. It's just an image there of the proposed street scene. Um, so again, you've got the the existing house in the middle, or just about in the middle between units four and five. Uh, just because those plans are quite small, um, this is just a bit of a closer view. So you've got units one to four one side with their layout and their elevations. So that would be the street scene. And then you've got units five to six the other side. And that's the elevations for those two. Um, so just it's quite a hard site to photograph, to be honest with you. So um, so I've tried to put a little uh, location plan with a red dot just to show you what we're looking at. So this is the uh, existing farmhouse looking sort of down Wallingford Road. So that would be staying. Uh, and then you can see the back of that house in this photo. And you can see the rest of the site at the moment is just sort of scrubland, really. Um, there are a few uh, sort of outbuildings to kind of sheds, you know, sort of little, little outbuildings, which would be removed as part of the scheme. Uh, this is just looking back the other way up the site. 
And then this is looking behind the site. So you've got behind the red line, you've got an area of um, sort of vineyard that's been planted recently. And then those houses that you can see behind are the new development at Applegate Park. So the planning history is quite relevant uh, on this site, just to make members aware. It is detailed a lot more in the report, but there is an outline application approved for 14 dwellings on the site, uh, which was approved in 2019. In 2020, an application for six dwellings, so the same as this proposal, was appealed for non-determination. Uh, the council put forward three reasons for refusal. Only one of them was uh, accepted by the inspector. So the appeal was solely dismissed on uh, reason one, which was that there was an inadequate surface water drainage strategy provided. So essentially, this is the same scheme as was considered at that appeal, um, and the appeal was only dismissed on drainage matters. So that is something for members to bear in mind. So turning to drainage, as that was the big issue last time, uh, uh, more comprehensive details have been submitted this time with this application. They've been agreed with the council's drainage engineer and Southwest Water. Uh, we have Ross here from Drainage. If you've got any specific questions about that, um, he'll be happy to answer them later on. Um, so there are conditions recommended um, as per the report in my update just now. So to make sure that surface water is managed through the course of the development, but also through the construction phase, because uh, there are concerns raised by residents, um, understandably so. There are sort of flood issues in Kingsbridge. Um, but I think one thing I would stress to members is that a lot of the concerns raised are about a, a track which has been put in down by where this arrow is. It's outside of the red line for this application site. So although it's something we're aware of, we acknowledge it's not something that we can really deal with in this application. Um, it's something that can be managed separately. There are ongoing enforcement investigations on this site in this bit. So I just want to kind of make that distinction clear to members. But as I say, Ross is here if you have any specific drainage questions. So just as a summary, really, so the principle of development on the site for residential has already been established uh, through the outline. Uh, there is sufficient parking provided for each dwelling as well as visitor spaces. Conditions are recommended to ensure that provision is retained. Uh, in terms of highways, we've also uh, requested a construction management plan because the access to the site is quite narrow. Uh, designs considered acceptable, uh, conditions are recommended, usual conditions about materials, things like that. There are no concerns about neighbour amenity, there are conditions again recommended to make sure that flat roofs aren't used as amenity areas or balconies, things like that. Uh, landscape, so landscape officer is happy with the general landscape strategy that's been submitted, uh, but she has asked for details to be conditioned, uh, which has been recommended. There is a section 106 currently being prepared for contributions for open space. Uh, education didn't request any contributions, so that's not needed. Uh, and just in terms of low carbon development, the proposal includes solar panels, air source heat pumps. There are EV charging proposed. Uh, and as you can see from the report, it's recommended that they're installed prior to occupation of the house or the houses to make sure that they are submitted, uh, that they are put in. Uh, so just as a summary, as I say, the previous appeal was solely refused on drainage. These issues have been resolved uh, and we're therefore recommending conditional approval. Uh, and just to just to make it clear, because as I say, some conditions were added in, this is the full final list of conditions. The ones with asterisks uh, next to them are the ones that aren't listed in the report. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Members, questions? <coughs> Coach Brazil. Yeah, thank you. And sorry I was late. Um, yeah, I, I note in your report, Charlotte, that you talk about uh, ONS data in respect of houses in Kingsbridge. What sort of data is that from? Um, I don't know, um, but I will just sort of say that's the kind of how we consistently assess these things. So in terms of Dev 10, I don't know the date the data's from, but it is the one that we sort of always use. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I asked because obviously in the report from the town council, they note that 100 new three and four houses are being built in Kingsbridge. Um, and what you're saying is that that hasn't come into our reckoning when from the ONS. I don't know if it has or not. 
All I can say is we're, we're reliant, we would be reliant on the information that the joint local plan team give us, and I'm assuming they're working on the most recent figures they've got, which I accept doesn't specifically no. okay, well that, No, that, that's fine, because obviously we've just had a neighbourhood plan that's gone through inspection and that's been accepted, so that's probably more up to date than the ONS figures, let's say. Just, just put it out there. Coach Martin. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Um, uh, this question it doesn't immediately impact on this development, but I'm interested um, that the fields behind, which you showed, with which are in, I think are planted out of vineyards, etc. Um, are though have those been allocated as part of the local plan or for develop because they would appear to, uh, you know, th th there is a large development up above them. Just. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a large development further up the hill, and then you've got the, these fields which would appear to be, you know, sort of an infill. Just interested, that's all, as to whether they are allocated or not. No, they're not. Right. No. Okay. I mean, I say if you could see from the location plan, so all of that site, all of that sort of up behind is all within the app, the applicant's ownership, um, and he's recently planted those vines. So, but yeah, in terms of allocation, right. Don't know. right, go to Thomas. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Charlotte, the outline for 14, that's X town. Yeah, and the reserve matters is currently in at the moment and is being assessed. So it would be reasonable to assume that, that there would be a very different shape and style of unit if you put 14 on the same land that the currently application is for six. Uh, yes, uh, there'll be. I think. I think they. I'm not the case officer for the, uh, the reserve matters, but I think they follow the same general line. So the sort of the the the, the area where houses <coughs> would be is the same, but obviously because there's more, I think the size and the sort of the land around them is it would be different. But that I'd say that's that's currently in and being considered at the moment. So if this if this was if this was to be granted, then that would that would die then. Not not necessarily. Um, the, the, this is this is this is a this would be a standalone full application. The, the it, to the outline wouldn't this wouldn't it would it wouldn't die, and the other the reserve matters wouldn't die. I suspect um, that if this was approved, I, I, I suspect the application may well be withdrawn. But at the moment, we have got two live applications in. But I, I, I just need to express very much what Charlotte said earlier, that this has gone to an appeal previously, and the only reason the appeal was dismissed was on surface water drainage. No, I do understand that. I just wanted to, to clarify, yeah. Any other questions? No? Right, okay. So we move on to the speakers. Um, the first one is... Um, Objector, Mr. Leslie Pengelly, got some slides, I believe, as well. Yep. Yeah. You've got three minutes on this one. Get you settle down and switch on the mic when you're ready. Just myself first. Well, I'm Leslie Pengelly. I'm a resident of Kingsbridge, but this, I would just want to state that this development doesn't affect me whatsoever. I'm here purely on the grounds of Kingsbridge Town. But again, it doesn't affect me whatsoever. All right. So I've just got to argue a bit with the, 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 the I will go through this. As rightly said, there is a, another planning application out. You may be surprised to see that this is worse than Locks Hill. I don't know whether you know Locks Hill. But this, this act, the position of this lawfully implemented development is worse than Oxford. They're currently in breach of conditions 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, and 16. So I just want to highlight that. I'm going to refer to the case officer report about drainage. She's, there's only five paragraphs within it. She states about them, them 35, that is correct. But one of those requirements is to ensure that it does not increase flood risks or impact the water quality elsewhere. Now, I'll argue the case that actually the accesses are within the boundaries of this site and it's been moved outside prior to this application. Currently, there is no planning permission for this site. She also states that 
Given that South West Walk consider the proposal drainage strategy is acceptable and the adherence to this strategy can be conditioned of any approval, officers consider that the reason for refusal cited by the Planning Inspector in the previous decision has not been addressed. I'm not sure why we're using South West Water because they're not actually a risk management agency for surface water. They, they run systems, but they're not, they're not listed. And I did specifically sent, set out the um, flood report for Kingsbridge and it lists the, the, the responsible bodies and they're the Environment Agency, Dem County Council and the need for, for the foray, the local district councils and Dem County Councils for highways. South West Water in that. If we can go, I've got slides up. Right, so I'm quickly going on to this. This is the situation in May 2020. The red arrows are like the, the existing field accesses. They are within this development site. So it is affecting this. The work they've done, it's been carried out without planning permission. The yellow line shows you the drainage where it would go if there was an exceedance. But the nature of the field has got very few openings, none in the south boundary, basically. So the blue arrows just show you the gateways in it. If we can go to the next slide, please. This is what's happened in two years. Obviously, Applegate's approved. They've had, and I've, I've just coloured in, the, I've just pl placed in the two tanks in that site. It's not relevant to this because it's a separate site, but they have punched holes in two places. But the real relevance is, in that site boundary, they've stripped away one complete hedge that divided the two fields up, and that was protected in the previous approval with their, with their actual tea protection plans they put in, and it's in the reserve matters. Currently, the latest ecology seems to reckon that part of that hedge is still there, but it clearly isn't. But it's opened up the old field. They've blocked off the two access, accesses, and they've put this one that's outside of the site. I agree with that. I can see you've tightened it up. Originally, when they did the 14 houses, it was all blocked off and there was no access. But that, if we can go to the next slide, please. Have we? Oh. <laughs> if I can go, just go to the, um, flick, just quickly flip through the thingy bobs. And just back one, just, I just want a quick statement. That's the new entrance, and I've made an error in that. I sent out that it was 2022, but it's actually 2020. Since that time, there's been two floods in Kingsbridge. If we can just flick through. The bottom one there is, is, Septem is September the 8th in 2021. That's after that's been done. That was caused by 16 millimetres of rain in half an hour. Flick through the next one, please. Well, that's just, just that's what I'm just doing. And then that one shows the flood on June the 8th, and you can see it bursting out the drain. I'll, and I'll stop there. Sorry. Yeah, I know. It, it, all right, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I also spotted that in one of the ecology reports, it refers to the hedgerows being taken out. So is your... You're, what you're saying here is that there's been it's, it's things going on that haven't been addressed. Is that what you're saying? The vertical one, the one that divides yeah. the two fields, was supposed to remain. The little slotted one that had the two openings weren't. And in the outline permission, that's one of the areas where they've actually. I mean, that, they didn't. I, I'm, I'm not being told that they applied for hedge removal under the 1997 Edge Act, Act. Okay. So I'm assuming that didn't happen. And they've basically done it without planning permission. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can I ask another question? Well, well, Can right. I just ask another uh, question? Do you want to do you want another one? I've got another question, is that all right? Go on, Chief. Yeah. Um, so the other thing, just in terms of what you were trying to, to show us through the slides, were you trying to suggest that the drainage is going off the site in the opposite direction? Yeah. I'll just we're, ask you to keep it short. But just we're ignoring reason. we're ignoring the change they've done. Um, the can I? Can, okay, we right, need okay. to be talking about the application in front of us. Well, I'm right? just wondering about the drainage because that's what I was picking up on. Because well, I mean, hedgerow does affect drainage, as that, does um, if the if the lie of the land is taking it in the opposite direction. I'm just looking at pictures. Yeah, but that, I'm not very familiar not with. What, I'm just trying to clarify. Unfortunately, that. it's not what we're talking about. But as, as you were told earlier, that track and all the rest of it has been looked at separately as we speak okay um i'm going to call in ross johnson our drainage expert to clarify about the drainage on the 
on the development. All right. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those who know me, I'm Ross Johnson, the drainage engineer. Um, yeah, so with regard to this actual application site, as in within the red line boundary, um, the, the drainage that's been allocated for that now is actually correct and will, in this perfect manage, <laughs> and will manage the surface water for the site. Um, so the CDA requirement, because it's, um, it's yeah, cause the, the the only real issue with the CDA requirement, because it's going off site, would be the one in ten year discharge rate, which that we've picked that up in the condition. So that'll be the the final detail will come through on that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, any any flooding issues that are around the site, as I say, are being picked up by by the other application. Um, but but the surface water from this site is being adequately managed. Um, and just picking up on your comment about Southwest Water, so no, Southwest Water aren't technically a statutory consultee, um, but they, we needed they've been they've been consulted because it's going into their system. So they are the owner of the of the new sewer. So that's why there's reference to Southwest Water in there because as part of us ensuring that there is a Solution, we've had to get confirmation from Southwest Water. My name is Oh, no, you're not. Um, it's quite important to be. No, it's not. I'm sorry. You, you have to talk to the um, You very much explain it very thankfully. Sorry, are there any other questions you want to ask the gentleman on site? Sorry, no, it's quite fine. Ross, your first day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you make it. Yeah. <coughs> we have next got the supporter. Have we not? Um. Caroline Waller, thank you. And as I said before, you've got three minutes. Thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. Now, you'll be pleased to hear I could be relatively brief because of the fact that everyone's been quite comprehensive what they've said so far. So I act for the applicant, and you will have all heard that the air, this is site is in an area where the principle of development is acceptable both under the local plan and under the emerging neighbourhood plan. The proposed development complies with both um, the statutory development plan and is acceptable in all other respects. The application has been scrutinised by all the statutory consultees and it's been found to be acceptable. There are no outstanding technical objections to the proposals. In addition, you've heard that an inspector looked at a near identical scheme for six dwellings on the site and only had one objection relating to drainage. Matters of drainage have now been completely resolved, as you've heard, and that's the advice from your specialist expert um, officers on the point. Not only that, it's also going to be secured by condition, and the condition is quite a detailed and complex condition. So you can be happy that your officers have done a good job in that respect. So as a result, what you're looking at is a single issue application. If you accept the professional advice from your officers, then planning permission must be granted. If you're not minded to accept that advice, then the council will be expected to be able to produce evidence to explain why that advice is not accepted. And so you have to ask yourselves, have you seen any of that advice presented? Or evidence, particularly? Because failure to produce evidence to substantiate each reason for refusal puts the council at risk of a cost award appeal. Finally, you've been told about the 14 dwelling outline application with the um, application that's currently proceeding for reserve matters approval pursuant to it. So the principle of development for 14 units on the site has already been established and that's extant. I've been told by my clients that if this application is approved today, he will withdraw the 14 dwelling reserve matters application. So it's a matter of fact that there's no available option that would result in no development occurring on this site. These proposals comply with the statutory development plan. 
There's no outstanding technical objections. We are not asking anyone to overlook any deficiencies. There are no deficiencies. So pursuant to the MPPF, planning permission should be granted without delay. And so I'd hope that everyone can take the opportunity to determine this application today, to draw a line under all of the previous dealings on this site and bring it matters to a positive conclusion. But I'm happy to take any questions. Commissioner Brazil. Uh, yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure we'd like to narrow it down to just pure drainage. Um, but um, just within the inspector's report, he's silent on Dev 8. Uh, which is about housing mix. Um, so I don't think we can draw any conclusions from the uh, uh, inspector's report on that. It doesn't mention it. Um, just within respect of that, um, it says in your design and access statement that the housing is aimed at the family house market, which is in great shortage in the Kingsbridge area. Can can you point me to some reference where that is the, that the great shortage? Um, you've arrived at that statement, please. Um, off the top of my head, no, I can't. Um, I didn't draft the um, design access statement, um, I don't believe. But your officers are content that it's suitable for the area. The inspector was content that it's suitable for the area. And the only issue which has been in dispute is the drainage. And so that I'm afraid that I can't add to that. Okay. Any other further questions? No? Right, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll move it on to Kingsbridge Town Council. Um, Have you... He's happy to speak. He's happy to speak. He's There's always a doubt whether... He's online. He's online. Yes. Um, Councillor Cole, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you see me yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, we've got you, and we can hear you. So, okay. you'd, like, would you like to do your three minutes, please? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Philip Cole. I'm the chairman of the Kingsbridge Town Council. Um, Kingsbridge Town Council is aware that the planning inspector has refused the appeal on drainage and flood risk only. However, the recent referendum on the Kingsbridge neighbourhood plan has taken place and was supported by 89.29% of voters, that's 89% of people, an overwhelming majority by any measure. The plan still has to be made, but will shortly be an official legal document and one on which the local community should be able to rely. The plan states in policy H2 that market housing should respond to local housing needs in terms of style, type, special needs and tenure. Therefore, given this strategy, it's suggested that the housing mix proposals are inappropriate for Kingsbridge and will not meet the needs of local people. However, in our feedback on the revised scheme, we have enhanced the, uh, our concerns over drainage. The proposal is for surface water sewers to connect with a new sewer from the Applegate housing development. Seemingly, Southwest Water has supported this proposal. However, this agreement cannot be accessed and is therefore not publicly available via South Ham's planning portal. We are greatly concerned at Southwest Water support, and only recently at a meeting with Southwest Water, they were greatly criticised at seeming to uh, support any new application, simply, it appears, because it makes more money for their company. There are already current unresolved surface water drainage issues at the nearby Applegate ma major housing development, which is seeking to discharge via the Wallingford Road locale. That's the bit at the bottom of this site. Indeed, Devon County Council has commenced a formal investigation under Section 19 of the Flood and Water Management Act following a major flood event in Kingsbridge on the 4th of June this year. Therefore, the drainage methodology in for all new housing developments in town are crucial, and drainage matters should be considered at the decision stage with input from the applicant, South Hams, Devon County Council, the Environments Agency, and South West Water, and not just with a single agency. The, Dev, the JLP Dev 35 reports that development should not increase flood risk or impact water elsewhere. Neither the case officer, drainage specialist, nor South West Water refer to the DCC report on the Kingsbridge flood incident on 4th of June 2022, which makes me wonder if they even know it exists. 
In Kingsbridge, the disparate responsibilities for flooding are inextricably linked. What happens upstream impacts downstream. In Duncan Street, Bridge Street, Mill Street, Ilbert Road and Church Street, either water courses, tidal, rainfall, surface water runoff and drainage sewers are mixed together in an incredibly complex system. Kingsbridge uh, uh, integrated urban drainage model has been uh, is a, a report undertaken by Pell Frischman, uh, which was started in 2017. This remains at a draft stage after five years and does not even include the inclusion of Applegate nor the K5 site, so is hopelessly out of date. The upshot is that Kingsbridge Town Council wished to ref suggest refusal as agreed by all members or at the very least deferral until Southam contacts and receives the DCC flood management team and environment agency opinion on the drainage proposals and whether or not they will have an adverse effect and drainage matters should not be addressed via a condition and the applicant's outstanding drainage information should be sought before the application is determined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Councillor Rowe. Yes, Chairman, I'd like to ask you, you said that 89% of um, the voters in your neighbourhood plan, uh, when it went for referendum, voted um, with reference to the flood, uh, the floods, not flood alleviation system, which you appear not to have. But how many was that? How many actually voted, and how many were eighty-nine percent of, please? Well, the, the, it's it's irrelevant. It's eighty-nine percent of the people who voted. Yeah, but how many actually voted? That's what I want to know. Thank you. Okay, I can give you the figures here. If you bear with me one second, the turnout was fifteen percent. I can tell you that. It wasn't huge, but uh, in a democracy, it's the number of people who vote, not the people who don't vote. Okay. Um, <laughs> not many bothered them. Any they? other no. questions? No. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in a minute, about how much weight we will need to put on the neighbourhood plan um, when we're in our discussions. I've got an answer for you now. Sorry, 700, 725 people voted. Right. Thank you very much for that. Okay, we'll have the um, board member, Coach O'Callaghan. Welcome. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, very much so. I am here very much so. I'm hearing right. a bit of an echo uh, around myself, so uh, I'll plough on. I'd just like to quickly um, thank, um, I think it was Ms Waller who sent me a letter urging me to take a professional approach, so uh, hopefully I will do so. Um, I, I don't think there was a site visit to this site on Monday. It would have been good if there had been um, to get the full picture uh, from this site. Um, so, you know, you have some idea from the photos if you've seen, but, but uh, not, not the full idea. Um, so perhaps that can happen. Um, I want to talk about two issues which have already been discussed, a housing mix and drainage. I know we want, uh, we've want we been urged to steer towards drainage, but uh, as far as I can see in the inspector's report, uh, one of the issues was not housing mix, as Councillor Brazil has alluded to. Um, there is an affordable housing crisis in Kingsbridge. Um, this council, Southampton, has declared one, and it's nowhere worse uh, than in Kingsbridge. Um, we're being recommended to approve six large, expensive open market homes on a greenfield site, essentially. Um, this doesn't benefit either the community or the environment. The average wage in the South Hams, as we all know, is low. At least the alternative application for 14 homes that we've been hearing about had three affordable homes, albeit apartments, within the proposal, although even that's only 20 percent, just over 20 percent, not the usual 30 this one before you has none, and neither does it include any contribution towards affordable housing elsewhere within Kingsbridge. I believe it doesn't have to. Uh, the homes all have an extra room described as an office or workspace, so they could be described and sold by estate agents as four and five bedroom homes, not the three and four bedroom homes that we've been told that they are. Um, 
The design and access statement provided by the applicant, I think, quotes from the 2011 census, I believe, is the ONS data that we've been querying, uh, in stating that there's a shortage of large detached homes like this in Kingsbridge. Uh, the 2011 census, of course, was more than 11 years ago. Uh, so it's out of date, frankly, very much out of date. Um, so I'm surprised that that's quoted. Um, a bit of research would suggest that um, the large Applegate Park development above Dennings, that's also been mentioned just now, um, is well underway with, um, I believe, 58 three and four bedroom detached homes. The Baker Estates development at Westfield Hill will shortly be providing 26 three and four bedroom homes and Locks Hill, which has been mentioned, or Garden Mill, 15 nearly 100 altogether, if my maths is correct. That's quite a lot. And the situation has changed, and moved on from 2011 census. The joint local plan Dev 8, uh, the policy for thriving towns and villages, reports that the most particular needs are, quote, houses which redress an imbalance in the existing housing stock and dwellings most suited to younger people, working families and older people who wish to retain a sense of self-sufficiency. The uh, related SPD or supplementary planning document states um, that um, in, De in South Hams there's an imbalance between existing housing stock and the projected size and needs of newly forming households. There's a higher proportion of four or more bed homes than the rest of Devon and Cornwall. And South Hams is in the top three in Devon and Cornwall for under occupancy with around 35% of homes having at least two spare bedrooms. The planning system can't prevent people, it says, from under occupation or buying a home with a spare room, but it can ensure the mix of new homes is better suited to the needs of smaller households. A step change in the delivery of smaller homes will enable greater churn within the existing housing stock, as it will facilitate downsizing for older people, as well as providing first step towards, there we are, now I've lost it, as well as providing uh, also um, uh, let me get back. It seems to have disappeared. Um, and it basically represent a first step on the ladder for younger families. Um, it says housing stock that comprises a relative over provision of large houses makes it increasingly difficult to rebalance the demographic profile and increase home ownership because the current housing stock is inherently unaffordable. Large dwellings, particularly those in coastal settlements, are not suited to smaller households or those earning close or similar to the national wage. Um, the Kingsbridge Neighbourhood Plan has just been mentioned also, and um, that is, I understand, recommended for approval by Southam's councillors at full council tomorrow, um, in by which time it will be uh, a material consideration, as I understand it or very shortly afterwards anyway, should that be approved. It states that open market houses should respond to local housing need in terms of size, type, special need and tenure. Um, so on to drainage. Um, and this site is in a critical drainage area, as has already been said. And there is major concern in Kingsbridge about flood risk as has been stated by um, Mr. Pengeli, among others. Um, the large Applegate Park housing development above this site has had unresolved drainage issues uh, with south southwest water uh, for many months, not clear exactly where drainage connections should be made in this Wallingford Road area. And I've had residents contacting me um, concerned because Southwest Water have been trying to put pipes through their property. Um, this is long after houses have already started being built. I was extremely surprised at how these things work. Uh, on the fields above the Denning site or within the site, large expanses of hedgerow appear to have been removed, which has already been mentioned. And a new field entrance created after an old stone wall was removed. It's not clear at all that authorization was obtained. This has made flooding much more likely to happen and local residents report that it has happened. A drain which has appeared near this new entrance looks to be totally inadequate. I don't know who's put it in but it looks perhaps to be the applicant uh, but it replaces the old stone wall. 
Uh, one resident of Wallingford Road says, quote, we flooded for the first time in 18 years, as did another resident of Lower Wallingford Road. We believe the flood was caused by muddy runoff from the unmade track to the adjoining vineyard. And Coach the removal of, of the old Coach stone wall, Cullen, can you... as well as the new 100 properties above us at Applegate Coach, Park. Councillor, you've gone yeah. off. We're talking about the site. You've gone off. I know we've realised, and there are other um, matters happening about what you're talking about now. But we've got to go back to the relevant site. Yeah, I heard what I'm you trying said. to give you a picture, though. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm trying to give you a picture of what's papers. going on. It's all in the papers, but we know the, re the rest of the problem. But we, as a committee, have to just come to a conclusion on the site within that red line, much as there is a lot else happening. I appreciate that. But that's where we are. You've made some very relevant points about that, about the mm housing -hmm. need and everything else. And that's where, that's where the application will be will be decided on. You're going off the off the beaten track, shall I say. Well, I am leading up to what I'm going to say about yeah, this but site. So, you're, you're, shall I continue and, and you can see whether you I'm can, going in the right but way. try and keep it a bit more concise, please. Well, it's an important application for the town which I represent. So, you know, if you give me a few minutes, I'll be getting to the point and I think it's important because you can't, you know, you say planning sites are, are seen in isolation. I don't believe that's true, particularly in cases like this. Water flows through Kingsbridge. There's flood risk. It doesn't stay within a particular site. Everything is interlinked. So, you know, I've seen nowhere in this report that we've been given that the county council, Devon County Council, issued a report after a formal investigation into the June the 4th floods in Kingsbridge stating local concern that development sites have contributed to the problem. Highway, dry, highway drains were reported blocked at Applegate Park and muddy water pouring down this area that we've seen pictures of. The report states there is an expectation that all authorities will work together to improve the flood risk. Um, I do think we do need to follow this direction with all authorities looking at the wider changes to the fields as well as the application itself. I mean, I believe refusal or at least deferral is necessary to look more holistically and in more detail into drainage, runoff and flooding concerns. As we've also heard, there's a report commissioned by South West Water, Deve uh, Devon County Council and the Environment Agency on the sewer network in the town in relation uh, to flooding. Everything is connected and interlinked in Kingsbridge with flooding, drainage, sewerage. Um, this report has been looked at for five years and it's still, not, still only in draft form. Um, the dot at the bottom of this site runs along Wallingford Road uh, to a culvert at Duncombe Street and it's liable to flood here. Um, it goes through the town and onto the estuary, everything's interlinked. Um, I think this should be looked at more closely by all agencies in the light of this, not just allowing this extremely important issue of drainage to be addressed by a simple planning condition here. Um, the planning inspector in his previous, that I'm going to be finishing in just a second. Um, the planning inspector in his previous refusal states, um, as his one, you know, as he ends his talking about the drainage issue, um, that it, the proposal would not provide an adequate means of drainage and would therefore fail to comply with policy DEV 35, which seeks to ensure development incorporates sustainable water management measures <clears throat> and minimising where water runoff and, uh, sorry, minimises water runoff and ensure it does not increase flood risks or impact water quality elsewhere. So that's the planning inspector actually saying it should ensure it does not increase flood risks or impact water quality elsewhere. So he, the inspector himself says that this site can't be seen just in isolation as far as flood risk goes. Thank you and sorry to, um, sorry to go on. Thank you. Any questions? From Mr. Weimer from Council Thomas. I think it may be one that you were going to ask yourself, Chairman. Um, Mr. Weimer, I, I note that tomorrow we'll be asked to ratify the neighbourhood plan. If this application had been held, had been heard at the next 
the next development management meeting of this committee, would we be having to take into account neighbourhood plan should it be ratified tomorrow? Uh, the, the, in my view, the fact that the neighbourhood plan is being ratified tomorrow is in many ways irrelevant to this application because it has, to my mind, it has exactly the same weight as soon as it goes through the referendum as it does to be made by the authority. So I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not setting it aside. What I'm saying is that full weight is already there. So as soon as it's, it, it, weight builds up through the process. And as soon as any neighbourhood plan has, has been effectively approved, if that is the right, um, no, because it's not no, it's not made until it goes to the council. But as, as soon as it's been effective, I can't think of another approved by referendum or supported by referendum. Um, then it, it has it has full weight. So you should be giving it um, full weight in the same way as you would the the joint local policies at this point. So the fact it's going tomorrow, would not, so I've rambled on a bit there, but I think I've answered the question. Mm. Right. If there's no other questions, we'll go into the debate. Or unless you've got a specific question, Councillor Hodgson. Well, my question is probably the really obvious one, really, is um, because this has been brought back from a planning inspector about drainage, mm. why have we only got South West Water as few? I have no disrespect, but I mean, normally we would go to Devon County Council for their, right. for their drainage view. And it seems to me, and potentially the Environment Agency, given the, the scale of flooding that has been alluded to, about this, um, with, with, you know, I can I, I can get the question answered. But with respect, we haven't just gone to, to South West Water um, because the the main per, the main person who's been looking at that, or the main people who've been looking at that are as Mr. Johnson, our in-house drainage expert. So it's not just going to South West Water. The reason, as Mr. Johnson said earlier, the reason we went to South West Water is that the um, Ross, correct me if I'm wrong, the proposal for surface water is that surface water will be dealt with by a new stormwater drain that has been that has been installed by by southwest water so because they were proposing to use that we had to get clarification from or confirmation from southwest water that that connection was um acceptable to them because as owners of that that pipe it wasn't this is the surface water scheme do you accept do you agree that's that's an appropriate way of dealing with it, it was just making sure that they're that bit of infrastructure was available. The, the, the drainage scheme isn't, and I, th I can't remember what the phrase was, but it hasn't just been left as a condition. There's a condition to ensure that what they're saying is installed, but the, the actual scheme has been looked at in depth by Mr Johnson, who is our drainage um, uh, expert, and has confirmed that it is acceptable, taking into account, um, as the inspector said, the, the impacts on um, water quality elsewhere and the impacts downstream for want of a better better phrase the reason why we haven't and wouldn't consult the lead local flood authority is that the lead local authority will only comment on planning applications that are major applications so 10 units or more so devon county is the lead local flood authority would not comment on this application because of the the, the scale of the development proposed so that's why we haven't consulted them can i just have one more question for mr Weimer then um or maybe even for the planning case officer um, I mean, has grey water recycling and all mitigation like that been, been actually uh, Im implemented into this design? We haven't heard anything about that. So we were told we could only talk about the drainage. But I mean, there's ways of actually prevention or mitigation before it even goes out of the drain. Has uh, that been looked at? I, I honestly don't know. I'll defer to, to Charlotte in a second. I, uh, but, but fundamentally, what we have looked at is the surface, the, the surface water that, that's going to be generated or part generated on the site by the site, and we and the the advice we've got from our drainage expert is the the scheme that's put forward is acceptable for this site. I don't know whether whether you want Mr. Johnson to go through in any more detail. Um, Do members want that to ask how he has come to his conclusion on the the, the drainage on this site? And I emphasise the site um, is is. Compliant, basically. Can I just ask if maybe my case, the case officer could ask my, answer my question whether or not grey water recycling in those homes has actually been considered at all? Would you like to answer that? Yeah, just get my microphone back. Right. <coughs> uh, not as far as I'm aware, no.
I'm going to ask Mr Johnson if nobody else is to clarify matters. Thank you. Okay, uh, if I can just uh, on the grey water matter as well. So, with, return, with regard to surface water, you can't have any sort of, in terms of managing storm water, you can't really rely on grey water as part of the storm water. So, I appreciate that might have been a separate question, but I just want to clarify that that's not actually part of the, we wouldn't actually consider that to be part of the surface water anyway. Um, yeah, and so just to confirm, so with regard to this site, so uh, yeah, we, uh, so I've looked at the drainage proposals. So, the drainage proposal is they're managing all the surface water on the site via attenuation and then a controlled discharge to a dedicated surface water sewer. Um, and the only re the only bit that we've conditioned really is just the very final bit of the detailed design and just ensuring that they do meet the the CDA requirement of the that they must so the discharge must be a one in ten year. So that's part of the the requirement for not increasing flood risk downstream is that not only you know is that that it's it's controlled way more more stricter than any other site because of the CDA requirement. So a lot of sites can discharge it just at the greenfield runoff rate. But because this is a CDA, the required then this is what we just we're, this is part of the condition is that we're actually securing that it is actually the one in ten year rate. So it's a very very low rate. I think it's I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's yes like liters per second, you know, so less than ten liters per second. In fact, no, way less than that. Sorry. Um, and the fact again, it is going into a dedicated surface water sewer uh, rather than a combined sewer. So if they were again, if they were discharging into a surface into a combined sewer. Um, again, we probably we wouldn't we wouldn't be accepting that either. But because it's going into a dedicated surface water sewer at a controlled rate, then that is why that is it's you know, it's managing its as the site itself. It's not going to cause flood risk, and it's managing the surface water. Thank you. Yeah, um, just just, uh, just to help members, if I can ask, ask to clarify, my understanding of what you've just said is that the runoff rate, as proposed, would actually be less. Than the runoff rate as it is now as a, with a green field. Yeah, because you're going to Yeah. Yeah, Thank so. Yeah, fine. Oh, Coach Rabbit, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm just a bit confused here. Ross, we met on the Aldi proposal. So you were there as a business development officer. Yeah. You're, you, you went, you qualifications in water engineering. I was, a, I was a drainage engineer. I've been a drainage engineer for about six, seven years. Uh, I, uh, Amjad took over, or Amjad took over it a couple of years ago, but since he's left, so I've now come back, picked it back up again. But yeah, I've been doing it for about seven years. And I work with Devon County Council and all the other authorities as well. So, Coaches Martin. Thank you, Chairman. Right. Um, this is the first I've heard. Um, uh, first, I've heard of an attenuation tank, etc. Normally, when we go to development, the, that's actually shown. So, can we see where whereabouts is the attenuation tank sited, and how? Do, uh, what is it? You, you said that it uh, it relies it, it, you know, it, the, the tank would uh, it will then discharge into the uh, in, into the um, the stormwater drainage system. So, is that does it do that by gravity, or is that a pump system? Uh, yeah, so the attenuation tank, uh, I know this isn't the drainage plan, but it's underneath the, those parking bays on the lower end, bottom end of the site. So the attenuation tank is under there. So yeah, well, that, the whole, the the whole red, site drains the, to gravity. The, the, the hatched red square thing? Uh, yes. What, it's underneath the house? Sorry, no, no, so the, so the parking, sorry, yeah, this isn't the drainage plan, but I'm just saying it's under the, the those parking bays that are there, the uh, just off the highway. <coughs> the, the, the attenuation tank is underneath those parking bays. Okay. And so yeah, and so it, it's all gravity. Yeah, no, we won't. We again, we don't. We never accept pumped surface water right. either. So okay. purely for maintenance and Fair sustainability enough. reasons. Anybody else? I think Coach Bridgel and I are having a bit of a deja vu about um, drainage, um, <laughs> uh, and I shall very make sure in the future that any outline planning. Uh, drainage and such things are sorted out at outline application rather than trying to sort it out now. Um, we'll enter into the debate. Yeah, I guess I can't All right, Chairman, can I just ask one more question? It follows on from the question I asked Mr. Wyman. It might be for Mr. Wyman, it might be for Charlotte, I'm not sure which. Um, if we are to give weight to the Kingsbridge plan, 
then why is it that in the analysis and the report around housing mix, there is no reference to the Kingsbridge local plan? We have reference to Dev 8 and Dev 10, but we have no reference, for example, to what will be policy KWAC H2 on market housing, which talks about housing need, which talks about um, you know, consideration given in provision of housing solutions to young families, increasing number of elderly. I'm just wondering why it is, if we're giving it equal weight, even though we haven't passed it, why there aren't direct references to it in the, uh, in the plan, please? In to the analysis, sorry, please. So the analysis does, as a whole, contain quite a lot of reference to the Emerging Neighbourhood Plan. So um, in the section above housing mix, I reference policy H2. Um, I mean, why it's not specifically referenced in housing mix, I apologise. Well, that, 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 was, that was my point, only um, because that is, that is, that is, as a result of this morning's conversations, yeah. that's come out of housing mix has, has come up yeah. along with flooding. Yeah. I think... You know, we've all accepted from the, the previous inspector's report that flooding is very much a, a hot potato in this. Indeed, you know, and, and, and Miss Waller has encouraged us to look down that line. Yeah. But with housing mix as well, you know, I just wondered whether we've given consideration to what was in their neighbourhood plan. Yeah, so I, I have given con I have given consideration to housing mix. Um, I have referenced it in terms of Dev 8 and Dev 10 rather than the neighbourhood plan. Again, so I apologise, I probably should have add added that in as well for clarity. Um but I think just to sort of bear in mind that in the in the previous appeal, which we do need to be mindful of, there wasn't any. We as a local authority didn't raise any concerns with regard to housing mix, so I think we might be slightly in a bit of a precarious position if we start raising it now. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, we'll enter the, the debate. Um, Councillor Hudson. Sorry, I'm looking at document number 8819476, which is July this year, and I don't know if it's been superseded, I can't say anything more recent, which is the drainage plan, and it shows the private attenuation under the car parks. It shows it discharging, going south, as far as I can make out, if I'm right with my south here, um, down into um, a, a new surface water sewer from Devonshire Homes Development, exact details to be confirmed. And then where it goes past that, it goes surface water route to be confirmed under separate application. That's what I'm looking at, Chairman. So there's your there's your attenuation in the in the in the planning in the car parks coming down, and there's this new surface drainage. So unless that's confirmed, then this is just going nowhere. And in fact, it's going into the very area that Mr. Pengelly was talking about flooding at the moment. So since that, uh, it was. Uh since that plan is submitted, we've now had confirmation from South West Water that they have installed the sewer and it's now operational. That confirmation wouldn't have been available when that plan was made. Okay, thank you. Right. Hmm. Debate? Yes, Coach Rob. Thank you, Chairman. I'm getting very worried about all of this because... Um, these are very six very large houses that are going proposed to be built on this site and there seems to be a lot of problems with the drainage and we're getting this all the time now and I'm not quite sure why that is I think we've got inadequate drains we've got drains that have not been renewed for years and years we've got the same old drain pipes that were probably put in there 50 years ago and I think it boils down to the fact that uh, Southwest Water have not been renewing their pipes when they should have done and I know that's not necessarily to do with this application, but and it's recommended for approval, but I'm not really very happy on voting in favour of a large, large houses. They, they are not um, smallish family type houses. These are more like luxury houses to me. And I'm not sure that it's the right houses for the site, Chairman. So I'm sort of not quite sure where I'm going to go on this. Okay. You've gone very quiet. Um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, this seems... Uh, the focal point here is the drainage. As far as the planning inspector is concerned, the principle of development on this site is not a problem. It is. It isn't. It isn't. So. So. Thus, if this committee were to decide to refuse this application based on those grounds, then one would expect the applicant to go to immediately to appeal and win on those grounds because we've already said the planning inspector has said that 
that's fine as far as they're concerned. That's been taken out of our hands to an extent, so, so far as I can see. Um, and it, equally with highways concerns, or, or on highways related concerns, the, 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 the inspector kicked it out on, on those grounds as well. That, that, that's what I understand. So, so the only point we're here to consider is, is drainage, essentially. And everything else is, for want of a better phrase, irrelevant in this scope because the principle of it has been agreed. Thus, given the fact that we are told by the drainage experts that the, that the proposal put forward is okay and substantive as far as they are concerned, we would be on very shaky ground if we were to refuse it on drainage grounds because the experts that we have have said that as far as they're concerned, this is okay. Thus, leads me to what I consider to be a, a not excessively popular, but perhaps logical conclusion of, I will propose approval in line with the officer recommendation on, because the reason that this was kicked out by the, or the, the reason the appeal was dismissed by the inspector has in itself been overcome. So I propose approval. Uh, Jeffrey Swart, come to you, Coach. Coach Thomas. Mr. Weimer wishes oh, to speak. Uh, apologies, members. I should have said I should have mentioned this before you went into debate. Um, as was mentioned in um, Charlotte's initial uh, presentation, the recommendation is approval subject to a 106. But I've noticed in the uh, in, in the papers it just says approval. So um, the the recommendation should be delegated approval subject to delegated approval to myself subject to the completion of the section 106 just to be absolutely clear apologies yep. for not mentioning clear about that thank you thank you coach thomas chairman normally i would find myself supporting everything that councillor brown had said on logic grounds but the, the one thing that makes me fall back from doing so is that and I, I fully accept that we're being led quite rightly down a path that says that the inspector said a and therefore if we've solved a then it would be reasonable for us to say all is good but i'm not convinced that the inspector considered for example the policy that the that the planning officer and I have referred to around market housing that's now been adopted by the neighbourhood plan. And if that's the case, if the inspector didn't consider market housing and the housing mix, then surely it follows that it wouldn't be a spurious objection um, or, or a needless one on behalf of this committee were we to say that we wish to refuse on market housing and on housing mix. We can't say the inspector will be cross with us and say you never said that you objected on market housing. If King, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant, Chairman, but the Kingsbridge, the Kingsbridge neighbourhood plan hadn't been, you know, and, and so on on those grounds, I, I'm I'm moving towards uh, the, the reverse. I'm afraid of of, of, of refusal on on, the, on and my policy when asked would be along the lines of of policy KWAC H2 on market housing. But there we go. That's just my view. Uh, yeah, Chairman, Mr. Fairburn. Thank you, Chairman. All I would say is if that's where the direction you're going on, have you got the evidence to support your potential refusal on the ground of housing mix? And what is that evidence? Well, my response would be that that's what the neighbourhood plan is asking for, that the consideration should be given to provision of housing solutions for young families and increasing number of elderly in the parish. That's what the neighbourhood plan is asking for. If, if this committee feels that the building of these six houses that the vice chairman has referred to as large houses are houses that respond to local housing needs in terms of type and size with consideration given to the housing solution for young families, then so be it. But I can't see that logically as a follow through. Thank you, Coach Thomas. Coach of Brazil. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just following on from that, I mean, unfortunately, when this application went to appeal, um, in my view, the what we said as a council and why we recommended refusal was because of inefficient use of the land. And the reason was is because an application had come before us and said you can get 14 dwellings here. Uh, and then the new application said, no, we're going to put six. And so we argued that actually reducing it from 14 to six was an inefficient use of land. And unfortunately, the inspector took that very narrow definition of that and just looked at it purely upon whether there could be 14 or 6, he, he actually says any other application is irrelevant and we must judge each case on its merits. Uh, and what he said was that if an application first come in for six houses, that would have been okay. 
what he failed to do was to realise that what we were more concerned about was that within the 14, it went over the threshold of the 10, and as a result, we got affordable housing, we got smaller houses, we okay. actually started addressing the housing need that there is in Kingsbridge. Um, I'd, 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 I'd say to Mr Fairburn, if you want evidence about the housing need in Kingsbridge, go to Roof Kingsbridge, and you will see hundreds, if not thousands, of people saying, I've got nowhere to live in Kingsbridge, I can't afford to live in Kingsbridge. Um, you know, uh, what we've got from the applicant is a 2011 census from the, opera, uh, from the ONS saying that actually you, you've got a shortage of big family houses in Kingsbridge. Uh, that's patently not the case. Anyone that has, lives in and around Kingsbridge that knows that's not the case. And what we need are genuinely affordable houses for, for, for working families or indeed houses for elderly people to downsize to. And neither of these th this application is doing so I would say that uh, I, I agree that from the way that the inspector looked at it and the way he interpreted our reasons for refusal, absolutely right that he his view was that actually having six or 14 didn't matter, six was just okay and it was a perfectly efficient use of land. But he failed to look into, it may have been a she, I don't know actually, um, for the, the inspector failed to look into the housing need mix and that may have been an error on our part as a council by not saying but I think that we tried to do it but it was interpreted, interpreted by the inspector not to include that uh, and as a result I think absolutely we should be looking at housing mix here and this in no way satisfies the housing mix that is required for our housing needs within Kingsbridge the neighbourhood plan they've spent years getting their neighbourhood plan and their interpretation as we've heard from the town council is that this kind of application should not be accepted because it does not meet the housing needs in Kingsbridge. So what we were saying what we're saying to the neighbourhood plan is actually it doesn't matter what you write in your neighbourhood plan it doesn't count anyway because an inspector said this but when he said that of course that neighbourhood plan hadn't gone through referendum <laughs> and in all incertainties and purposes it's made. Certainly if they go to appeal it will be made by then. Uh, and will be a material planning consideration. So, in honesty, I'm not happy with the drainage either, but I accept that we don't have the expertise here. All I will say is that every time there's a lot of rain and a high tide in Kingsbridge, we get flooded, we get raw sewage running around, Southwest Water just rubbing their hands because they get, they've got plenty of money from the water rates. Um, no doubt if they've got the foul drainage, they'll be charging water in and out. The fact that it ends up down in Kingsbridge High Street or Mill Street with turds floating around, uh, they don't care. Uh, you know, they, you know they're, they're, they're all fine. We know South West Water is a pretty disgraceful company who are quite happy to, you know, poison our <laughs> rivers and, 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 and sea courses. Uh, and, 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 and quite frankly, this only backs up that. Putting that aside, and, and you may think I've got a slightly prejudiced view on that, um, but putting that aside, I would not refuse on drainage grounds because I don't think we've got the expertise, but I would refuse on housing mix grounds on the fact that the inspector is silent on it, so he doesn't make a judgment one or the other, and that's what the case that, that, that um, Councillor Thomas was, was making, uh, and therefore we're not going against it. I think... Um, as elected councillors, we know what we were. I certainly put it in all my manifestos that my job was to try and provide genuinely affordable houses for local families. Uh, and it, it, the fact that, that this application does none of that, I feel perfectly entitled to say housing need is a, uh, uh, the housing mix is a massive, massive issue in this application. And we should, we should refuse it on those grounds. So I would, I don't, did you move refusal? I will move refusal on, well, I, I'd second the move, move for refusal. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Brazil. <coughs> um, Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, just looking at the officer's report, I think it's page 41. Um, it cites the, um, what the uh, Town Council, uh, Kingsbridge Town Council, <coughs> mentioned in terms of housing need and they're ref they're referencing you wanted evidence of reference of where we where any of these evidence these uh, housing need mixes could come from so Southampton West Devon housing strategy 2021 2026 reports an under occupancy of four and five bedroom ho homes at 27 percent in the South Hams compared to the rest of England at 19 percent 
as Councillor Callaghan re referred to in our supplementary planning document policy, Development 8, the whole step change and delivery of the smaller homes will enable greater churn within the existing housing stock. So all of those, and I won't repeat all the rest of what she said, but also just to say that if the, and, well, since the Kingsbridge neighbourhood plan has been through an inspection and has been approved, ready for us to just do the final ticking off tomorrow, um, that, that will have had all its evidence there for its, its statements and its own policy, which I'd also like to um, in, include in, in this reason for refusal, which I also support. Okay. Other members, anything to say? So, we have, remind me at the moment where we are with... So, we've got one proposer for approval, approval. and we've got a proposer and seconder for refusal. Okay, you know what I know before we go any further with the vote um, that the gentleman on my right will be itching to write down your reasons for going against officer's recommendation. Which I have outlined. Yeah. 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 Something to be repeated, Mr. Fairburn, or are you? I think I'd like a little bit more clarity, just in so that everybody knows what's going on, so that there's a precise reason. Okay. So, so my my reasoning is is by dint of policy, KWAC H two of the Kingsbridge Neighbourhood Plan around market housing, and specifically that consideration should be given to provisions of housing solutions for young families. Um, added to that, you can then add in the point that Councillor Hodgson has made, um, if you'd like to, which was uh, the quote. Yeah, which is the Southampton West Devon, sorry, Southampton West Devon housing strategy 2021 to 26, which reports an under occupancy of four and five bed homes at 27% in the South Hams compared to the rest of England at 19%. And also our um, SPD, our, our joint local plan SPD policy, Dev 8, reports a step change in the delivery of small homes will enable greater churn within the existing housing stock as it will facilitate downsizing for older people as well as providing a first step towards independent living for young people and young, people and young families. We should also include in there that we have declared a housing crisis yes. in, this, uh, in, in this district council. Um, I, what I don't have, and I was just actually wondering if Councillor Callaghan could say that, give us this, is what is the policy reference for the Kingsbridge Neighbourhood Plan in terms of housing that she referred to? Uh, I don't, from the Kingsbridge Neighbourhood Plan specifically. Councillor Callaghan, it's H2, it's the one I just referred to. Okay, I was going to say, if, if Philip's still here, he'll work, uh, Philip Cole, he'll... Yeah, I he'll, think, no, I, we've already got it, thank Denise. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, no, I mean, uh, and as far as the joint local plan is concerned, it's Dev 8. It's in conflict with that, I would sort of, I would put forward. Um, I mean, you could also go back to the National Planning Policy Framework document that talks about housing need. Um, but I, I mean, that's probably more tenuous as you get further away from, from the deep, you know, from a specific place. Um, just also, while I've, I've got the mic, to, to say that I'm very disappointed that the biodiversity mitigation condition has just been like an add-on at the end. If we're serious about a climate change and biodiversity emergency in this council, that should be one of the first things that we look at. Um, I'm not happy that we don't know what they're going to do um, about that, uh, and I would like that to come forward rather than just a condition that they come forward with an ecology plan that says they're going to sort it out in the future, whenever that may be, because I just don't think that's acceptable. Um, we need to know that, but I, I'll leave that for now. But that's just another issue on this app, particular application that I think is 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 un you know is, is unacceptable because that that is a an area that is rich in ecology, ecosystems, and biodiversity, and that will be lost to this housing development. I'm sure, that will be noted. I also quoted the SPD relating to Dev 8. Did you, you've, you've got that presumably? We've done that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 
think we'll get your office recommendation if, if we do. If we wish to do. Kevin, I've, I've heard enough to understand why you want to do it. So, yes, I'm just trying to think about you need the specific word. Rather, you actually voted on specific wording. I'll, I'm trying to draft something as you're talking. So, um, but well, I, I, we, so we I think I'd rather, I'd rather, in these circumstances, Chairman, members all voted on a precise reason. Mem mem members do not feel that the provision of six large dwellings meets K uh, Pack H2 um, of the Kingsbridge Neighbourhood Plan. Or debate. Or, de or debate of how, yeah, thank you. Normally when we have a vote on, on something like that, the council, we have it up on the board so we can see what it actually says. No, right. We haven't got down. Oh. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Members, do you understand what we are voting for now? That we are voting against officer's recommendation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can. I don't think it would be a problem. I know why, but I'm just checking that we're not. Yeah, sorry, Councillor Panel, that wasn't part of the proposal. No. I didn't want it in there, Councillor Panel, because we we have agreed that's not our risk. As, as Councillor Brazil and I have found in the past, we are not experts on trainees, okay. much as we got a that view. Was, that was for all, for all the new members in 2019, that was our first planning site visit, and we've been ruining it ever since. Okay. So, members are clear what we're actually voting for, which is against the officer's recommendation on this application. Can I have a show of hands, please? I don't know. Bloody. Are you voting for against? Yeah, against. So that application is refused. Right. We will not be returning at two o'clock. Um, I would have said two fifteen would be a reasonable amount of time to have a drink and something to eat, and we'll convene at two fifteen.
start again. Mr. Weimer is he's happy for me to start out in. So I am. I thought I would consider an hour. We've got new people in the audience, so to speak. I'll just welcome them and just say that if the fire alarm goes off, out through the doors, as far across the car park as you can go. The toilets are here on the left, the water's on the right, and unless you're registered to speak, you can. You're welcome to listen, okay? Right, that's a short synopsis. Um, we'll go on to item three, which is distance built yard old mill lane uh, 2327 OPA. Um, Chloe, are you ready to? Yes. Good, thank you. Okay, so the application is in outline. It's an outline application with some matters reserved for an on site security building with site manager's accommodation as a lived work unit. Um, the only reserved matter is landscaping, so all the other details have been provided. This is the application site. It's north of Dartmouth at Old Mill Creek. So the red outline is just showing the site location. <coughs> and for a bit wider context, this is Dartmouth to the south. So it's about four minute car journey, five minute car journey from the edge of Dartmouth. So this is the proposed plan. So you've got the site elevations at the top. Um, the floor plan, which shows the sitting, kitchen, admin area, bathroom, and one bedroom. On the right is the site location plan, so outlined in red is where the dwelling will go with the site access. And then to the north, outlined in blue, if you can see faintly, is the wider boatyard, which the building will be in connection with. This is in relation to the tree protection plan that's being submitted. So to the south of the site, there is an ancient woodland. And there is a boundary, stone boundary wall, which separates the site from that ancient woodland. So tree protection plan has been provided to demonstrate how it won't impact on the tree roots for that ancient woodland. And this is just a visualisation that's been submitted with the application to roughly show where the building will go. So it's this one here. And then at the bottom is an existing workshop in connection with the boatyard business. Um, so just the site visit photos. So this is from the west, um, looking towards the site from the opposite side of the road. So the building would go behind the existing workshops at a higher land level, so behind this area of trees. Again, similar position, so the building would be sat behind these trees here. And this is showing the site access, and then the existing properties, which are close to the site. This is from the opposite side of Old Mill Creek, looking towards the site. So you've got the existing workshop building, and again, the building will be set at a higher land level behind there. And this is the entrance to the site, and that's the entrance to the neighbouring land. So again, the existing workshop building. And from the bottom of the site, looking towards where the building will be set. Um, so this is the site access. You've got the workshop building on the left and then the access to where the building will be going is along here and then it curves round to where the building's going on the right. And these are just within the site themselves to show a bit more context. And these are the stone wall that's to the rear of the site that separates it from the ancient woodland. And again, just within the site itself, looking towards the west boundary, which is an existing hedge. And looking out from the site, showing the view to Old Mill Creek. And again, Old Mill Creek. And the key issues for consideration relate to the principle of the development, um, whether there is a proven occupational need for the building uh, with the residential use that requires countryside location and whether the development can reasonably be, be, be located outside the undeveloped coast. Um, so the supporting information submitted with the application states that the live work unit is required for site security and site supervision. Um, and one of the reasons for refusal is that it's considered there's a lack of justification for the, um, the residential use. 
um, also design and landscape impact. So it's just outside of the AUMB, but within the undeveloped coast. Um, and there is a landscape officer objection relating to the extensive floor to ceiling glazing on the northwest elevation and the potential for light spill from that glazing in an intrinsically dark landscape. And also the impacts on the ancient woodland. So there was an objection from the Forestry Commission, um, but after further correspondence, given the small scale of the development and the comments from the tree specialist and the potential for a pre-commencement condition to be imposed to secure mitigation, it's considered that that objection could be overcome. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chloe. Um, members, questions? Councillor Brazil. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, just it, it may it may be to to Chloe. And, hi, Chloe. Nice to meet you. Um, just a couple of questions, and it may be to more general. And that is that if we were minded to uh, approve this application, um, are there con would we have sufficient conditions that meant that it is tied purely to the boatyard? And if the boatyard ceased to operate, then the the dwelling um, could be removed. Um, so it's a tie to the, the boatyard itself. Uh, and secondly, on the light spill, um, is there a way that we can condition it so that there, I, I, I can't remember if we've done it before, that we have some kind of curtains or some kind of uh, condition which means that, that, that they, you can stop, in, a, uh, in the night you can stop light coming out because I appreciate that during the day the light's going in and that's not a problem. It's in the evening when the lights are on, we want to we want to block it and not have lights fill in a dark area. Mr. Weimer, want to answer that one? I, I, I'm more than happy to, and I, I, I think there are probably questions over the years here I think I've probably answered in, in the past. So if members are mind to, mind to approve, then yes, in the, the same way as you can have a uh, a forestry occupancy or agricultural occupancy, I think you could absolutely put a condition on saying that it um, should only be occupied by someone wholly or mainly employed at the, the boatyard for, for two reasons. One, from planning, but from, from because you shouldn't be approving development in the countryside without that need. And secondly, I'm not sure you'd really be, I'm not sure it would be really great planning practice having an unrestricted dwelling that close to a working boatyard in, in any event, so yes, you could. The difficulty comes um, if if the boatyard ceases to exist, I don't believe you could then say the dwelling has to be demolished in the same uh, in the same way if a farm holding ceases to exist, you, you wouldn't be able to come along and say, sorry, no, the, the, the dwelling's got to go. My, and I'm, I'm um, Chloe may, may correct me if I'm wrong, my, my understanding is that it is within an area of um, a neighbour plan that's got significant weight and has also got a principal residency policy. So I would also suggest that it would need to be a principal residency as well as um, an occupancy, simply because if the boatyard ceases to exist, it's still it's still there as a as someone's home and not not a, um, a second home. In answer to the curtains question, I'm sure we've had this before, and we've and we've said actually you can't because it would be impossible to to enforce someone closing curtains. So realistically, the only way to deal with that would be to um, uh, to actually have a reduction in glazing rather. Than yeah, I come back on the f on the first yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I appreciate what you're saying that if the if the boatyard was to close and that dwelling is linked purely to that boatyard. Could we put in another thing so it's linked to that specific boatyard, and if that boatyard closes, that it is a, a tie to some kind of marine industry? Well, just in the same way we have an agricultural tie, it isn't necessary to a specific farm, but it's saying that whoever living in that agricultural tie should be involved in the agricultural industry. Just, just as a sort of belt and braces. Um, I think I think I think it would be very difficult to justify it simply because the justification that's come forward 
is that this is required for the specific <coughs> security needs of this boatyard. And I don't think that would then, that it wouldn't serve that function to a different boatyard. Uh, so, I mean, uh, my, my it, it wouldn't, we, we wouldn't, we wouldn't tie it by name, just in case the, there was a change of ownership. It would be along the lines of to the adjacent um, boatyard. I, I think, I think we'd be struggling to to do it more. more whereas, <coughs> in, in, generally speaking, most agricultural dwellings are surrounded by other agricultural activity. Whereas, there's a, a, a significantly smaller number of marine activity in that. Then you would know. Right. Coach Paddle. If we're Coach saying this should be a, a principal residence, is that compatible with the fact it's a very small dwelling with only one bedroom? Um, is that still uh, is that still allowable because it is very small? Uh, I would say it absolutely is compatible. If anything, I would say it's probably more important. If we get if we just reflect on the discussions you've had on the last application. If it is a smaller dwelling, I would say it's just as important to make sure it stays as a principal dwelling than than a larger one. So I, I would say it is it, it is very much um, important. Coach Taylor and then Coach Hudson, right? Hi, Zoe. Chloe? Not Zoe, is it? <laughs> Chloe. Um, is it probably a problem with the amount of glazing in the north elevation? Have you been in any discussions with the applicant about this, or is that not a relevant question? Um, I think they are aware of the reasons for the application being refused, um, which obviously includes the amount of glazing and the lights built on that. So it's in the reasons for refusal, and we've had correspondence, um, but there's no revisions to the application. Okay, thanks. Just, just Councillor, as a matter of course, it would be unusual for us to seek revised plans when something was being recommended for refusal in principle, because it's then potentially put in the applicant to unreasonable expense to revise plans if it's then still being recommended for refusal in, on in principle grounds. So we wouldn't normally go down that, that route at this stage. Would that not come up at a pre -app? Potentially. And it didn't. Well, we don't know, do we? No, okay. Uh, Coach Hodgson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just in terms of the, um, the light spill, we did actually, um, as far as I remember, some years ago, there was an application in Dittisham which had mm -hmm. um, some roof lights which we um, put on a, on a condition that they would be um, blinds that would come down because we were concerned about the lights below and the impact, not so much on the bats actually, so much as just the kind of the dark skies kind of village. And I don't remember there was any comeback on that. And so we have kind <coughs> of done that. I know. The JLP's come since then and things, but <coughs> I'm just wondering about whether we could actually do something, because we talk about not allowing outside lights, or if they are outside, or if there are external lights, that they're this below, is it 0 0.0 lux? Sorry, 0.5 lux. Um, so I just, 0.0 is quite much better. Yeah, that, um, that's dark. <laughs> just checking if you're all awake after lunch. Um, so um, I just wonder if we could sort of put, put something along those lines in terms of the light, because somebody can still be responsible for the light spill coming out of their windows, let alone what's positioned outside. And is there any way that that could be conditioned? Because then that means that, you know, somebody can have some very low lighting in the house that doesn't actually have the impact. I mean, of course, it's still going to have a certain amount of glow, but um, it's not spilling onto other, other properties. It's just the dark area and the, and the habitat. I understand where you're coming from. I think it's. I think it would be a challenge for us to impose a condition that effectively fetters the strength, if that's the right word, of light bulbs used in, in internally, and effectively saying, I don't know how. I don't know. I don't know how enforceable it would be. I suppose we, you could come along with a light meter and check how dark it is at a particular, a particular point, but I. It, it, my my preference would be that the, the the glazing would be changed to to something that was acceptable to the landscape to landscape and ecology rather than curtains or strength of light bulbs or 
how were they used? Lux level restrictions, Mr. Wine, are, are normally ones that you'd find around a football club, aren't they? In terms of the glaze on the glare yeah. on floodlights. Yes. Um, before I come to you, Councillor Long, I mean, when you think we know why there's a lot of class on it because it's down in a dark valley, so that you're saving. I'm just going to throw one in. It's going to help with the carbon footprint having a lot of glass on there, so is your balance against the light spilled the other way around in the evening? I'll, I'll let you dwell on that. Can uh, I, just, along. Can I just say, to, <coughs> just coming back on that, though, is it not possible to even consider requiring um, shutters? Because then that's not the same, is it? And sh shutters that mm. are closed. No. That? Anyway. We, no, we don't want to get bogged down on this glass. Like we got bogged down on... It's got the sewage problem this morning. Um, <laughs> excuse the terminology to Councillor Long and <laughs> Councillor... Chairman, um, just for clarification, a number of um, occasions we've used um, light reduction film on glazing, which has been conditioned and not removed. And I think the one, it was a 25% reduction in emission through that glass, although... I'd much prefer to see the uh, level of glazing reduced, but that's a, that is something we've used before. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, even before we get to lights, the, the, the report actually recommends refusal because you say there is, it's not considered there's a proven need for the introduction tied to the business in the first place. And the, so is that because you feel that there is no need for someone to be on site all the time? Yeah, so it's been put forward for the need is for improving the site security and site supervision. So in the section in the report under the principle of development, it does go through that in, in quite a bit more detail. But in regards of how the site security could be improved, whether there's alternative means to need and someone there 24-7, um, and the fact there are other properties um, in the surrounding area overlooking the site appreciate some distance. But whether, yeah, there's alternative means than there needing to be a 24-7 person on site in a residential building you know I'm, yeah i was aware you had it in the report i just thought we ought to draw attention to the fact that you know rather than talking about the, the lux levels there is actually a before we get to that point that there is an established position yeah thank you chairman thank you Councillor thomas for bringing this back to where we should be right yeah. <laughs> yes thanks it was that point i i wanted to raise if you've got lights on inside the building you're not going to see any vagabonds going past so, uh, uh, if it is there for security, um, then are they going to have a lookout? Are they going to have um, uh, motion sensors? It's a, it's a whole whole problem. And, and, and having lighting inside, which uh, you would normally want to on an evening, um, it, I'm not sure that the security argument adds up, actually, when you, when you put all of these together. Coming back to that point, um, did you specifically, um, Chloe, did you specifically ask for sort of evidence of process that have gone through looking at the security of the site? Because obviously, you know, the use of CCTV cameras, which can be accessed remotely, um, all that sort of thing can be installed. Has any of that information come back that they've gone through that process? Um, no, we haven't got anything to kind of say that that's not a feasible option, but the argument that the applicant put forward is strongly stating that they do need someone to be there 24 seven. Um, there was reference to crime incidents previously where we've asked for additional information like the crime reference numbers and that sort of thing. And um, we haven't had the additional information for that, but there is the supporting document which goes through in a bit more detail what issues they've had on site. Uh, I suggest goes along as a question for the applicant. Any more questions on the presentation by Chloe? No. Okay. Before I forget, Chloe, I've been very remiss because this is your first presentation, isn't it? Second. Second, is it? Second. All right. <laughs> I thought it was your first site visit. First site visit. Yeah, first site visit. That's all right. Yeah, okay. Right. So we'll move on now to, there wasn't any objectors, um, Mr. Tiston, um, supporter. Slides as well, yeah, we'll I believe.
I can say next slide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ready to start. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my family have been seafarers in the South Hams for over 200 years, and my father bought the site in 1951 to break redundant wartime vessels for scrap metal. The site had an industrial history with three workers' cottages inhabited until 1939. Since the 1980s, I've been changing the yard to meet the needs of leisure boating. We now have a purpose-built workshop and washroom facilities, a 50-ton crane and a collection system for anti-fouling residues. I operate 80 moorings in the main harbour with parking at the boatyard, relieving pressure on scarce parking in the town. Growing numbers of kayakers and paddleboarders launch from the yard, which gives safe access to a peaceful part of the harbour without damage to the vulnerable riverbanks. If I'm going to continue investing, I now need staff and better yard security. Housing in Dartmouth is so expensive, you pretty much need to be a dentist or a lawyer to get footing. So being able to offer accommodation on site would make employment far more realistic. While transforming security, this is about employment and the future of the boatyard is not a route to Airbnb. The second photo. Uh, officers have raised concerns in relation to building in the countryside, but while I fully support the core objective of protecting the environment, I wish to remind you that the yard already has a certificate of lawful use for commercial activity and is surrounded by other commercial yards as well as the sewerage works. Because of the larger boat yards at Noss and Bowditt Wharf are reducing yard space for other types of development, the pastoral riverside landscape of the AOMB is coming under pressure to be used for the storage and maintenance of yachts. The AOMB Estuaries Management Plan argues unambiguously for retention and support for traditional established boat, boat yards like mine. I quote, boat maintenance, repair and storage facilities will be retained and encouraged within the existing developed harbour areas. Number three, um, I've always tried to respect the landscape. The new workshop has bespoke curved roof and timber cladding to the principal elevations. It was designed to sit comfortably within its surroundings and the proposed accommodation would again be sensitively sited and of sympathetic design. Relevant issues like light pollution will be addressed if and when this reaches detailed planning. I have been asked why I need on-site security when I only live 10 minutes off-site. This is perfectly convenient for all bona fide appointments, but the thieves and vandals don't ring in advance. And while in the past security has been less of a concern for my customers, the market is changing and owners of higher value vessels are now continuously inquiring. I would like to take advantage of these opportunities, but they clearly come with an increased risk of crime. Solcombe Harbour spends £80,000 a year on security and a similar value in outboard engines was recently stolen from Blackness Marine. So if I'm going to grow the business, I need a much higher level of security and therefore I hope for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, have you got any questions? Um, if you go back to your first slide, that shows a, a cottage, um, a, it, it's called Old Mill Creek, so I assume that that was something, was that mill buildings or something like that? That was the three cottages, yeah, there's still a gable end of one of those buildings with a fireplace and an old larder, okay. that's still in place, which I'm sort of trying to keep for a bit of history. Okay, of the site. I wasn't actually able to get to the site to visit, but ha so how long ago were those knocked down? Uh, my dad knocked them down in 1970, or in the 70s, 1970s, so 75. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. Right. Yeah, Coach Hodgson. Uh, obviously, you've heard the conversations that have been about the, um, the windows and the yeah. issues around that and the impact on wildlife and the dark skies yeah. area. I mean, are you? Would you be consider, uh, consider uh, some changes to that? To absolutely. I mean, it was, you know, obviously the the first idea was that if you can see down into the yard, you can see cars coming into the yard. It's more of a daytime. The windows were more about for daytime use, so that if you were just happened to be in the, the manager was there looking around, they know that somebody had come into the yard, so that he could start to think, who's that? Are they supposed to be coming into the yard? Are they supposed to be towing that trailer out with that hundred thousand pound rib on on the back of that car? You know, it it was about sort of just giving good visual. Um, but it could be modified. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's um, this is only an outline application. I'm just trying to get a, a feeling that that the council is willing to work yeah. with me and and let me move forward. Okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Weimer. I know what you're going to say. Uh, you you may you may not. 
Well, okay. Whilst it is only an outline application, the only matter that's reserved is landscaping. So the actual details of the property are up to be a, are as they are to be approved now. It's not that isn't reserved for for reserved matters. The only reserved matters is the landscaping. So the, those details are in front of us now. Just to be to be clear, can only determine on what's before, not what we would like well, before. Not, Yes. No, uh, no. The point I was making quite often with a, with an outline application, as you know, will be outline, mm. and the plans will be indicative, and they'll be subject of a a detailed reserve matters application. In this case, the only matters that have been reserved for that subsequent application is landscaping. So, access access site and design appearance is being considered as part of this application. So it's it's not something that's been put back to the reserve matters. Now. I may come back with further advice depending on how the debate goes. Right. Any other members? <coughs> right, yeah. or two of them here. Um, okay, I'll take Councillor Thomas first this time. Uh, Mr. Tistin, would are you are you planning on living in it or would you have a member of staff living in it? I'm hoping to get a proper manager in that's gonna look after the yard for me so I can take a little bit of a you know, easier step with it, um, you know, I can concentrate more on what I do, specialise in, and uh, have, a, have a, a dedicated manager and to run the yard. Um, so my, my follow up then is: are, are you are you asking this this committee to consider it because you f you feel that having the manager there all the time is what your potential new customers <coughs> would want? Is that what you're saying that that you're missing out on a market because you don't have somebody there on site all the time? Is that what you're saying? I turned down a, an awful lot of business from from people with the more expensive ribs. Ribs are becoming a huge thing. You know, we got ribeye in Dartmouth now. They they start at sixty thousand pounds for the smallest one. You know, I mean, they got two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and they're on a trailer which can be hooked up and taken away. I mean, by the time I got from my house in Lake Street, they'd almost be on the A thirty eight. You know, it, it. I can't afford to take the risk of having them in the yard. Uh, obviously, I can put up great big bars and chains, but you know they come tooled up these days. You know, battery grinders, are, you can cut locks. You can. Um, so I've turned down an awful lot of work, and I think the yard's got to that level now where I've got to say somebody's got to come on board with me and and run this place a little bit more professionally and smarten it up a bit, you know, and, and make it um, for the twenty first century. Really. So, so while you're there, while you're in the chair, pardon my ignorance on this, mm -hmm. would would it be normal then for other yards in other coastal areas to have 24-hour live-in staff for exactly that purpose? Would that be normal? Are you unusual in having a boat yard that doesn't have I mean, somebody living on The boat yard across the way has got a bungalow that was given permission to oversee it. I mean, that was obviously a long time ago. A uh, creekside boat yard across the way, that's got a bungalow sighted just above it. Um... I think the way the way the world is now, you know, you can't um, you can't rest on your laurels, can you, and just say everything will be okay. I think, uh, yeah, you've got to, got to be a little bit more. Thank <laughs> you, Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> obviously, I asked the question um, earlier about CCTV and sensors as increasing security. Have you looked at those? They, they're in there. there. They are in there. Yeah. We're, we've been using them for years. Yeah. I thought you would have. Yes. Not yeah. mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? No. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. And we'll now move on to Councillor Campus of Dartmouth Town Council. And you were with us all. Monday, were you not? Yes. Yeah. Okay, right. Um, my name is Kathy Campos. I'm a town councillor with Dartmouth Town Council, and I'm also the chair of the Dartmouth Town Council Planning Committee. Councillors, firstly, I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in support of this planning application, and would also like to thank you for bringing this application before the South Hams Development Management Committee. As you are aware, 
the Dartmouth Town Council Planning Committee has supported this application from Distin's Boatyard and recommended its approval. Our reasons for doing so were as follows. As the proposed manager's accommodation was outside the boundary of Sankey Woods, we saw no issue there. Given the paucity of rental accommodation in Dartmouth and the impact that has for re recruitment, we acknowledge that on-site accommodation would make the recruitment of a manager much easier. As you know, this is an issue throughout South Hams. Distin's Boatyard are clear that the appointment of an on-site manager is integral to their expansion plans. With the rise in rural crime and the recent spate of thefts of outboard motors in Dartmouth and East Cornworthy, the enhanced security of an on-site manager, the on-site manager would offer, is now a sensible necessity. I also think that if you have on-site security, that acts as a, a bigger deterrent than CCTV. It makes it more awkward to go in there and take things away. So I actually think on-site security is the best deterrent you can have. I understand there are some concerns as to the design of the accommodation with its fully glazed frontage and its visibility from the opposite side of the creek. The glass frontage affords a full panoramic view of the whole yard, which is also an important consideration for security. Dartmouth Town Council, while mindful of planning concerns, is committed to supporting local businesses and the employment opportunities they offer local people, especially when they are not seasonal. Clients who use the boatyard usually visit the town and they also contribute to our town's economy. I'd like to also point out that this application has also had the support of our neighbouring Dittisham Parish Council. For all these reasons, I hope you will consider approving this planning application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Come on. You've got a neighbourhood plan? We have, yes. How does it sit within the neighbourhood plan? Um, well, first of all, um, as um, Patrick pointed out earlier, we now have a principal residency clause. So this, this accommodation would have to be a primary resident. It could not be something that somebody went and used as a, a holiday let. Um, I had a little bit of a discussion with one of the steering committee people of, on the this situation of it. But in actual fact, it is not in a, an area of, of lo, a locally a green space designation, so it doesn't affect Sankey Woods at all. Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Campos, on the, on the glazing issue, yeah. do you, would you contend then that it is more effective than it would be simply to have a conventional bungalow on that site? Are you saying that the, the, the panoramic view is, is, is an essential part, or is it not the fact that having somebody on site that's the deterrent? I, I think it's both things, to be honest with you, because if you think you've got a boat, the boatyard, I mean, you, you, were you on the site visit? Yes. yes. Well, you saw how it is. It's sort of quite long and narrow, isn't it? So you kind of need to look this way, you need to look that way. It, it's, it's quite a difficult, I think, area to police, if you like. So you do need good visibility to see what's going on. But presumably that would include at night as well. Yes. So there would be light spill. Well, that's that's my only worry. Mm, is the light? Yes, personally. Mm. I mean, is there not some sort of special glass now that you can have? Um, it's sort of dark on the outside, but you you can see out, but people can't see in. Don't they have it on things like huff houses? I've proved myself not to be an expert once today. <laughs> I'm not prepared to do so twice, well, Councillor Campos. <laughs> Further questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Next is um, Councillor Baston and Councillor Hawkins, followed by Councillor Rowe, in that order. <coughs> That's alphabetical. <coughs> That's right. <coughs> Good reason, Jenny. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members, for letting me speak. Um, I'm going to jump about a bit because um, I only arrived back in the country la late last night, and um, 
And I do apologise for not attending the site meeting, but I did go down and have a look before I uh, went away. Um, yes, it is an outline application, and uh, I, I feel that there is room for manoeuvre on the um, lighting, and I'm sure Mr Weimer would be able to find a way around that little problem he's got about reserve matters uh, and I think you mem as members could uh, persuade him to do that. Um, this application as you've already heard is supported by Dartmouth Town Council but is also supported by the Dart Harbour Navigation Authority who feel that this business is a key asset of the town and I have to go along with that. Um, could you put up my slide please? Because I want you to be looking at... No, that one, no. Sorry? It was, it was well, you, you can put up um, Mr. Distin's first slide, if you like. Oh, sorry. But I did ask for a slide to be put up, and it's virtually the same as that one. Because I, I want you all to be looking at that when we're talking about this, because, look, there are... A cottage is there, and it, history says there have been cottages there, and Mr. Distin's already talked about it. And all we're talking about is a one-bedroom bungalow, basically. Um, as far as security is concerned, um, I think the report has missed the point of this proposal. You've all been down and seen the boat yard, and you've all seen um, the expensive equipment down there and the expensive boats, and Mr. Distin's already talked about one rib being a hundred thousand pounds and he's already had security uh, cameras etc put in there he's got a if if something drives in and he's at home it bleeps and he he he, he can see what's there but he can't get in there is a different matter if if you get a load of thieves in there of a night and they go off with one of these hundred thousand pound dories he's got to come from dartmouth but they don't go back that road, which he's coming in. They'll go out through Chipton and out through past the Sportsman's Arms. So uh, that's why he definitely needs somebody on site. The other reason he needs somebody on site, he is an accomplished um, worker on the river. And if he's out working on the river he, during the day, who's looking after the yard? He needs that extra person there to be keeping an eye on things when he's out on the river. And he does do a lot of work on the river. I, until recently, lived on uh, the, the North Embankment, and I saw him up and down the river, river on a regular basis. And in fact, talking about security, uh, an outboard motor was stolen from a, a boat, which was moored just down below where I live overnight, and I knew nothing about it until the next morning when the police were there. And it happens all along the river. And as Mr. Distin said, South Arms District Council, uh, Council through the Harbour Authority spent 80000 a year on security. You know, and, and we talk about black nests further up the river. They had £80,000 worth of equipment stolen. And it's happening all along the river all the time. And I can understand his concerns. Um, the ancient woodlands. That really made me laugh when I read that in the report. The Forestry Commission, an unelected quango, came in. <laughs> <laughs> well, he knows I love unelected quangos. Um, they they came in heavy. Go on, about, unit. Go on. Yeah, they came in heavy <laughs> about about the forest. The, what's it called? Sankey Wood, right? Did you get a chance to go into Sankey Wood to have a look at it? They've decimated it, absolutely decimated it. They took down more trees than they left there. So, you know, it makes me laugh. So they came in heavy and said, oh, you know, oh, oh. and then after it was pointed out to them <laughs> that they were going down the wrong avenue, they came in with a follow-up report which says they were afraid some dust would get onto the trees during the works. It really does make you laugh when you've got organisations like that in this country. And I blame David Cameron because <laughs> because in 2012 he was going to get rid of all these quangos, and, uh, but he never did. Anyway, <coughs> moving on. <coughs> As I said, I was going to jump about a bit. 
Um, the ju- yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, sustainability, JLP. You've had your problems with sustainability in the villages and the <coughs> local businesses. I can remember you discussing one at Asprington, a couple at Holwell, etc. And the same applies here. This is a local business that needs support. It, uh, and we need to sustain these businesses in the South Hams. We don't want to decimate them. We should be sort of supporting them. Um, so you've seen that slide. Villi- uh, cottages already there, and they look really nice. What would a little single bungalow there? No harm at all. And in fact, it may brighten up the area because... Boat yards aren't particularly attractive, you've got to admit that. But yes, Chairman and members, I would ask you all to give this uh, uh, boat yard all the support you can and approve the application that is in front of you. All right, thank you. I'm willing to take I, questions. I, 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 yeah, well, I'm going to smack your hand before I do that. <laughs> You 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 made a criticism of the of the of the officer that missed the point on their on their um, report. The some of the bits that you've put in is for the applicant to put in and not for the officer. She's gone purely on planning issues. Right, gentlemen, can we um, have some questions? Chairman, um, Councillor Bastone, you will have heard what I said to, to Councillor Campos, and I say the same to you. That is a lovely picture. Um, the six candles flickering in those windows would not be producing very much light. No, that's Sebastian. true. And yeah. my concern is the brightness yeah. that you're talking about, we could take literally as well I, as And I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Um, I told him to build a bat box, you know. Um, but um, I'm sure Mr Weimar would be able to give you some condition that will get round that situation as far as uh, the lighting is concerned. And and as um, Councillor Hodgson has said, we, you've uh, dealt with it before here. I uh, would very much like that to be today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, questions? Any more? Councillor Hodgson. Hodgson? I'll turn this into a question. <laughs> Are you aware that the Forestry Commission is a non-ministerial governing department responsible for management of publicly owned, as owned forests and the regulation of both public and private forestry in England. And also it was founded in 1919, therefore it's a government department under DEFRA. I would ask you to retract some of your comments about unelected quangos. Thank you for um, pointing that out to me. Um, but they do act like that. Um, when you look at that sankey wood and how many trees they actually cut down was more than what is left there now, I'm sure of it. Right. Thank you, Coach Baston. <coughs> I think that's it. Right. Oh, sorry. Coach Not Taylor. a question. I just want to say thank you to uh, Prime Minister Baston. <laughs> right, come on. Come back Coach, Coach, Coach Hawkins. <laughs> Right, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, The Dartmouth members have not brought planning applications very often to this committee uh, because we normally go through the delegated process. But we felt this one was really important to bring to this committee because it's an actual family that have been working on the Dart for a, a huge amount of years, generations. They are a traditional Dartmouth family and they are working as their ancestors have done and this yard since 1951, I believe. And we feel that the protection of that employment site is really important. And as most of us will know, areas such as this that are actually on the banks of the Dart or banks of any of our rivers are really important to protect for employment. More often than not, very, very wealthy people will buy them and convert them 
into luxury apartments, second homes, holiday lets, etc. This is a brownfield site and always has been with a high quality maritime business on the dart. And that is why we've bought it here, because we want the protection of that employment site um, for future generations. The security is an issue because actually having somebody on site, not a camera, but actually somebody there as a threat for hearing them put a boat on a more on a on a on a um, low loader or whatever, or taking a um, uh, an engine, etc. The actual threat of someone being there is going to make a huge amount of difference to this site. So I'm hoping very much that you will support the application. Landscaping is still a condition, so landscaping can be made to make it more sympathetic. The only concern I have got, like I think we've all, all have got, is the actual amount of light pollution. And I would say, similar to Councillor Bastone, is I would ask our officers to assist us to ensure that that can be brought down to the minimum possible. Um, I just want to say again, it's an employment site. It's always been an employment site. We want protection of that employment site for the future. The neighbourhood plan, that is going to be adopted tomorrow at this council and will ensure that that property, which is only a one bedroom property, is going to be uh, protected, uh, can, can be a, uh, only a residence for uh, full time residents. And we need to condition that, that it is alongside the employment site. Um, and that is, we want to protect that employment site, that maritime protect mar maritime employment site for the future, and that's why we that's why we brought it here. Thank, Thank you. you, Chairman. Any members with any questions? Nope. Sorry, I wasn't so entertaining with Hillary. <coughs> Catch a row. Okay. Oh, thank you, Chairman. Um, this is an application for distance boatyard. I think most of what needs to be said has probably been said, but I'm going to repeat some of it again because that's my privilege and prerogative. Um, and it's an on-site security building proposed for a manager's accommodation as a live-work unit. We all went to the boatyard and we saw what it's like down there when we managed to find it for some of us. It's a very busy boatyard and it's upwards of 200 moorings and berths within the proximity of the yard. There has been a very long time and it's been in the family for over 70 years. It has the support of Dartmouth Town Council, Dart Harbour Navigation Authority regard this business as a key asset to the river. It provides essential services to a wide variety of boat owners and water and river users. It, in, and more importantly, it provides employment. The building, which would be on a brownfield site, this isn't a greenfield site, it's a brownfield site. And it's gonna be, uh, and it's not in open countryside, it's on a brownfield site, it's not in open countryside. And if approved, it could have a condition attached to it to be used as a principal residence um, I don't believe we can attach it to as a site manager's residence, but as a principal residence so that it cannot be, if it's no longer um, used in connection with the boatyard for whatever reason, it's still a principal residence. There are a number of properties and businesses within the vicinity and they have been issues with security there. There's a lot of valuable equipment. We know how... Um, they, we've been told and it has been talked about the value of some of the properties, the boats and all the stuff that's down there, the equipment. Um, you're talking about more likely um, getting on towards hundreds of thousands of pounds, 50, 70,000 pounds. And I know there's been uh, problems with um, outboard motors and stuff being stolen <coughs> off boats, um, particularly at the Black Ness and also where I live in Stoke Gabriel, down on the quay there. And we have got surveillance equipment there, but there were 10 
um, outboard motors stolen there recently off ding dinghies overnight. So it goes on all over the place and you do need really somebody there to be watching what's going on. And if it were to be approved today, a construction management plan would be required prior to commencement to the development and it, to protect the quality of the river, the ancient woodland area and surrounding wildlife habitats. Subject to the conditions would accord with the D Dev DEV 1 and 2 and also 29 of the JLP. I think this application is finely balanced and I'd like to hear what other members of the committee think about it. Um, with reference to the lighting, I do remember, as Councillor Hodgson said, that we did at one point, we, there was an application, I think, to do with a, a boat um, store down in Didisham, which was on the main street, and they were talking about there was going to be too much light pollution, and we did, I'm sure we put in a condition then, yes, uh, to do excuse me, to do with lighting. So I think it could be overcome um, one way or another. Um, anyway, Chairman, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rowe. Um, any members got any questions? Oh, yes, Councillor Brazil. No, 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 no. <coughs> no. no. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for, um, for, for the officer, for Chloe, uh, which I should possibly have asked at, at the start. Yeah. Is, can that be? Yeah. No, a question for Councillor Rowe for a minute. If we're done for them, then then we'll we should go to debate. But you've got a question to go yeah. to Chloe, right? Okay. Um, uh, in your um, the the montage you showed, you showed the uh, prospective site, and the in the, in the report, the landscape officer makes mention of the fact that it is a, that it's considerably elevated. And it's it's by dint of its elevation, it makes it more visible, for, particularly from the other side. Do you know whether um, uh, here an alter any alternative sites were considered, or um, I mean, I yeah, if you could say that. You mean within within this site itself? Yes. Still, um, previously there was one which was I think it was slightly further to the south very similar position but it was moved slightly forward because of the ancient woodland but that's the only site that's been considered there is obviously the existing workshop building on there and the working space for the boatyard so um it is quite a constrained site but no alternatives have been yeah considered okay thanks <coughs> thank you councillor panel question no, sorry another question for the officers if that's all right um it seems i think there's quite a lot of sympathy for the, for the principle of a building here but there is a lot of concern about the light now because the outline application has included a detailed plan of the building we are in a bit of a bind because we can't actually say negotiate if you like with the applicant to say because uh, the applicant himself rather suggested that he might like to enter a conversation with us to um, see whether that could be amended is there any way forward with this, in a, if either by deferment or some other way in which we could, if we are minded to approve the principle of a development there, um, deal with this issue about the, the light and the concerns over that? I don't think it could be done by condition because by approving the application, you are by default approving approving plans so you can't have I don't believe you can have affecting an approval or then a condition saying notwithstanding the approved plans you've got to do something else if members are satisfied with the principle and I, I, I think that's the one thing you need to resolve first I think personally I think the only option and I'm welcome for other ways from colleagues I think the only option would be um, approve subject to the receipt of further uh, receipt of revised plans that reduce the glazing that we would then have to have conversations with landscape and ecology to see whether that overcame their their objections um on the basis that it, if it overcame their objections i don't i wouldn't see the need to bringing it back to committee but if it didn't overcome the objections i think we'd then have to bring it back on the basis of that that reduction didn't overcome the the objections i i can't i I, I hear what Councillor Hodgson has been saying around various mechanisms to resolve it. I, I still think I still feel the 
the only really satisfactory way is to look at whether the the volume of the total volume of glazing can be produced. I understand what's being said about 180 degrees worth of surveillance, but I don't think that needs to be floor to ceiling. Um, I, I accept there needs to be glazing across the entire. There needs to be elements of glazing across that frontage, but I say I don't think it needs to be necessarily floor to ceiling on what is that two thirds of the building? Look, just looking mm. looking for here. So I think yeah. there would be scope to um, because I mean being being quite flippant about it, unless you're either in, employing a giant or they're standing on a chair, they're not going to be able to looking out those top windows. So you, you, I think that I think there is a way forward to reduce the glazing. I haven't had conversations with the ecologists or landscape to see what level of reduced glazing would be acceptable. I think that I think that would probably be the way forward if members are content with the the, the principal issue. So you're saying to us that <clears throat> we, I didn't think you could substantially change or change a planning application like that. I I don't per, I don't see it as a substantial oh, change okay. in that respect because right. fundamentally the, the the size of the building is not changing the height of the building is not changing the overall design the overall design of the building is not changing the only thing that's potentially changing is the the level of <coughs> of glazing so if some of that glazing was reduced i wouldn't personally wouldn't say that was so substantial that it would need to be Re-advertised, right. so I, I think, and it's not; it's still going to be of, of the same size. So I would be content that yes, you could deal with it lawfully within the, the scope okay. of that of, of that application. Right. Um, right. And uh, and if it was a, and a, if it was um, went down that line, and if members chose to go down that line, then obviously it would be in conjunction with whoever proposed and seconded, and the ward members when the plans come in. So people were members were aware of what we were looking at. But I don't, I, unless members felt no, it has to come back to committee. I think it could be dealt with on a delegated basis, subject to. If that, that clarifies quite a bit. Um, Councillor Panel, then Councillor Hodge. Well, having heard the views of the town council and the local <coughs> members, um, and their strong feeling that there is a need for this building, um, I'm prepared to move. Uh, I thought. I thought. Are we still on questions? Are we into debate? Thank you. Um, somebody's saying I'm not. But right, okay, I, I'm prepared to move then um, approval subject to um, negotiations over the amount of glazing uh, to produce a scheme that will satisfy the ecologist and the landscape officers and the other op and the planning officers to, to make sure that that issue is addressed to the officers' content. Thank you for that. Second. <laughs> right, Councillor Taylor, I'll take your second. Do you want to say anything or just second? I, just, uh, I, I sort of agree with what you said. I mean, the fact is, I mean, we all know it's been, it's been, a, it's been a good point there. Yeah. They're all queued up here. Um, Councillor Hodgson. Yeah, just to, just to, I mean, I, I'm happy to second that as well, or third it, or whatever. Um, because I actually believe that it's really important to have, obviously the security is a really a key element of it, but I mean, that old building, that was, you know, that we saw, saw, the, saw the pictures of, they were there because those were sustainable locations in the past for people to carry out their business, live, you know, live work. It might have looked like a happy little sort of thatched cottage, but actually, you know, it wouldn't be like we see it now with, sort of, you know, sort of holiday homes, etc. It would then have been somebody actually living and working right on their own doorstep. And I think we've kind of changed that way in, only really in the last 30 or 40 years to our great detriment because we've actually lost an awful lot of, of genuinely affordable rental properties that had, you know, a job with it. And, you know, even like, you know, stations, all sorts of places had... Um, you know, somebody living in, not only because it was um, it was actually providing a home and it was quite, perhaps the companies at the time, a cheap way of having somewhere to live, but it was also, um, it was for security. And we, you know, we've lost, we've lost a lot of that security. And I think it's actually good to reflect on maybe supporting that through the planning process. I mean, our planning process is there to meet local needs. It's not just to supply holiday homes, is it? Thomas. 
thank you, Chairman. I'm not going to do this because I can read the room, but actually I support the officer recommendation on this. Um, I'm sorry if that makes me unpopular with ward members and indeed with Mr Diston, but I just don't think personally that the, the, the case is proven for a permanent uh, building on that site. I think, you know, if you wanted to put a, a mobile caravan or something that provided a temporary accommodation on security grounds, you could do that. I also don't think that there's enough justification for a large glaze. I think if you're going to have somebody on site, you can have somebody on site. You don't need enormous great windows. Personally, and unpopular that may be, I will be voting to support officer recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Brasseau? Um, yeah, just to say, um, I, I'll actually be supporting Guy's uh, proposal for, for approval against officer recommendation. And just to allay some of, 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 of Dan's fears, can I just say that in my own ward, in par next door parish of East Portalmouth, we've got two examples of yeah. residential properties that have been built to support boatyards. Um, security being a number one issue there, that's on Salcombe. And also, I should say that I think you know, just to take a bit of ownership of the Distin family name in Salcombe, you know, it's a uh, it's a massive name in Salcombe as well. I believe two of the two of the lifeboat men who drowned at the, the Salcombe lifeboat disaster at the end of the last century, beginning of the last century, were were Distins. So um, yeah, it's a it's a family that spread far and wide along the south coast of Devon. Not that that's relevant. <laughs> I was just going to I was just going to say I was just going to say, Chairman, I would. I would hate Councillor Brazil. I would hate Councillor Brazil to think that, that my voting with officer recommendation was, was somehow uh, disparaging the distant presence in the South Hands. <laughs> Mine was more on planning grounds, Jim. I was going to get Councillor Brazil to justify his on planning terms. What are you saying? But never mind. Um, right, we are where we are, Councillor Smirk. Very quickly, Chairman. Um, I've, yeah, uh, listen to what all that's been said. Um, it does spring to mind that, that quite close to me. And I'm sure you, uh, in your rural war, will have um, um, examples of this as well. Not far. Um, we did grant permission. This was for an agricultural co contract in business, um, which uh, I mean, it, it was with an agricultural agricultural occupancy clause because they did have uh, two or three fields attached to it. But the main business is an agricultural contract in business which as you and I both know, the machinery involved in that is worth you know, millions of pounds. So a, a large proportion of that was, was down to security, etc. So I can totally see where this is coming from. Um, I, my, my concern is, as I mentioned to the officer, is, is, is the sighting of it and its, 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 its immediate visibility. And I don't know whether whether that can be addressed, but um, uh, I, I can see a principle of support for it. Thank you. Councillor Rowe. Thank you, Chairman. But I point out to Councillor Smurden, unfortunately, he was not at the site inspection on Monday, because if he had have been, he would have seen where the uh, proposed development was going to go. And it's not a very big building anyway, and it's not long at all. I mean, I don't think it's any as long as this room is. So... I, I don't see there's a big problem with it. It's got a dome roof, but uh, the glazing is a problem, apparently. So uh, Mr. Wyme has worded us with words that we can put in if we're minded to vote for approval, and then we can. Uh, he will convene with the rest of us when the applicants come back with a rearrangement of the glazing, etc. And I think that will be fine. So I'm happy to support the recommendation this time. Thank you. Right. Thank you. No, um, to support the approval. Sorry. Can I, can I, um, I think as Councillor Thomas said, I, clearly I can read the room as well. Um, if I can give some words for um, councillors, I think it was Panel and Taylor. Um, members minded to approve the application. Um, no, no. Subject to the receipt of a revised plan showing a reduction in glazing to the satisfactory of the head of planning in consultation with the proposer, second of ward members, and subject to conditions to be determined by the head of planning. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So. Wasn't there a comment that you were going to be in consultation with ecologists as well? I don't think that needs to be in the, the the recommendation because quite clearly to get to be to my satisfaction that's going to be in consultation with the landscape officer and the, the ecologist so I don't think that actually needs to be in the 
in, but, but absolutely they're the two people I'm going to make sure that are happy with the whatever comes in. But the onus will be on um, the applicant to get something get something to us. I think you said that if 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 that cannot be resolved, it will come back to committee. I think yes, that, yeah, if, if it can't if. It, the resolution is to approve subject two. If we yes. can't do the subject two, then you'd have to come back to um, to committee. So, we got reasons for calling against officer's recommendation. Yes. Yes, I th I'm. I would come to. That it is fundamentally that um, mem <coughs> members feel that it's it's in accordance with the development plan policy because there is a necessity for the. The rural business to have a accommodation on site. Right. So, to be perfectly clear, we're voting for of, um, refuse no, no approval of against officers. Yeah, we've got to get this right. Against officers' recommendation. Um, it's going to have a sh subject to all that Mr. Weimer's read out. Um, can I have a show of hands for that, please? Thank you. Those against? <coughs> right. So that application has been approved. <laughs> Subject to. Waited for you to make sure you're ready. Are you okay? Right. So this is application two five seven nine twenty two H H O Red Gables Cliff Road Wembury. Alexis, would you like to uh, present your case, please? I should try. I'm new, so. Bear yeah, well, with I'll, me. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll get it right. For the benefit of the chairman, for the benefit of the this is the <laughs> <laughs> I am new. I've had a hard week. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> right. And I'm slightly scared of your hammer. You, um, no, no, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to worry about that. No. <laughs> Good afternoon. Members. We don't bite. <laughs> <clears throat> um, 
So I am bringing to you this application Red Gables in Cliff Road in Wembury. Uh, so this is the site hatched here, long thin site with the property pretty near the back of it. Um, so if you're looking to the top of that picture, that's where the entrance to the property is. Um, it's set just south of Wembury outside the built form um, and it's on the cliff sort of overlooking the sea is just to the bottom of that picture there. So there it is again from an aerial shot. Uh, a couple of pictures I took on my site visit. So in the background you can see um, the apex of the uh, post dwelling. Um, the in between coming out from it you have uh, an annex that leads into what at the moment is a garage. Um, the annex was approved on appeal in 1999. Um, as ancillary accommodation to the main dwelling um, for dependent parents to live in. Um, and then we've got a, a double garage on the end of that. Um, so at the moment, this is the sort of the, the footprint of it. We've got the property, which has got the purple line around that is um, the host property. We have the current annex there in blue and then the garage uh, in the pale yellow colour. I think that sort of gives you an idea for the scale of the annex and the garage compared to the main property. Um, so the current annex is one bedroom, uh, bathroom and a, a cloakroom, a living room, kitchen. Uh, so it's self-contained. Uh, had ancillary use attached to it by the inspector in 1999 when the appeal went through, um, but it's been uh, rented out as a holiday rental um, since at least 2017. Um, so the proposal we've got at the moment, the application in, is to um, convert the garage into an extension of that annex um, to give us um, a living room, bedroom and bathroom. Um, that's just the inspector's um, condition. So this is the plan we've got at the moment that we are looking at. Uh, so we've got an upstairs bedroom, they're proposing to raise the height of the roof, um, so it's higher than the annex but lower than uh, the host property. Uh, put a dormer into the side, uh, replace the uh, garage doors with glass units that open out onto the garden. So the key issues we're sort of looking at is um, the proposal, although it's an extension, it's an extension to an annex, um, and therefore I've considered the annex part of it rather than it's not simply a one-bedroom um, extension to the host property. It is a, an extension to an annex, making that annex larger still. Um, so what I've taken into account when looking at it is the cumulative nature rather than just it's a one-bedroom annex, which in itself might be considered quite small. Um, it's the cumulative nature of the proposal attaching it to the original annex, um, which I've taken into my assessment. Um, so when we're looking at the scale and the, the, the design in the context of the host, again, we're looking at it not just as, as the garage unit, we're looking at it as the whole extension coming out. Um, does it rival the host in size and scale? Um, is it subordinate to that host dwelling? Um, so we're in quite a protected area there. We're in an area of outstanding natural beauty. We're in heritage coast and we're in an undeveloped coast. So we've got quite a few um, policies that we have to adhere to um, in relation to respecting the scenic quality of the area, maintaining the area's sense of place. Um, <coughs> we're looking in areas like that for outstanding high architectural design um, to enhance the area. Um, so really we're looking at does this proposal meet those requirements, is it high architectural design, is it improving the area, um, is it protecting that landscape. Um, in addition to the physical side of it, with residential annexes they need to be ancillary to the principal development, they need to have a functional link of some sort, so maybe you're providing an extra bedroom but the living room or the kitchen are shared. Um, and th there's a functional link between an annex and the host facility. Um, in this case, the annex, as it is, has demonstrated that it doesn't have any dependence. It's been used as a self-contained unit, has its own kitchen, bathroom, living room, um, access, bedroom. Um, 
and we're adding to that another bedroom, another living room, another bathroom. So what level of dependence is it going to have on that main dwelling? Um, or if it's not, and if it's not got any any functional link, is it becoming a property in its own right? Um, it, what's going to be produced is going to be a two to three bedroom, two bathroom, living room, kitchen dwelling. Um, uh, is and then relationship to the host dwelling is the annex capable of um, being occupied independently of the main dwelling? Well, it, we know it has been for at least the last five years, and I think the proposal is that it continues to be. Um, with an independent family living there. Um, are facilities such as bathrooms, kitchens and toilets shared? Um, no, they're not in this case. That's it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, somebody came to know. Um, questions, members? Treasurer Thomas. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Alexis, is the, is, is, the new, is the first floor park new then? Yes, yeah. So they're raising the roof line in the garage and, and putting a room into the roof. So they're proposing a bedroom and bathroom upstairs in a floor that's not so there. So it's currently a single storey annex and a single storey double garage. Correct. And it will become a two storey annex, at least in part, although the garage part will be single storey, but the annex part will be two. No. Other way around. Yeah. Other way around. So other way around. Other way around. So, other way around. Yeah. Way around. so the around. annex okay. as is at the moment will remain single storey and the garage will become double so in fact, storey. So in fact, the, the, the bit closest to the house will be smaller than the, than yeah. in height. Than the, there will be three yeah. different heights, <laughs> higher, lower, and then higher again. Can I, I ask a question? Is the annex an annex? By the definition of the term. By the definition of the terms, at present, no. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah, Councillor um, Pringle. Look at that picture, um, and you've got the garage on the end. It it awfully looks like there's already. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It looks already like there's because um, they've got a window, a big window there, and obviously a door. And net curtain in the window, which to be honest, you wouldn't have in a garage. It, it, apart from the double doors at the front, I would say that wasn't a garage. I've, I've not been inside. The um, applicant wasn't on site when I was there, they were away. <coughs> I think, to be fair, we have no evidence yeah. to, to say whether or not that is, but, but, from, a, but, but from a purely planning perspective. The the garage um, used you you wouldn't necessarily need permission to change to convert your garage into another bedroom. Oh, oh. which is why historically a lot of authorities put conditions on garages saying garage should only be used for parking parking motor vehicle storage. So, you, so, the, so the, there's no change there's no change of use. It's still be, but what you can't do. Is used as an independent, independent dwelling. Um, so what's clearly been, what's clearly here, a permission was granted for, and still effectively a granny flat, for want of a better, non-planning term. Um, that is now being let out separately. So there is a breach of the condition at present. Now, obviously, we wouldn't take, we're not going to look at any any action around that until this application is determined. Then we'll, we'll potentially look at it. But what's proposed is effectively. In my view, a two-bed self-contained dwelling. It, there's no, I, hand on heart, I could not say that's an annex because it doesn't rely on the main dwelling for anything. That's why. That's why I asked the question. Uh, Burton. Um, so the mention was made in the report of the fact that it's been used as a as holiday accommodation since 2017. Well, there's a date. So, yeah. where does it stand with regard? I mean, that's more than four years. So. Um, uh, can, can I can I be really rude and interrupt? And, and yeah, just, tell me. Uh, uh, a breach of a breach of an occupancy condition is ten years, not four, before it comes immune. And I think I would. I, I don't think we need to focus on that as part of this application. It's kind of a. It, it's a kind of red herring. What we need to be looking at is: do we or do we not support this this extension to that that current annex? How it, how it is or isn't being occupied at the moment. We can deal with outside of this yeah. this application, but I wouldn't want that to cloud 
any member's judgment of how we deal with this particular application. Right. Oh, uh, have we any more questions of the planning officer? No. Right. Oh. You do. Yeah, sorry, sorry, it's going to be a quick one, really. It, it, because it's um, in the AMB and a heritage course, all that, does that do away with permitted development then? It limits permitted development, doesn't do away with it entirely, and would not affect whether or not the use of the current garage for an additional bedroom, if that's where we're going, it wouldn't restrict that, because that's not permitted development, that's whether has there been a change of use, yes or no. So, so the fact that it's in the OE wouldn't affect how that garage is occupied. What I haven't done, of course, is double check the appeal decision just to see if there's a condition on, on the garage. But I, I, don't, I don't think we need to be focusing on how they're being used at the moment. I think we need to focus on what's in front, what's being proposed. Yeah. And fundamentally, it is, I say, my opinion is, it's, it's, it's effectively creating a, semi, a pair of semi-detached dwellings would be my view. Right. Okay, so we'll move on. Amelia, you've got something to read out from the applicant or supporter. Thank you, Chair. So this is from Stephen Lang, the applicant. In response to the proposal being inappropriate in terms of scale and design in a protected rural setting, the scale of the proposed design does not exceed the footprint of the existing property. The garage roof will be raised approximately 450 millimetres and will match the current structure of red gables. Commenting on the proposal not appearing subordinate to the host dwelling, the proposed design is an extension being built to the existing annex for my son and his girlfriend to live in, as they cannot afford a place to live in the local parish due to the current housing market crisis for younger people. The proposed design is not a second annex, the existing garage is to be converted into a new kitchen diner with a small snug room upstairs and the current kitchen diner will become a second bedroom. In response to the architectural design not being of high quality and having an adverse impact on the South Ham's area of outstanding natural beauty, the architectural design is in alignment with the existing design of the host dwelling that was approved and instructed by planning officers from the South Hams Council 30 years before this application. Furthermore, the proposed design cannot be seen from any public footpath or road, therefore it cannot harm the South Hams area of outstanding natural beauty. Thank you. We can't question Mr Lang. Mm -hmm. So we'll move on to Wembley Parish Council, it's not here. Um, Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I believe the, the applicant uh, advised me in correspondence to his email that he, uh, he was unable to attend due to a funeral, so just for clarity. Um, the Parish Council is is not here, though I, I declare I, I am chair of Wembley Parish Council, I abstain on all planning matters when it comes to the Parish Council so that I leave myself free for this committee, to be honest. Um, but the Paris Council uh, did not object, but suggested it would like it to be um, uh, a condition applied so it couldn't become a bare B&B or holiday home, which I would be happy to um, happy to support. Um, I'll keep this very brief. The reason why I brought this to uh, this committee is is in the reason for the call in. And whilst I completely appreciate the assessment the officer um, has made uh, in the, in her report and indeed in the presentation, I would perhaps argue that the, the, the scale and appearance and the physical re relationship, um, I would perhaps take a slightly different stance um, on, I think this is a fairly modest increase uh, in size uh, and, 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 and scale. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly difficult about the appearance and I still believe that uh, the, the, the physical relationship is subordinate to the main dwelling. Uh, it's not going to be too much bigger and it's still going to be subordinate to and I would still regard it as, as ancillary to um, the host dwelling. Um, what, what I would perhaps suggest is that there be potentially a condition, two conditions associated with it subject to members, um, if members were to agree to approve this application, the first being that the uh, this property must be always associated and couldn't be sold separately. Uh, to the main, <coughs> though I think given the 
the, the scale and proximity to it that would be difficult anyway and indeed also that it can't be used as a um you know to be marketed as a, a as a holiday home um so that it must be a, pri a primary residence that's all i have to say on the matter and i bring what other colleagues have to say thank you thank you Councillor brown <coughs> Councillor thomas Chairman, can I just ask Councillor Brown a question? Councillor Brown, did you just say the parish council would want it conditioned that it wouldn't be a, a holiday let? Yes, I, it, it didn't object to the application, but suggested in comments that it wasn't to be used as a holiday. Can I just ask as a follow-up then, have the parish council objected over the last four to five years and asked enforcement to come in to the fact that it is already being used as a holiday let? No. Right, okay. Um, we need to debate the issue. Anybody wants to? Uh, ah, I, if, we're, if we're in debate, I would like to propose we go along with officer recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Brazil? Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Um, whereas I have some sympathy with the applicant, um, particularly with you know, lack of affordable housing for young families and things like that. I mean, the obvious question would be, well, why don't you use the annex that you've already got there? Um, but put, putting that aside, I, I think it's only right that we refuse this. Um, what, I really, what I would recommend them do is, you, you know, they've got the opportunity to take it to appeal if they feel they've got a strong case and, and mm -hmm. an inspector may take a different view. Um, but I think as a planning authority, we've got no choice but to refuse it as outlined in the officer report. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Parham. Yeah, I, I was going to sec uh, second that uh, proposal. Uh, we've heard that it breaches a number of our policies and Councillor Brown mentioned about the size. The size is not an issue. It's the, the it's creating a second property, a, a second dwelling, basically. Um, and I think that's important that we, we uphold our uh, uh, policies in that area. So I, I thank you, Councillor Hodgson. Thank you. I just actually wanted to ask what the position is. I can't think of the word, but when a, a property is kept in, in as, as part of it, it's kept in association. What's the subsidiary? No, not subsidiary. It's ancillary. Ancillary. So I mean, if that was the case, then it's acknowledging that that other property is perhaps at the moment used otherwise, but it would actually mean that that would be part of. The new property rather than being seen that maybe the you know the piggy in the middle is still let out for holiday lets if the whole thing is just done as an ancillary then because i do i do understand and sympathize with perhaps people wanting to help the next generation who can't afford places and it is actually keeping potentially younger people and younger families in the area so i, I see that potential benefit if we could do it in that way but i mean i'm i must say i'm pretty well on the on the edge on this one but i would i would be supportive of it if that would be could be sort of really nailed down I, can't, I, can't answer, I think I can answer that for you, Chair. Yeah. Um, so the, ori the original um, annex that was approved on, on appeal, um, if, could you get the decision that said the, the occupancy condition, please? And is that an ancillary? Is that ancillary? That just, so that, so that um, no, that's the reason for refusal. The, the, oh, no, there we go. So the, the, the permission for the existing annex is the, the extension here probably shall not be occupied at any other time other than the purpose as ancillary to the residential use of the dwelling known as Red Gables. If if there was a a, a different because I think that I think what was said is that we believe that was for an elderly or elder older relative at the time. If and I think what um, either the applicant for his or Councillor Brown I can't remember, said it, it's for um, I think it was his son and girlfriend if 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 they if they had a an older child living in the current annex, I don't believe that would be a breach of that of that condition. So I, th I think if the, if they if the, if they weren't renting it out and the sun moved into there, I think that would still be ancillary. Where I where I don't believe it's ancillary is when you then get to the stage that it's um, of the scale where you it, it's the, pretty much the same size as the existing property. So how how can a two bedroom self contained unit be ancillary to a similar size property. I just don't believe it can. I think it, I think it comes down to to scale. So that's that's our. Um, I think it tips the balance going from being an ancillary unit to a a self-contained dwelling that doesn't rely on the the host property at all. And that that's it, it's where that balance tips. But I would really struggle to say 
that what's being proposed would remain ancillary because if you just go with the deck the Dictionary, no, not de dictionary definition. I'll get there eventually. I don't think that would fall within um, either as an a either an annex or ancillary. Back, um, surely it remains ancillary if they're sharing things like um, uh, sewage arrangements, extract, extract, etc. And also, if it's um, so, it would be difficult to to separate the two at the moment, presumably. Mm. And so, if it's a, it's a, an extension, I mean, I accept it's not. Minor, but it's an extension well, the, the, to the ancillary to allow effectively an extended family home. Well, the, the fact that part of it is being let out as a separate unit, mm. I would suggest it probably isn't that difficult to split them. Mm. It's, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's any different to an awful lot of semi detached properties within the Wembury area. But it, right. Ready? Coach is smart and gets him to go. Well, um, on the basis that, you know, that that was, you know, ancillary and as a, you know, accommodation for more elderly. I mean, there's no, there's no clear, uh, the, there's no um, connecting doorway, etc. Um, no. You know, which is, uh, you know, which is a classic, isn't? You know, so you've effectively got, you know, two dwellings. Um, this aspect of, of ancillary accommodation um, is a. Yeah, it's a bit of a loophole. Be, there, there are quite a few that go through. I mean, I know from uh, from experience locally, uh, there was there's one approved, you know, a, a, a dwelling approved, and the planning officer said, you know, it was okay, uh, provided it didn't have a kitchen. Well, I mean, it didn't. When it didn't when he approved it, but uh, you know, you know the, 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 fitter, the fitters were there. You know. So you see what I'm saying. So, um, but I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm possibly not known for quoting um, policies and everything like that. But the one which you put up there, SPD four point one two nine. I mean, just spelt it out, didn't it? You know, if, if it says any, you know, anything that's converted like that will likely be refused. So, you know, um, uh, it's it's nailed on, and uh, uh, you know, I don't see that there's any way it can be. I've got a feeling. I've got a feeling it's time to go to a vote. We got close up and a seconder to go with the officer's recommendation of refusal. Can I have a show of hands to that effect? <coughs> Again, the again, it's refusal. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> One against. No. So there's no abstention, is there? It's <coughs> twelve. Thank you. So that application is refused as That's per right. officer's recommendation. Right. Well done. I oh, we done all right after all. Right. Um, Mr. Weimer, I think you might have a few words for us. Um, <coughs> uh, do, do, uh, as in the appeals, Chair? Yes, as in the appeals. Um, okay, there are there are two um, two appeal decisions on the list and one that Councillor Panel uh, asked me to have a look at. It came it, it came in <coughs> after the agenda was published. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to dwell on the ref, the refusal <coughs> that sort of dismissed appeal of the tree works. I'm sure there are members in here who would, would quite happily go into far more detail than I will. Other than um, the inspector concluded that the trees make a moderate contribution to the character and appearance of the locality, and felling would have an adverse effect on the character and appearance. And the conclusion was the felling simply wasn't justified. There wasn't. There was no. Um, the, 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 the reasons being put forward in terms of um, the trees are deformed and they need to be taken out to let another one grow to be to get more mature was just um, the inspector simply wasn't persuaded that, that was a reasonable justification and the the, um, the appeal was dismissed. I do note that we had allowed approved lesser works, so what we considered was 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 reasonable. Um, the Lod as well, three Ashwood close. Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think 
if we'd uh, when this one came through, I did wonder if we'd had the inspector that had allowed all the the other the, the previous three or four householder applications not that long ago. I'm not convinced this necessarily would have been the same decision. So it just demonstrates that it, it very it can be dependent on the inspector. Um, the it's um, effectively taking out roof lights and putting a flat in a relatively substantial dormer um, in. The, the inspector considered that the, um, the dormer on the front elevation um, would result in a significant amount in the, sorry, dormers aren't, a, dormers aren't a main feature in the area and fundamentally it would be an incongruous addition to the surrounding street scene. Um, and that, so it's, it was character and appearance. Didn't um, not on the basis that it would harm the special character of the A1B, but simply because the the character of to that particular area that didn't have um, dormers. Happily take any questions as we go along. And the more recent one that members may have may have seen is um, an a, a, an appeal that we lost. It was for partially retrospective for a hard standing. In front of the property to be used as a, a driveway. This is on sort of Slans Chapel to Bigby Cross. Um, this is one where County Highways had recommended refusal on on highway grounds, on highway safety grounds. Um, the appellant commissioned uh, an independent highways expert to do a counter um, counter case. Um, the inspectors clearly considered both, and on balance, and I think mainly because they didn't see an awful lot of traffic when they were when they were when they were there, just as well, just as well they weren't there in July and August, um, and uh, and considered it was it was acceptable. But it's it this is one where um, I think um, guy, your main question was, is this one where we went against county highways? No, absolutely, we went with county highways, and um, I don't believe it would have been allowed without the counter argument given by another highways expert who's got similar similar qualifications and similar standing to county highways i think it would just be the appellant arguing the case without that that backing i suspect the argument the, the, the appeal decision would have gone differently but that's that's where we are on the, the three decisions any questions okay um. Everybody else got anything to say? Are we going to do the. Um, um, I was simply, uh, as usual, in terms of the undetermined major report, I'll happily try and answer any questions that members may have. I haven't been, I'm not aware that there are any questions, but I'll happily answer them. Uh, excuse me, I have a council service I've got to watch out. Yeah, okay, thank you, Director Thomas. Um, yeah, very, no, I need to do that. I, I'll talk to you later. Something else. <clears throat> Anybody else got anything to say? No? Right. Uh, very quickly, I just want to say I want to say this. We determined a application in Townstall two, three years well before COVID, where there was a line of pine trees by the builder's yard. Can anybody remember it? The trees have gone. The flats aren't there. After all this time. You know, you have the trees down in five minutes that hasn't been built on. Which is it? Remember? I we could have driven past it yesterday, actually. Or, or Monday, I meant to do that. Anyway, sorry. No, officially. I don't know. No, because it just haven't been, they haven't finished doing, they haven't taken up the planning application, have they? Can, can I? Yeah. Once, once the reasons. 
Yep. Order. I'm going to close the meeting. Shut off.